Lone Wolf, America Falls, Book 7. Written by Scott Medbury. Narrated by Adam Barr. January 2nd, 1108 AM. Tom Dallard, the normally well-groomed Channel 7 news anchor, sits at his news desk and stares at the camera with haunted eyes. He is gaunt-faced and sporting a scraggy beard. Papers and food wrappers have been pushed to the side for his final broadcast. His hands are clasped in front of him. As you know if you've been watching, I've been alone in the studio now for four days. Everyone else is dead. My own wife, his voice cracks, died the day after Christmas. In the background, there is the sound of breaking glass and banging. He takes a deep breath and sits up straighter. Why this godforsaken disease spared me, I don't know. Maybe it's so I can give you this final message. If you're only just tuning in, before the government collapsed, it was all confirmed. The Chinese used North Korea as a testing ground for their genetic warfare, the real target all along was us. He is interrupted by a muted explosion somewhere in the studio. Dallard looks resigned, but determined to finish. The virus appears to target only adults and certain races, with CDC confirming ethnic Chinese seemingly immune to its effects. I guess in hindsight, the reason for that is obvious. Another loud bang. Time is running out for me, but know this. America is still the home of the brave, and it can again be the land of the free. Band together. Find places to hide from the invaders and live to fight another day. Close by, there is a loud crash and dust falls from the ceiling. This is Tom Dallard. Signed. Two Chinese soldiers tackle Dallard from his chair before he can complete his sign-off. One hits him viciously on the temple with his rifle butt, and then they drag the slumped figure of America's last newsman out of view. A single gunshot rings out, and not long after, the screen goes black. Prologue Jimmy Ortega and Hector Garcia arrived at the fire station a little after midnight. They crouched in the shadows of Fresno's baseball stadium and signaled to the three men at the end of the block to come forward. Men was perhaps a stretch. They were all kids. Jimmy was in fact the oldest at 16 and was also the freshly crowned leader of their gang, the Sereños. It was by default, really, Jimmy's older brother Yago had been the leader. He and all the older gang members were dead of the flu now, along with everyone else in the city older than 16 or 17. The gang used to be 40 strong and controlled the whole downtown Fresno area. Now there were only six of them left. They'd had the run of the streets since Christmas, and tonight was the first they'd heard of the Chinese invaders being in the city. They'd watched the news in the clubhouse right up until the power went out. When they weren't watching the news or caring for the dying, they were burying the dead in the turf of Chukchansi Park. It had been a couple of weeks since Yago, stubborn to the last, died, but not before anointing Jimmy his successor. And when they come here, make those fuckers pay. They had been watching for the Chinese occupying forces ever since, expecting a rolling march through the city, not one vehicle. The others joined Jimmy and Hector, and they huddled together. Okay, we're going in. Selma said the Chinese Hummer is between the two fire department SUVs. She saw four of them in there and thinks they're sleeping. Are we going to blow them away, Jimmy? asked Hector. Jimmy shook his head. He was unsure why one Chinese vehicle would come into Fresno without any backup so he wanted to find out more. We surround them and see if we can get some answers first, here. We need to know if there are more coming. We'll blow them away once we have what we want. The others nodded. All of them looked scared. Jimmy was scared, but no way in hell was he going to show it. He fist-bumped them one by one. 
Let's go. The others followed him across the street and to the gate of the parking lot where they stopped as Jimmy surveyed the vehicles. He pointed at the SUV with the fire chief sign on it. It's behind that one. You two go that way with Hector, and you come with me, Donnie, he said to the scrawniest kid, Donnie. With their guns drawn, Hector led his two guys, Santiago and Seb, towards the front of the vehicles. Jimmy nodded encouragingly at Donnie and drew his gun. Donnie pulled his out of his pocket and cocked it, smiling at Jimmy. They headed off, Jimmy in front crouched low as he ran towards the target vehicles. At the rear corner of the chief's Toyota SUV, he paused and looked at the army vehicle. It was painted in camo and had some Chinese writing on it. He looked over his shoulder at the wide-eyed Donnie and with his hands indicated he should stay put. Jimmy got up. He would sneak along the Hummer until he got to the rear door. Then when Hector was in place on the other side, they would spring the doors and take the prisoners out at gunpoint. He'd barely finished his second step when the rear door opened and a tall Chinese soldier, with his back to Jimmy, stepped out and put his arms into the air, taking a long stretch. Jimmy, with his heart trying to punch its way out of his chest, knew he had to move now before the man turned and saw him. He ran forward, an alley cat stalking a rat, and put his gun hard against the back of the soldier's head. The big man froze, with his hands still in the air. Oh, you in trouble now, boy, Jimmy whispered, smiling at his own cleverness. A flash of bright light and the cacophony of automatic gunfire from the driver's window at the front of the vehicle wiped it away in an instant. One. Sometimes, if you wait long enough, the universe delivers, even at the most unexpected times, like the end of the f***ing world, for instance. Larry Dawson took a long draft of his beer and looked at his dead wife. She'd stopped breathing ten minutes before. He didn't need to check her pulse to know for sure. Frankly, he was surprised she'd lasted as long as she had. Never what you would call a fit woman, Sheila had come down with the Pyongyang flu on Christmas Eve. She'd lasted three whole days. Larry had nursed her, as any dutiful husband would, while he waited, hour by hour, for his own symptoms to appear. They never did. Not even a runny nose. Not even as he watched the channels with their stories of the pandemic go off the air one by one their hosts with the same rattling breathing and snotty faces as his wife. He wasn't willing to believe he was in the clear yet, but given that Sheila had been coughing and spluttering her germs all over the place for three whole days and he was still healthy, maybe it was time to start making some plans. Larry bared his teeth in a smile that would have chilled anyone who had been there to witness it. He walked across to the front window, carefully pulled aside the curtain, and peered across the road at the Monahan's place. The normally well-manicured lawn was looking dry and was dusted with leaves, but his focus, as it had been since the Monahans had moved in the summer before, was on the front window of the second story. That was Katie's room. Before the pandemic, he'd spent a lot of his evenings at the darkened window of his upstairs study, just waiting for a glimpse of the beautiful cheerleader when he wasn't stalking her on Instagram, that is. As he strained to see any sign of movement in her window, he thought back wistfully to the images he'd screen-captured from her Instagram and saved in an encrypted file on his desktop computer over the last few months. They were gone now. The Internet had gone down two days before, and the power had followed it yesterday. Now his only window into her life was, well, her window. For now, anyway. That would soon change. He had a plan, and as soon as her kid brother was out of the way, it was all systems go. They were probably still busy mourning the death of their parents. He'd gone over the morning before and asked if they needed anything. It had been Jack who answered the door. His eyes were red-rimmed, and Larry had heard Katie wailing in the background. The athletic teenager had been polite, but he'd held the door shut most of the way, 
preventing Larry from seeing in. He confirmed the obvious about his parents and thanked Larry for coming over, saying that they were okay for now. The kid was too together for a 15-year-old who had just lost his parents and now faced the end of the world, and if he wondered how Larry had dodged the Pyongyang flu bullet, he didn't voice it. Larry felt his dislike grow. Okay, son, but if you need anything, you just holler. Uh, sure, the kid said before closing the door. You'll keep, Larry had thought as he returned to his side of the street. At the window, satisfied that he wasn't going to miss anything in the next little while, he let the curtain drop and turned back to look at his dead wife. A 99.5% fatality rate for adults over the age of 17. That's what they'd said. God only knew why he hadn't bought the farm. He shrugged, then crushed his beer can with his beefy hand before throwing it into the corner of the living room. He felt a thrill of rebellion at the gesture. Sheila, who he'd let keep him under the thumb for the sake of peace, would have ripped him a new one at such a blatant disregard for her home. Most relaxed I've seen you in ages, he said, patting her still warm cheek. Come on, old girl, time for a long rest. He grabbed the back of her easy chair and started to wheel her out of the living room. He was a barrel-chested forty-year-old, strong without being overly muscled, but it was no easy task. Sheila, who was ten years his senior, weighed in at around 230 pounds, and the stressed casters didn't like the shag pile one bit. By the time he eventually got her onto the linoleum floor of the kitchen, he had a light sheen of perspiration on his high forehead. He paused at the door to the basement. His initial thought was to store her down there, but that's where he would keep Katie. It wouldn't do to have Sheila stinking up the place. That wouldn't be romantic at all. Sorry, my dear, it's into the shed you go. Twenty minutes later, with Sheila ensconced in a wheelbarrow with a tarp over her, he wheeled the easy chair back into the kitchen and out to the living room. On his way back through the kitchen, he ignored the faint rotting smell from the fridge as he grabbed another can of Coors before heading down to the basement to finish his preparations. He had started the work yesterday when it was clear Sheila wouldn't be moving from her chair again. In the afternoon, he had cleared the floor of the basement, making room for his workspace. That evening, after he had fed his wife her last supper, lukewarm chicken broth, he had gone back down and spent four hours constructing two small walls from cinder blocks. The walls were set facing each other six feet apart. Each was two blocks wide and four high. Larry's breath plumed in the cold basement as he checked to see if the mortar was dry and satisfy himself that the two mini walls were sturdy. He then headed to the back corner and retrieved the solid timber door that was leaning against the wall. A few minutes later, he had laid it out and secured the door on top of his mini walls like a tabletop. He tested it by climbing on it and laying lengthwise, then rolling this way and that. The bed didn't creak or rock. Satisfied, he climbed off and went to his workbench. He picked out three items and set them to the side before fastidiously rearranging the remaining tools so that they lined up neatly. When he was finished, he picked up one of the items he'd set to the side. It was a large, freshly sharpened carving knife. He held it up in front of his eyes and pressed the pad of his index finger to the blade. He smiled and tucked it under his arm, then picked up the length of rope and a roll of masking tape and headed for the stairs. He hummed Enter the Sandman, his favorite Metallica tune, as he went. Phase two of Operation Katie would begin the next day. The dirt-covered figure stood in the kitchen, staring across the living room and out into the backyard as the afternoon light faded. Jack Monahan sipped warm Gatorade. The only clean skin on his face was in the tracks left by his earlier tears. He had finally broken when the first shovelful of dirt fell on his mother's shrouded body. His parents had been dead when he had woken up the previous morning. For him, that whole day was lost, washed away by waves of emotion, anger, sadness, rage. 
This morning had been different. He hadn't cried, not even as he'd wrapped them in bed sheets and carried them one at a time down into the backyard. He had spent the day carefully marking out the graves and digging them deep enough to be sure they wouldn't be disturbed by animals before carefully laying them in their final resting place. He had thought he was cried out, but the finality of the dirt falling on the woman who had borne him had broken him again. Looking out at the graves, anger chased exhaustion from his face and he threw the bottle across the room at the big window. The liquid exploded from the open lid and painted the glass in a vivid orange bloom, slowly melting its way to the bottom of the pane like the tears of a dragon. The grief and physical exhaustion of digging two graves caused his broad shoulders to slump as he leaned over the counter. Jack was tall and well-built for a sixteen-year-old. A natural athlete, his grandma used to say, before she'd passed away. He was quarterback on his school football team, and there were already murmurs of a scholarship. He was also the captain of the school trap shooting team, something his mom wasn't super cool with, but tolerated, as long as her no-guns-in-the-home rule was obeyed. The freshly turned mounds were marked by two simple white crosses he had fashioned from pickets he'd ripped off their front fence. Angry with her at first, now that it was done, he was glad he hadn't been able to persuade Katie to come out for the burial. Never comfortable displaying or dealing with emotion, he thought he might have lost it completely if she'd come out. One of them needed to stay strong. His sister had taken the deaths of her parents hard. Her grief had been traumatic, so bad he didn't want to think about it. When he'd finally managed to pry her off her parents' bodies, she had retreated to her room and in the thirty or so hours since had only come out to use the bathroom. She refused to eat. Jack knew she would be okay. Or would she? They were alone now. There was nothing on the TV or radio, no cell phone reception or internet, and their neighborhood was like a ghost town, except for Mr. Dawson across the road. He hadn't appeared sick at all when he'd come over the day before. Was it all over? Maybe neither of them would come out of it. Who knew what would happen next? When his parents had fallen ill, he'd caught snatches of news and there was speculation it was an attack. The phones had been working until two days before, and he'd discussed the whole thing with his best buddy, Danny Cooper. Danny had even heard a report confirming that China was behind the attack, the source of the virus. It's World War III, Jack. I'm telling you, they got us with germ warfare. That conversation, their last, had been interrupted when his father had fallen over in the kitchen. The phones had gone out not long after. They hadn't spoken since. Jack straightened. Danny would be his next task. They'd talked briefly of banding together if, when, the inevitable happened. Now that it had, and he'd taken care of what needed to be done, he wanted to make that connection as soon as possible. Three of them together would definitely stand more of a chance than he and his sister alone. First, though, Katie needed to eat something. He padded upstairs and put his ear to the door and listened. Silence. He knocked gently. Sis? Nothing. Katie? I'm going to have a shower, then I'll make us a sandwich, okay? No answer. Jack felt a wave of panic wash over him. He turned the handle and opened the door a crack, certain he would find Katie with her wrist slashed and bleeding out. She was a shapeless mound underneath the blankets. Only her straggly brown hair showed above the coverlet. He took a step into the room. Katie? Leave me alone. She didn't turn over, and her voice was muffled by the blankets, but he'd never been so glad to hear his sister's whine in his life. He let out a pent-up breath. I'm going to have a shower, then I'll make you something to eat, okay? Katie, just go away. You can't lay in there forever, he snapped, his patience finally breaking. I'm getting in the shower, and when I'm done, you're getting up. He pulled the door shut with a bang. As it was, it was Jack's resolve that had broken by the time he'd gotten out of the cold shower. When he knocked on Katie's door ten minutes later and she told him to leave her alone, he simply went in and left a PB&J sandwich and a glass of water on her side table. You know, 
Mom and Dad wouldn't want you to waste away in bed. His voice cracked with emotion. There's a sandwich here. You should eat it. I have to go out tomorrow. She didn't even acknowledge he was there. He shrugged and went back downstairs. After eating his own stale sandwich over the kitchen bench, he went and sat on the living room sofa. He stared at the blank television screen as the last light of day faded. Physically and emotionally drained from burying his parents, his mind wandered back to the laughs and happy times he spent with his family in that very spot. Just the week before, they'd binged the last four episodes of Brooklyn Nine-Nine, googling when the next series was coming out. What a difference a week made. No more Nine-Nine. No more TV. No more Google. No more parents. Jack stood up, wiping a solitary tear from his eye and headed up to his room. Whether Katie was up tomorrow or not, he was heading out in the morning to try and find Danny. 2. The sun was bright in his window when he awoke, feeling disoriented. It was only a moment before the reality of the last few days chased his sleep-addled confusion down a dark alley. He took a deep breath as he stared at the ceiling. All was quiet outside and inside the house, but there was something different. It took him a second before he realized what it was. He smelled cooking. Someone was cooking eggs. He jumped out of bed and pulled on a T-shirt before heading quickly downstairs. Katie's door was open and her bed was made. Jack felt a tinge of happiness, the first positive emotion he'd felt in many days. Morning, Katie said with a smile when he came through the door. She was pale but almost looked her old self. She was wearing shorts and a sweater, and her long brown hair was brushed. She stood over their little propane camping stove, stirring scrambled eggs. Morning he said. I wondered how you're cooking with the power out. Good thinking. Now was not the time to go into a deep and meaningful. He didn't want to spook her. Yeah, it took me an age to find it in the garage. I'm surprised I didn't wake you with all the noise. I'm not surprised. I slept like the dead. The wooden spoon paused. Really deeply. Katie began stirring again. No toast, unfortunately she said as she dished the steaming eggs onto two plates. Toaster's not working, of course, but the bread also has spots of mold on it, so... It's cool, he said, taking a mouthful of eggs that he immediately spat out because it was too hot. Hot? Ugh. They both laughed. Just like Mom, Katie said fondly, and took a more carefully curated mouthful herself. Jack nodded and went in for a second forkful. Really nice, thanks, he said, pushing the empty plate into the middle of the counter when he was done. Did you want to come today? I'm not sure about leaving you here on your own. She picked up both plates and carried them to the sink. I'm not ready to go outside yet, she said over the sound of the running water. I'll be safer here than you will be out there. Are you sure you should go? Shouldn't we wait? Maybe help will come. He shook his head. There's no help coming, Katie. I think we've been invaded. That's what the very last news reports were saying. We need to find Danny and work out a plan. Three of us together will stand more of a chance than two. For the first time in days, he saw an emotion other than sadness and anger in her eyes. It was fear. Why? What do you think will happen? I have no idea, but we need to be prepared. In truth, he did have an idea. As a fan of post-apocalyptic books, movies, and TV, he was pretty sure that in the absence of zombies and aliens, it was other survivors they would have to be concerned with first. Even if China was making a full-scale invasion, it could be weeks or months before they had enough people on the ground to invade a little suburb of Sacramento. How long will you be? I'm not sure. I'll drive the Mazda, but how quick I am will depend on what's happening. Danny's is a 15-minute drive normally. Okay, so like less than an hour? Let's say two hours at the outside. We may have to look for supplies. At the very least, bottled water plus other stuff, you know, tools and things we might need. But we have running water. Yeah, but with the power grid down, I'm not sure how much longer it will last. 
I'm surprised it hasn't been cut already. Okay, sounds like a plan. Try and get food, too, like cans and stuff that will last. Good idea. Anything else? Um, maybe ladies' products? I'm not due for ages, but it would be best to stock up. Jack felt himself blush. While he was a confident teenager and most definitely not a prude, he had never discussed such things with his sister. Okay, he said too quickly. What? I mean, which? She smiled, not unkindly. Don't worry, I'll write it down for you. Thanks. Jack headed back upstairs, amazed at how his sister had swung from being depressed and reclusive to helpful and almost happy. He knew it would take a long time for both of them to get over their parents' deaths, but it gave him confidence that everything would be okay if they made it through the first few weeks. 3. Jack put on jeans, a t-shirt, and his treasured Chuck Taylor Converse high-top shoes. He threw on a hoodie and then looked in the mirror. As far as dressing for the apocalypse, he thought it could have been better. Maybe a leather jacket and some motorcycle boots would have done the trick, but this would have to do. He went to his dresser and pulled out the one piece of survival gear he actually owned. It was a 4.3-inch hunting knife his uncle had sent him for his birthday. He really liked the gift. His mom, not so much. Well, that's practical, she had said with a disapproving look at his father. Well, at least it's not a gun, his dad had joked, receiving a dark look in return. Jack had pulled the all-black knife from its leather sheath and weighed it in his hand, turning it this way and that. His verdict was, it's cool. His mom had been right about its practicality, though. As a family, they were pretty urban, his father didn't hunt or do anything much outdoorsy except camping, and even then, that was always at camping grounds with all the modern conveniences. Since his birthday, they hadn't even done that. So it had gone in his drawer and hadn't come out until now. He teared up a little. What he wouldn't do to hear his mom's gentle sarcasm now. Shaking it off, he pulled the blade out of the sheath and jabbed it at the air in front of him a few times. While the blade wasn't as long as the zombie killers in the movies, it would do some damage buried in someone's belly. The key would be to jab and stab. It certainly wasn't a slashing weapon. He lifted the waistband of his hoodie up and clipped the sheath to his belt, then slipped the knife in before covering it back up. Next, he emptied the books and folders from his school backpack into the dustbin. Won't be needing those again. The backpack was pretty beat up after two years of use. He put his finger through a hole in the bottom and decided he'd grab a new one if the opportunity came up. He slipped it over his shoulder and, on autopilot, grabbed his wallet from the dresser on the way through the door. Katie was wiping down the kitchen benches when he got downstairs. That was a rare sight, and he was about to make a joke when he noticed her red-rimmed eyes. As if to distract him from the fact she'd been upset, she smiled and pointed to a water bottle, two Milky Ways, and a note written in her small, neat handwriting on the end of the counter. Just in case it's a while before you find more food. And that's the note with my stuff on it. Thanks, sis. He placed the water and candy bars in the backpack and slipped the note into his pocket. Okay, he said. I guess I'll see you in two hours. Make sure you lock the door after me, and if anyone knocks, don't answer. If there's an emergency or anything, run straight over the road to Mr. Dawson's. I can't believe he's alive. I thought it killed all of them, like all of the adults. Apparently not, he shrugged. I don't really like him. He's okay. A little bit arrogant, but Dad thought he was okay. Besides, it's good to have someone if we need help. I guess, she said in a strange tone. He could almost read her mind. How come Dawson had survived and not Mom or Dad? He turned and headed to the door before she had a chance to get upset again. Um, I think you'll need these. She scooped the keys to the CX-5 off the top of the microwave, and he held out his hands to catch them. She didn't throw them. Instead, she carried them to him and dropped them in his open hand. Thanks. Then she did something she hadn't done in many years. She hugged him. It was brief and too quick for him to return, but he knew it was a huge deal, and he felt the warmth of the hug deep in his soul. Be careful. 
she said. I will. Don't forget, lock the door. He pulled it open and stepped out into the gray morning. He turned and waved one more time. She waved back before closing the door. He heard the deadbolt click. Then, headed for his mother's pride and joy, the Mazda SUV was only six months old and the smell of new leather was still strong when he opened the door. He put his backpack on the passenger seat and then started it. The engine fired up the first time and he turned the heater on right away, along with the seat warmers. He buckled up and then put his hands on the wheel. He was a little nervous. Being on a learner's permit, he'd only ever driven it with his mom or dad next to him, and that wasn't the only thing causing his nerves. Also playing on his mind was the fact he was about to find out a little more about the fall of America. Quite frankly, he didn't know what was happening out there, and it scared him. He took a deep breath and reversed the Mazda out onto the road. He was about to head out when he decided at the last second to stop and run in to talk to Mr. Dawson. It wouldn't hurt just to have him keep an eye on things while he was gone, and not only that, he felt he had been a little rude to the guy when he had come over to check on them two days before. Jack pulled the car to a stop in front of his neighbor's home and turned it off before stepping back out into the cold Sacramento morning. Something niggled at the back of his mind as he followed the path to the front door. It was a vague sense of something not being quite right. It was like that feeling you get when you go past a place you haven't seen in a while and something's different about it. Then you work out it's something like a tree having been cut down or a vacant lot where a building used to be. He worked out what it was as he stepped up onto the front porch. It was the quiet. Normally there'd be street noises at this time of day. Cars, lawnmowers, planes flying overhead. He couldn't even hear a bird. It was jarring. He didn't have long to think about it. The door was pulled open before he had a chance to knock. Mr. Dawson stood in the doorway smiling, half hidden behind the door. 4. Movement at last. Dawson had been drinking a mug of instant coffee at the study window when Katie's blinds were opened. And there she is, folks, he muttered, moving to the side, even though he knew full well no one could see in through the sheer nylon curtains in the daytime. He checked. Come on, honey, he said, putting his coffee mug down and leaning forward. Let Uncle Larry have a look at you. There was no movement for a minute. Then she appeared. It was brief. She put her face to the pane and peered up and down the street. She wore a white tank top that left little to Larry's imagination, even though it was perfectly acceptable sleepwear for a girl in the privacy of her own home. Good morning, sunshine. Glad to see you up bright and early. It's gonna be a big day. Katie disappeared from the window a few seconds later, her curiosity apparently satisfied. Disappointed it was over so fast, but pleased by his first dose of Katie in a week, Larry picked up his coffee and whistled happily as he headed downstairs. On the kitchen island sat the gear he'd brought up from the basement. He fingered the blade of the knife absently and went over the plan in his mind. First, he'd take care of the boy. He decided he'd go the direct route, knock on the front door just like he had a few days ago, lure him over to his house with a story about how he needed help to move something, then overpower and kill him. The kid was big for his age, but Larry was bigger. His physique was vaguely ape-like. He was barrel-chested with arms that were long and ropey with muscle, and he had slim hips despite his solid beer belly. His red hair was graying now, but back when he'd moved school in the eighth grade, a group of kids had called him orangutan. That had stopped right after he put their ringleader in a chokehold and squeezed until the asshole passed out. It had taken three teachers to get him off the bully, and he'd had to move school not long after, but no one had ever called him that name again. Larry Dawson didn't really want to kill Jack, but if he didn't, the kid would just become a problem later, a problem that had to be fed and watered and watched constantly. No, best to put him out of his misery right away. So, he thought, lure the boy, kill him, then grab Katie. Three simple steps. 
He made another cup of instant coffee from water he heated on the gas stove and sipped it occasionally as he packed his Katie kit. It was a satchel containing the things he would need to ensure Katie was compliant when he went to get her. He left the carving knife out. It would go into the pack after he'd taken care of the boy. He drained the last of his coffee and put it on the counter. Okay, time to get this done. He picked up the knife and satchel and headed into the hallway. He dropped the satchel on the floor by the front door and was about to deposit the knife in the drawer of the hallway console table when he heard the muffled sound of a car door closing. What the hell? He kept a hold of the knife and went through to the living room. As he peered through the front curtains, the reverse lights on Beverly Monaghan's Mazda lit up and it backed out of their driveway. He checked Katie's window in the front yard. There was no one in sight. No! Had he waited too long? Were they leaving? He peered desperately into the car, only calming down once he saw it was the boy in the driver's seat and that he was alone. The car reversed onto the road, then jerked to a halt before easing forward and heading off. Dawson couldn't believe his luck. Now he could snatch Katie and not have to kill the kid. He was about to do a little jig in celebration when the car skidded to a halt and began to back up. It stopped directly in front of his house and the kid climbed out. Dawson's fingers tightened around the handle of the carving knife and he headed back to the front door. Back to plan A. As the kid's shadow appeared through the frosted glass, he stepped up to the door, a fake smile plastered over his face, and pulled it open, careful to keep the knife out of sight. Startled, his young neighbor stopped in his tracks. Hey, kiddo, said Dawson. What a coincidence. I was just going to come and ask if you could help me with something. Five. Katie finished wiping down the kitchen benches, doing her best not to think about anything. When she was done, she looked around for something else to do, and her eyes fell upon the fridge. She almost welcomed the stench of decay that assaulted her senses, anything to keep her mind off her parents lying in the cold dirt of their backyard. Tears sprang to her eyes again. The grief was quick and unexpected. Just her conscious mind touching upon her parents was enough to turn on the waterworks. God, stop it, Katie, she moaned, slamming the fridge door and heading to the kitchen drawers. She ripped some kitchen trash bags out of their box and stalked back to the refrigerator. After 15 minutes, she had cleared the shelves, filling two bags with an assortment of spoiled food and containers of unmentionable leftovers. Katie finished by sweeping the tiled floor and then headed back upstairs. Following a cold shower, she dressed in sweatpants and a t-shirt, then went back to her room. After so long lying in bed, the quick burst of activity had depleted her energy, and she decided to lay down and read. She went to the window first and took another look up and down the street. Apart from the leaves blowing in the wind, there was no movement anywhere. Theirs was an established neighborhood, and there had been no other families with kids in the cul-de-sac they lived on. Her gaze traveled to the homes across the way. No kids meant the houses were populated only by the dead now. Well, all except the Dawsons. She glanced at the neat brick bungalow. It was just as still and vacant-looking as the others. Katie shivered and drew the blinds. She couldn't concentrate on her book and just stared up at the ceiling. She let her eyes close, deciding she'd get up when Jack got back with Danny. After a while... She fell into a fitful sleep. Hey, Mr. Dawson, really? What do you need help with? Said Jack, thinking that for someone who had recently lost his wife, his neighbor sure was cheerful. Dawson waved vaguely towards the rear of the house. I just need a hand moving a cabinet in the basement. Darn thing is heavier than I thought. I can help you with that for sure, Larry smiled. If he could get the kid into the basement with no fuss and then take care of him, it would be much easier, not to mention less mess to clean up in the house. But do you mind if I help you this afternoon? I'm heading over to the north side to try and find my buddy and get some supplies. The older man stared right through him for a second before his eyes focused again. Oh, you are, Dawson said. Yeah, that's why I dropped in, actually. Katie is staying home, so I was going to ask if you'd mind keeping an eye on our place. I'll only be gone a couple hours. Well, uh, sure, kiddo. Larry tried to keep the excitement out of his voice. 
it appeared the universe was delivering again. Happy to lend a neighborly hand. So you're going now? Yes, sir. Okay, not a problem. I'm just working in the basement, but I'll come up now and then to make sure it's all good. It's a bummer what happened and all, but if we all stick together, we should be fine. A bummer? Understatement much? Sure, did you want me to get anything for you? Jack asked to be polite. No, son, unless you trip over a six-pack of course, said Larry Dawson, smiling and twisting the handle of his hidden knife absent-mindedly. You be careful. This is the end of the world, after all. No way to tell what lunatics are on the loose out there. Sure will. Jack got back into the car and pulled away, feeling a little unsettled. He had a sneaking suspicion Mr. Dawson might be losing it a little. Couldn't blame him. But he decided it might be better to avoid their neighbor from now on. He talked to Katie about it when he got back. He wondered briefly if Larry had buried Mrs. Dawson or if she was still in the house somewhere. Hell, maybe he'd stowed her in the cabin and he wanted help to move. Jack chuckled, more to make himself feel better. The morbid thought was anything but amusing. After he turned onto the main street of their little suburb, though, he forgot all about Mr. Dawson and everything else for a while. Six. Katie dreamed. She was walking on a beach. About thirty feet ahead were her parents, who were walking side by side. The forbidding clouds were low in the sky, and a gentle breeze brushed her face. Something was wrong. She called them, but they didn't answer, didn't even turn to look over their shoulders at her. She began to run, but the sand under her feet gave way with each footfall, and soon she found herself ankle-deep, falling to her knees in the soft sand as her parents walked on, oblivious. Mom! Dad! Wait! She struggled to lift her feet out of the sand, but its grip tightened. She looked down. There were teeth in the sand. Katie gasped and sat bolt upright in bed. The pain in her ankles didn't abate upon waking. In the dim of her room, she could see a shape leaning over her. Katie opened her mouth to scream. A hand fell over her mouth. She reached up and clawed at the hand. It was warm and dry against her mouth and didn't budge, even as she scratched and dug her fingernails into the skin. She stopped struggling when she felt a cold, thin line of steel pressed against her vulnerable throat. That's better, said a menacing male voice near her ear. I don't want to hurt a hair on your pretty head, but if you scratch me again, I'll gut you like a fish. He let that sink in for a moment. Nod if you understand. With her heart beating fast enough to explode, Katie nodded. She allowed herself to calm down, and as the reptilian fight-or-flight response in her brain subsided, her conscious brain kicked in. She knew exactly who was in her bedroom. It was Larry Dawson. Now I'm going to take my hand away. Remember what I said. Katie took several deep breaths when he released her. What are you doing? No questions. I need some light. The shadowy figure stepped towards the window. Katie took her chance immediately and flung herself off the bed and promptly fell face first to the floor. Her forehead cracked against the floorboards and she rolled over, squinting in the light that now filled her bedroom. He walked over to her, chuckling. I guess tying your ankles was the right thing to do. He looked over her body appreciatively. No way I could catch a fit little thing like you. Katie felt a wave of nausea wash over her. Whether it was from hitting her head or his disgusting gaze, she had no idea. What do you want? She asked. You, he said, as he knelt next to her and reached into a gym bag on the floor next to him. I've wanted you for a long time. Let me go, you fucking freak! Katie's words were cut off by the hand again. This time it smoothed something over her mouth and withdrew immediately. It was a square of heavy-duty duct tape, and when she reached up to remove it, he slapped her hand away. She tried a second time, and he batted it away again. She didn't try again. Just watched him as her brain worked manically to find a way out of her predicament. That's better, 
he said. I'll have to punish you for your disrespect, but that can wait till later. Katie's eyes blazed with anger and she slapped him hard across the face. It surprised him, but he slapped her right back twice as hard. Stunned, she crumpled on the floor, the fight knocked out of her. Wasting no more time, he pulled out a long zip tie, the same as he used to tie her ankles, and secured her hands behind her back. Katie moaned as the nylon cut into her skin. No one to blame but yourself, he admonished, and he began putting the things he'd taken out of the gym bag away again. Katie's eyes widened when she saw him pick up the long carving knife and tuck it into the bag before zipping it up. He stood up and placed the bag on the bed before bending over and picking up Katie as if she weighed nothing. He slung her over his shoulder before picking up the bag and heading out. Katie didn't know what to do. Should she fight and risk more punishment, or bide her time until the odds were more in her favor? Come home now, please, Jack. Her captor took her out through the back door he had broken into and closed it before carrying her down the side of the house. She looked around frantically as he carried her through the side gate and into the front yard but her long hair effectively obscured her view of anything but the ground and a few feet in either direction. Katie strained to hear the sound of a car as she giddily watched his booted feet walking her down the driveway. There was no car. No sound of anything, for that matter. Where was Jack? As he stepped off the driveway and onto the road, Katie began to cry. Once she was in that house, she knew she wasn't coming out. Hey, mister, what are you doing? Katie's head jerked up at the strange voice as her captor stopped in his tracks. 7. There was no one around in the center of town, and Main Street was a mess. Broken windows, a burnt-out car, upturned trash cans. Jack navigated the CX-5 around a twisted shopping cart in the middle of the road. Its contents were strewn across both lanes, and he didn't want to think about the large, dark stain on the asphalt next to it. After he was past the shopping cart, he peered into the shattered windows of the Costco. It was dark, and he strained to see inside. He touched the brakes and came to a halt. He thought he saw movement. He had. Figures materialized from the dark as first one, then two, then more kids erupted from the store and began running towards his car, screaming and yelling. They ranged in age from about twelve to sixteen. He thought they were running for his help at first. He was wrong, and he knew it when he spotted the knives, baseball bats, and was that a crossbow? Amazed at what he saw, he didn't react for a second. Then he heard a sharp pop behind him and turned to find a bullet hole in the window of the rear door. Shit! Jack ducked as low as he could and planted his foot on the gas as the gang rushed the car. He was away before they reached him, but heard several objects strike the Mazda as he sped away. He didn't relax until he turned the corner a half mile away, and even then, his hands were trembling with the adrenaline coursing through his system. Holy shit! He kept his speed up for the rest of the drive, only slowing when he had to. He didn't come across any more gangs, or anyone else for that matter, before he turned onto Danny's street. The front door to Danny's house opened as he crossed the front lawn. Dude! You're alive, called his friend, rushing out to meet him. Jack immediately spotted the pistol tucked into the belt of his friend's jeans. Yeah, you too. Where did you get that? He asked as they grasped each other's hand and shoulder bumped. It's Dad's, he said, pulling it out and showing Jack. It's a Beretta. There's only one, though. Sorry. I didn't know he had one. I did. I wasn't allowed to tell anyone, though. It was for protection. Okay, fair enough. So, is he... I mean, did he... Yeah, Danny said solemnly. He died the day after Christmas. What about yours? Jack nodded. Sorry, man, he said, putting his hand on Jack's shoulder. Same. Danny looked around. Come inside. I haven't seen anyone around, but it's better if we're not out in the open. You're telling me. Danny gave Jack a bottle of water when they'd settled at the kitchen table, and Jack told him what he'd seen in the center of town. His friend was surprised things had deteriorated so quickly. So, you still want to join up with me and Katie? Jack asked. He knew the answer. They'd pretty much worked it out before the communications went down. 
The only downside to the whole scenario was the fact that Danny had a major crush on Katie and could get awkward around her. Hell yeah, said Danny. I don't have any other plans. I mean, what else are we supposed to do? Survive, I guess. Hide? Wait for help? Yeah, I don't think help is coming. The last reports I heard were that the Chinese were invading and that they'd threatened immediate retaliation on any country that tried to stop them. Why are they doing it? Who knows? But one thing's for sure, no one here can stop them. What are a bunch of kids going to do? They can just walk right in and take over everything. Transport, infrastructure, weapons, everything. What about the kids, though? Why didn't they just kill everyone? Don't know. I guess we're going to find out soon enough. You think they'll come here? Yeah, I reckon. It's the capital of the state. I think they'll probably make their base in every state capital and fan out from there. Shit, said Jack. That makes sense. Maybe we should get out and go across the border into Nevada? Nevada? Are you kidding, dude? It's a fucking desert. No, if we were going to do that, north into Oregon would be the way to go. Yeah, it's a long way, though, said Jack. Hey, maybe we wouldn't have to go interstate. El Dorado was only a little over an hour's drive east on the Lincoln Highway. We could hide out in there easy enough. Danny high-fived him. Awesome idea. Let's do it. They spent the next 30 minutes loading up the back of the CX-5 with non-perishable food and other supplies from Danny's. Lucky my dad went shopping a few days before, before he got sick. Jack could tell his friend was on the verge of tears and moved the conversation along quickly for both their sakes. Yeah, it worked out well. We should have a pretty good supply once we add in what we have at home, too. Do you think we should take any tools? Good thinking. Come on, said Danny, perking up. They went out back to his dad's garden shed and picked up a small axe, a hammer, and a rope. On the way back out front, Danny ran up onto the back veranda and grabbed his aluminum baseball bat. My zombie whacker. Jack laughed. They packed the new additions into the car and he waited while Danny headed inside to grab some clothes. He came back with a duffel bag over his shoulder and a small box under his arm. After tossing the bag in the back, he climbed in and showed Jack the box. It was full of CDs. Some music for the road. Cool. Jack started the car as Danny pulled out a disc and slid it into the player. A distinctive electric guitar riff began emanating from the speaker. He recognized it immediately, alive by Pearl Jam. He laughed and slapped the wheel. Very appropriate, dude. Danny, pleased with himself, began playing air guitar to Eddie Vedder's distinctive voice, and Jack soon joined in on vocals. They'd both become fans when Danny's father had introduced them to 90s rock the year before. There was real rock and roll before this stuff, but not much since, Mr. Cooper had said dryly as he handed them a bunch of CDs. Give it a listen. It'll change your world. And he was right. It had changed their world. A little, at least. They'd become 90s rock aficionados and spent a lot of their hangout time together listening to the Smashing Pumpkins, Soundgarden, and the Chili Peppers. But Pearl Jam and Nirvana were their favorites. They often argued about whether Nirvana would have been bigger than Pearl Jam if Kurt Cobain hadn't killed himself, with Jack firmly in the no camp. How could they have, dude? Half the reason they're as famous as they are is that he did kill himself, he had opined once. As for current music, neither of the boys were really into it, although Jack secretly enjoyed Taylor Swift before she went all dark and vengeful. We better avoid Main Street, said Danny as the next song began playing. Turn here and I'll take you another way. Not as quick, but sure better than being shot at again. 8. Dawson turned slowly in the direction of the voice, like a dog caught running away with its owner's favorite slipper. Katie craned her neck to try and see who had spoken. Through the curtain of hair, she saw a pair of sneakers topped by jeans. From the size of the shoes, she figured it was a boy of maybe 11 or 12. Katie began wriggling and yelling into the tape over her mouth, Help me, please! Well, hey, sport, said Dawson, straining to keep the struggling girl on his shoulder. Just helping a friend here. 
Someone broke into her house and tied her up. I was just taking her to see if I had something to cut these ties they put on her. I don't think she wants to go with you. Katie renewed her struggles in muffled yelling as Dawson weighed this up. I don't fucking care what you think, said Dawson, his pleasant tone changing to something more sinister. What are you doing here anyway? Fuck off and mind your own business. No. It's a free country. You better put her down, mister. I can tell she doesn't want to go with you. Put her down or what? snapped Dawson. Then he paused and sighed deeply. His tone changed again. Now it became weary and regretful. You know what, kid? Maybe you're right. Sorry, I've been a bit tense since my wife died. He dropped the bag and then eased Katie to the road. I guess in times like these we should be cooperating, not fighting about things, right? He held up his hands, palm out. Katie, now on her back, got a good look at the kid. He was Joe Average, sandy-colored hair with a spattering of freckles, dressed in jeans and a black hoodie with Chewbacca on the front. He was unarmed, but he didn't look frightened, just wary. Upon laying eyes on him, Katie understood two things. The kid wasn't going to be her savior, and he was in grave danger. She glared at him, shaking her head and trying to warn him with her eyes, but his attention was on the man in front of him. How about a peace offering? You look hungry, Dawson said, twisting as he bent over and reached into the bag. I have some candy bars and a Dr. Pepper somewhere in here. You can have a snack and then help me untie her. Run, Katie tried to scream. The kid took an uncertain step forward, even as the stranger stood upright and turned towards him, with cold steel death in his hands. The shotgun blast to the kid's chest lifted him off his feet and hurled him back onto the roadway, a fine mist of his own blood settling onto the asphalt around him. Katie's ears rung from the blast, and she knew he was dead immediately. Through tear-blurred eyes, she watched as Dawson stalked towards the body, stopping a few feet short. See what you made me do, kid? He screamed down at the boy, not willing to go any closer to his own handiwork. He moved from foot to foot for a minute before looking back at Katie. Shit. He ran across the road to his next-door neighbors and wheeled their trash can out onto the road, pulling it to a stop beside the body of the boy. Katie closed her eyes. She didn't want to watch. The sound of the body falling into the bin with a light thud and the familiar drummy neighborhood sound as it was wheeled back across the road were bad enough. She opened her eyes when Dawson returned after cleaning up his dirty deed. He didn't look at her as he put the shotgun back in the bag. He was pale, and his eyes had a wild look to them. Katie was in shock and didn't have long to think about what had just happened before her eyes. As soon as he had the bag zipped up, Dawson stood and threw her over his shoulder again before picking up the bag. She didn't have the strength to struggle this time. She had just witnessed the cold-blooded murder of a boy and knew that her fate was now in the hands of a psychopath. Dawson was too big, too well-armed, and too crazy to be stopped by anything she could do. When Jack returned, she hoped he was smart enough to work that out. Maybe it was better that Jack doesn't come back, she thought as Dawson unlocked his front door and carried her over the threshold. Her situation was dire, and she just prayed that it would be quick. Unfortunately, Katie was wrong. Now that she was in his clutches, Larry Dawson had no intention of killing her. She was his for keeps, and nothing he had in mind would be quick or easy. Nine. Jack turned onto his street two and a half hours after he had set out for Danny's. Nothing appeared amiss in the cul-de-sac until he was about to turn into his driveway. What's that? asked Danny, pointing at a dark patch on the road about ten feet beyond the driveway. Jack opened the driver's window and stuck his head out to look as he slowly turned into the driveway. Not sure, he said, 
pulling his head back in and parking the car. I'll have a look. He got out and pocketed the keys as he walked across the yard and out onto the road. Danny followed just behind. That's not good, said Danny as they looked down at the bloody mess. There was a sticky puddle of blood surrounded by a fine spray pattern of red. Jack felt his breakfast begin to churn in his stomach as his friend squatted and put the tip of his finger into the blood. Don't touch. This is pretty recent, he said, looking curiously at the film of red on his finger. It hasn't started congealing. What do you think happened? asked Jack. Danny looked at him, his face a few shades paler than it had been before they pulled up. Pretty sure someone was blown away. Jack's vision darkened at the edges. Katie! He turned without another word and sprinted for the front door, rummaging in his pocket for the keys as he went. Jack, wait! Danny called. If something had happened to Katie, it would be best if he saw first. Jack didn't wait, though. He plunged the key into the door and ran into the house and up the stairs with Danny hot on his heels. Katie, screamed Jack, bursting through the door and skidding to a halt in front of her empty bed. Danny stopped him. The bed was disheveled, the sheets pulled off and bunched on the floor. Jesus, said Jack. Let's search the rest of the house, said Danny. She may be hiding. They spent ten minutes searching the house, only stopping when Jack found the splintered wood around the back door handle. By then it was clear she was no longer in the house. They took her he said in a quiet voice as they headed back into the kitchen. Who do you think it was? Danny asked. Have you seen anyone hanging around? Jack collapsed into a chair at the dining table. No, it's been like a ghost town here. It was mainly older people in this street. I haven't seen anyone but Mr. Dawson. Who? The guy across the road, said Jack, looking at Danny, horror slowly enveloping him. He didn't get sick and... Oh, shit. I asked him to keep an eye out on our place when I went to get you. I basically told him Katie was on her own. Do you know if he had a shotgun? Don't know. He doesn't look the type, but I guess it's possible. You don't think she's... No, I don't think she's dead. And I don't know who got shot out there. But I don't think it's Katie. How can you be so sure? Well, I can't be. Not 100% anyway. But it seems our only suspect is Mr. Dawson, so if it was him, why would he drag Katie out onto the road and shoot her? Jack shook his head. Okay, if it's someone else's blood, that means Katie is still missing. Why would he come and take her? Because he's a filthy pervert, spat Jack. Danny nodded. So, if he is a pervert, he's not going to waste her, right? He wouldn't want to hurt her. Not yet, anyway. First he would want... Yeah, I got it, said Jack, standing up and holding out his hand. Give me your gun. Danny held up his hands placatingly. I will, but let's think this through. The guy's not stupid, right? No, said Jack, with his hand still held out. And? Danny stood up and pushed his friend's hand down. He's going to expect you to work it out and run over there with all guns blazing. If he's waiting for that, then he's not bothering Katie right now. I say we go out and make a show of searching for Katie. We'll knock on his door, but calmly, without accusations, and ask if he knows what happened. And then what? Then we'll make a show of leaving later this afternoon, before sundown. Jack shook his head, but Danny ignored him. Then, he said firmly, we come back under cover of darkness and break into his place. When we find Katie and get her out, you can go all Rambo on his ass. Jack's jaw was clenched as he processed Danny's plan. Laid out before him like that, it made perfect sense. Finally, he nodded. 10. After carrying Katie like a sack of potatoes down into his basement, Dawson had placed her on what she could only think of as a slab with handcuffs attached to each corner. She looked around the basement with big eyes. It was dark and dank, with cobwebs on the exposed timber of the ceiling. 
it was straight out of a horror movie. A deep, cold fear began to creep into her bones. Sorry if that's uncomfortable, he said, referring to the table or whatever it was she was lying on. I'll bring you a pillow down later. Those were the first words he'd spoken to her since killing the kid. She almost told him to go fuck himself, but stopped herself in the hope she might yet find a way out of this mess, or at least bide some time for Jack to find her. Thanks. The word felt like ashes on her tongue, and he seemed surprised at her submission. He didn't speak for a few seconds before nodding. Sorry, I have to do this. He reached into his pocket and pulled out a black bandana, placing it over her eyes and tying it quickly and efficiently. Her fear level went up a notch. She opened her mouth to begin the spiel she'd heard dozens of actresses say in horror movies over the years. You don't want to do this. It's not too late to let me go. But found something spongy and round pushed rudely into her mouth. She struggled to turn away, but he grabbed her by the hair and shoved it in, mashing her lip painfully against her teeth in the process. She tasted blood in her mouth. Katie stopped struggling, shocked by the sudden violence. That's better he said, loosening his grip on her hair before raising her head and securing the straps of the gag. Don't fight me and you won't get hurt. She felt his nasty hands on her and exhaled slowly when all he did was cut the zip tie securing her hands. She rubbed her wrists to get the blood flowing again and he seemed content to let her do this, but as soon as she had relaxed, he grasped her left wrist and pulled it up to the top corner of the slab. He clicked the handcuff closed. Katie tried to resist as he gripped her other hand, but he was too strong. Dawson freed her ankles of the zip tie next. Ignoring his warning, Katie kicked and lashed out with her feet, managing to score a direct hit to his belly with one blind push. She heard the breath whoosh out of his lungs. He paused and stepped away from the table for a minute as he got his breath back. Then he got back to wrangling her, this time a little more carefully. By the time he had secured both of her legs, they were both puffing with exertion. She heard footsteps come up beside her and then felt his warm breath on her ear. She tensed. One, two, three seconds. Then his finger touched her cheek. She pulled away and turned her face, but it found her again, this time trailing down her cheek, under her chin, and then on to her throat where it lingered before worming its way under the collar of her T-shirt. Katie shuddered in revulsion and the finger left her. Suddenly he gripped her chin painfully. I'll give you a free pass on that kick because I know you're frightened, but that's your final warning. Now I must go upstairs. I'm expecting a visitor, so don't go anywhere. Tonight is going to be something, something special. She heard his heavy footsteps on the stairs to the kitchen, followed by a door slamming and a bolt sliding home. She was alone. That was good. She was restrained and locked in a psychopath's basement. That was bad. And who is the visitor he was referring to? The emphasis he put on the word told her it wasn't going to be an invited guest. Then it dawned on her that he meant Jack. No! She pulled at the restraints. They had some slack, but the cuffs were securely anchored. She couldn't move any of her limbs more than a couple of inches. Jack was in danger. He would almost certainly come over to Mr. Dawson's when he found her missing, even if he didn't suspect it was him. Where else would a teenage boy go but to the, for all they knew, only surviving adult in their suburb, possibly the whole city? Tears of rage spilled from her eyes as she struggled, and the raw anger started to melt some of her icy fear. Jack was all she had left, and if the bastard touched a hair on his head, she would kill him. 11. Jack and Danny made a show of searching for Katie in the street. They started with the house next door and went along the cul-de-sac peering in windows and calling through doors. All the while, Jack surreptitiously watched Dawson's home. There was nothing, not even the flicker of a curtain. This, if anything, reinforced Jack's conviction that he was guilty, 
and that Katie was in his house at that very moment. With each passing minute, he became angrier and more frantic. After he bashed at the door of his neighbor four doors down and waited the prerequisite thirty seconds with no answer, he turned and stormed off the porch. This is pointless, he said to Danny. I'm ending it now. Danny, resigned to a preemptive strike, said, Okay, okay, and jogged to catch up to Jack, only catching him halfway across the road. That was when he noticed that Dawson's neighbor's trash bin was standing askew to the other one. It struck him as odd, because everything else about the yard was neat and tidy. The lawns, the gardens. In fact, it was an immaculately presented suburban home. Jack, wait. Let me check this out before we go storming up to his doorstep. He jogged over to the bin, but slowed when he saw a smear of brown on the lid and edge. He realized immediately that it was blood. Danny looked back over his shoulder and realized his mistake immediately. Jack had seen the look on his face and began walking across. Shit, breathed Danny. If Katie was somehow squashed into that bin, there was no way he could allow Jack to see her. With his pulse beating in his ear, he stepped up to the bin and lifted the lid. It took a moment for his eyes to register what he was seeing, and then he let out a yelp of shock and let the lid drop. Jack reached him as he fell to his knees and wretched up the contents of his stomach. What is it? asked Jack on the verge of tears. It's Katie, isn't it? Danny, on his knees, wiped his mouth and shook his head before heaving again, this time failing to bring up anything. No, it's not. You don't want to look, though. Jack ignored his friend and lifted the lid. What he saw sent a jolt of disconnect through his brains. The blood-smeared face of a young boy, his eyes wide in shock, rested against the side of his terrible, blood-smeared coffin. He had been placed feet first in the bin, his body settling awkwardly in an almost fetal position. Jack had buried his own parents barely twenty-four hours before. But the shocking sight of a kid in the trash bin jarred his senses and brought home the reality of his situation. He closed the lid and rested his hand on it, almost tenderly, as Danny climbed to his feet beside him. Are you okay? Jack asked, his face grim. Danny nodded. It had to be him, right? Yeah, said Jack. That means he's armed. We shouldn't. I mean, we better not try. You don't have to. She's my sister. Wait here. Wait here. Jack turned and went around the juniper trees that formed a barrier between Dawson's house and his neighbor's front yard. It was only when Danny heard him banging on the front door that he realized he still had the pistol in his pocket. Shit. Danny went to the end tree and watched with the gun now in hand. He would run to Jack's aid if he needed help. Jack banged on the door again. There were no glass panels in the door or set into the frame around it, and it felt rock solid, barely trembling in the frame when he hit it. Dawson! He thought he heard a noise behind the door. He hadn't really thought about the possibility that Dawson might try and blow a hole in him through the door, but he was pretty sure if he tried, the door would soak up most of the damage. Mr. Dawson? Nothing. He glanced back at Danny, who was watching from the edge of the road, his hand behind his back. Clearly, he had now taken out his gun. His friend shrugged. Jack decided to change tack. Mr. Dawson, have you seen Katie? She's missing. Still nothing. Jack banged the door with the heel of his hand in frustration. He wanted to kick the door in, but knew it would be suicide. He turned from the door and went back out to Danny. He's in there. I heard him. Did he say anything? No, he was just waiting, like a spider in the dark. What do you want to do? I want to break in there and kill his ass, but I know he'll be waiting for that. Even if we go around and try and break in the back way. I guess we go back to the original plan and do what you said. But we have to keep him interested so he stays away from Katie in the meantime. Danny nodded thankful that Jack had tempered his eagerness in hoping that Katie was all right. The body in the bin had driven home to him that this was no game, and that Jack's sister and they themselves were in imminent danger. He hoped that even waiting until dark would give them enough time to rescue Katie. He didn't verbalize this to Jack, of course. Okay, let's do it, he said. 
why don't we make a show of going up and down the street again? This time we'll go into each house and break in some doors or windows to keep them interested. Well, then why don't we take the car, too? If we're breaking in, we may as well grab canned food or shelf-stable milk and stuff. Who knows, we might even find weapons or tools we can take, too. They did just that. Over the next few hours, they broke into houses of Jack's former neighbors and gathered supplies they could take with them when they left for the El Dorado Forest. Katie was a constant, nagging worry in the back of his mind, and he made sure to yell strongly for her every ten minutes or so, not only for the benefit of Mr. Dawson, but also in the hopes that Katie would hear him and know he hadn't given up on her. They only saw one dead body during their searches, a man that Jack only knew as Sam, three doors down from their house. He sat in his living room in front of a black TV screen, staring at the ceiling, the skin on his face parchment gray and a good portion of it crusted with dried snot. Danny threw a blanket over his head. While it wasn't pleasant to see, the body of Sam was nothing compared to the horror in the bin, and they both went about their business without being too affected. Jack did a call-out hello a few times, as he did in every house. He assumed that Sam's wife Beth was somewhere in the house, probably upstairs, but there was no way he was going up to check. After searching five houses and three and a half hours later, they had packed the rear of the SUV full of non-perishable food and drink and had also managed to gather an arsenal of items that could be used as weapons if the need arose. A baseball bat, assorted knives, a decorative samurai sword that Danny insisted could be sharpened, a BB gun, and a slingshot. Every hour or so, Jack would head to Dawson's house and hammer on the door and call out asking if he'd seen Katie. There was never a reply, but each time Jack knew the man was in there. He could feel him, probably just waiting for him to make the mistake of breaking in the door. Do you think we're keeping him busy enough to stay away from Katie? He asked Danny upon returning from his fourth visit to Dawson's door. I do. I saw the curtains on that room on the second story moving just then. If he's got her, I'm pretty sure she's in the basement. I mean, that's what all the psychos seem to do, right? She could be up there, though. Danny put a hand on his arm. Jack, we've waited this long. Nothing's changed since we made the decision to start this. If we try to break in, he'll use the shotgun. The shutters are down on all the side windows, and you can be sure he's barricaded the back door. We need him to be off guard when we make our move. Jack nodded, his face unhappy. He felt like Dawson had all the control in this situation, and it was driving him nuts. We have one thing in our favor. He doesn't know we've seen the body of the kid. That part of the neighbor's yard is blocked from his view by the trees. And with you waltzing up there and knocking on the door, he won't suspect it. So he doesn't know that we know what he's willing to do. I say we wait for the sun to set, then try knocking one more time before we get in the car and drive out. He'll wonder why we left without trying harder. Will he? asked Danny. I think he'll be so eager to get back to his prize that he won't ask too many questions. Maybe we should have a mock argument in the street where I convince you we can't hang around any longer. He doesn't even have to hear us as long as he gets that we had a disagreement and that I won. Okay. Good. It's going to get dark in about an hour. Let's go back to your house and work out a plan of attack. 12. Dawson had run down from his study, surprisingly agile for a heavyset man, when he saw young Jack approaching his property for the fourth time. He was becoming more and more frustrated with every passing hour. All he wanted to do was get back down to Katie, and instead he had to monitor what these two young idiots were doing. Just as Jack climbed up onto his porch, he reached the front door and pointed his shotgun at the white-painted hardwood. Come on, you little shit. Break in. I dare you. Again, though, the kid turned away when he didn't answer the knock or the calls. Dawson nearly screamed in frustration. He decided that next time he would pull the door open himself and shoot the kid where he stood. He ran back up the stairs, shotgun in hand, and pulled the curtain aside to see what the little bastards were up to. He quickly dropped it when he saw the other kid looking directly up at him. 
He knew the kid couldn't have seen much besides the curtain moving, but he gave it a minute before he peered through a little more carefully. They were backing the car out of the Connors' driveway. He silently willed them to keep going once they were on the road, but they turned back into Jack's driveway and got back out and headed inside. They'd done a good job of looting the neighbors' houses, and Dawson briefly wondered if he should have been out doing that too. No, he had more important things to attend to. After he'd had some fun with Katie, he could begin to worry about more practical matters, like keeping them both alive for a long, long time. The boys obviously had a plan. If they were loading up the car, it indicated they wouldn't be hanging around. Otherwise, why not just use a wheelbarrow to move the goods into the house? The question was, would they come looking for Katie again before they left? Before he'd been spotted at the window, he supposed there'd been a chance they might have thought he'd gone, with or without Katie, but even they couldn't be dumb enough to believe it now. After five minutes of watching the house across the road, he grew bored. He looked at the dead computer regretfully before putting his shotgun down and unlocking the desk drawer. He slowly opened it and pulled out his Katie file. It was a black plastic folder with clear display sleeves. In each was a piece of A4 paper upon which he had printed out color pictures of Katie. They were images he'd saved and printed from her Instagram and Facebook pages. He took it back to the window and flicked through them, glancing occasionally across the road. It was a 50-page folder, and it was packed full of color images. One thing he'd discovered since he began stalking Katie was that teenage girls weren't shy about taking pictures, obviously thinking very little about who might be watching when they opened that little window to their life. Unfortunately, Katie was modest in comparison to some of her friends that he'd stalked by default. He found plenty of bikini shots, selfies in underwear, and suggestive images of them, but Katie was always better than that. It had only made him want her more. By the time he got to the last page and his favorite picture of Katie, the sun was going down and the two boys still hadn't emerged from the house. He slipped his fingers into the sleeve and pulled out the paper. He dropped the folder on the desk and held up the paper like a doctor holding up an x-ray. The image was Katie next to one of her slutty friends, her hair down and wearing a clingy black dress that hung mid-thigh on her. She wore pearl-drop earrings and looked tanned and beautiful and much more mature than her sixteen years. Dawson's eyes took in every line, every curve, every inch of her, suddenly in disbelief that he had this gorgeous creature in his basement and awaiting his pleasure. He decided that their first tryst shouldn't be in the basement. She was worth so much more than that, and why would he hide her away when he had inherited the whole world? There was no one to stop him. No. Tonight they would share a meal and wine in his kitchen, and that dress... She just had to wear that dress. He slipped the paper back into its sleeve and put the folder away before locking the drawer again. First things first, he would need to deal with the boy and his friend now. He picked up the shotgun and headed downstairs, but then paused in the hallway, thinking for a second before turning back into the kitchen. He thought he could afford a few minutes to check on Katie. 13. Katie had indeed heard Jack calling her name. It had been faint, and at first she'd wondered if it was her mind playing tricks on her. Hungry and thirsty, she had lost track of time, the blindfold effectively leaving her in permanent darkness and her mind wandering from scenario to scenario as she tried to predict what would happen next. To add insult to injury, for the last two hours she had been bursting to pee. The one constant was Jack's intermittent calling. I'm down here. No matter how much she tried to send that thought to him, his voice would fade away and seemingly give up within a few minutes. Her feelings when that happened were always mixed. Relief and disappointment. While she wanted to be rescued, she also wanted Jack out of harm's way and knew from what she had witnessed that day Dawson wouldn't hesitate to shoot whoever got in his way, 
including Jack. Hours went by, and she began to will Jack to give up looking for her. If she was going to get out of this, it would be on her own. She just had to hope that Dawson would get sloppy. A short while after she had this thought, she heard the door at the top of the stairs open and close. It had been about thirty minutes since she had last heard Jack call her name. She felt a stab of adrenaline. Was this Jack come to rescue her, or Dawson coming to gloat, or worse? She strained, listening to the soft footfalls and accompanying sighs from the old wooden steps. She sensed someone next to her, and her hope that it was Jack faded. He wouldn't have just stood over her. No, it was the creep again. Tears of disappointment stung her eyes, but she refused to allow herself to cry. Let's get that blindfold off, why don't we? She felt his hands on the blindfold, and Katie gladly raised her head to assist her captor in undoing the knot. Being tied up and isolated in a basement was bad enough. Being blind only made it worse. Even though there was only dim light from a kerosene lamp on the workbench against the long wall, Katie had to blink rapidly for a few seconds as her eyes adjusted. Dawson stood over her, smiling as if he had done her a huge favor by removing her blindfold. She sneered at him and looked away in a small act of defiance. That's okay. I know you're upset. I have some water for you. Are you thirsty? She looked back at him reluctantly. He held up a clear plastic water bottle and waggled it in the air. Katie had never seen anything look so good. She nodded. Okay, I'm going to take out your gag, but if you scream or cuss me, it'll go right back in. You hear? She nodded again. Okay, good girl. A few seconds later, he pulled the horrid ball out of her mouth. Katie gasped in relief. I need to pee, she blurted as he lowered the water bottle to her lips. Oh, I've been a bad host, he said with a chagrined look. Sorry, I was distracted by stuff. You have a drink and then I'll take you to the bathroom. Katie sipped the warm water as he held the mouth of the bottle to her lips. Some spilled out and over her chin, but she didn't care. She guzzled as much as she could. Wow, you're thirsty. Nearly drained the bottle. Now, I'm going to unshackle you. Same rule as the gag. If you play up, you're going straight back on and I don't care if you pee your pants, okay? She nodded. Okay? Yes. Yes what? She looked at him confused, and then it dawned on her what he wanted. Sir? That'll do for now. Whenever your gag is out, you'll call me sir. Understand? Fuck you. Yes, sir. After freeing her from the shackles, he secured her hands in front with a new set of handcuffs and led her up the stairs into the kitchen. A solitary candle sat on the counter, burning with a soft glow. Dawson pulled her towards it and picked it up before leading her down into the main hall to the bathroom. Katie glanced longingly at the front door, barely visible in the faint glow of the candle. Dawson opened the bathroom door and led her into the bathroom. He placed the candle on the sink and looked at her. I'm going to take off the handcuffs so you can do your business, but I'll be right outside the door. The window is nailed shut and this door can't be locked from your side, so don't get any ideas. If you try anything, I'll be here in a flash, and you'll never pee or poop on your own again. Understand? Yes, sir. Good girl, he said, and took off her cuffs. Much to her disgust, he patted her backside as he walked out. Remember, I'm right outside the door. Katie swallowed her anger and revulsion at the casual molestation, and watched until the door had clicked shut. She ran to the shaving cabinet. The shelves had been stripped. Same for the cupboard beneath the sink. God damn it! There was nothing in the bathroom she could use as a weapon or tool to get out. Not so much as a bobby pin. Feeling down but not defeated, she sat on the toilet and took care of her most pressing needs. Her captor appeared to have thought of everything but she knew she would eventually find some crack in his armor, hopefully before he put his filthy hands on her again. Are you finished in there? He called through the door, causing her to jump. 
Nearly, sir. Katie finished up and went to the sink. She washed her hands and splashed cold water on her face, staring into the mirror a long time before using the clean hand towel to dry her face. I'm done, she called. The door opened instantly and he stepped in, holding up the cuffs on one finger. Hands out, please. Katie did as she was told and was soon being led out of the bathroom. They had only just re-entered the hallway when light splashed across the front of the house. Dawson's reaction was instantaneous. He blew out the candle and let it drop to the floor and gripped Katie by the upper arm, pushing her back into the bathroom before pulling the door closed. She heard a click and realized he had locked her in. A second later, she heard the unmistakable pump of a shotgun. With her heart beating a hundred miles an hour, she put her ear to the door. 14. I think we should go now said Jack. It was the third time he had said something similar. Danny looked at his Samsung phone, which was down to 20% battery life. It was 6.26 p.m., and the sun had been down for almost an hour. Okay, he agreed. Jack jumped out of his seat. Let's go. They headed out to the car, Danny carrying the backpack with a handgun inside, along with an aluminum baseball bat, its handle protruding from the top. Jack climbed behind the wheel. He didn't waste any time starting the car, but Danny put his hand on the shifter before Jack could put it in reverse. You should back out in a wide circle, so the headlights run across the front of his house, then go down and around the cul-de-sac before we head back out. He won't miss us that way. K. Okay. Jack put the headlights on high beam and reversed out of the driveway onto the road in a wide circle until the beams splashed over Dawson's house. Then he put it in the drive and drove down into the end of the cul-de-sac and back out at a snail's pace. They both peered intently at the Dawson's house as they passed. The night was overcast, and with no street lights, it was hard to see details, but there didn't appear to be any light inside the house. Are you sure he was in there? Danny asked. It could have been wind blowing a curtain that I saw. I mean, I didn't see his face. He's in there said Jack, his tone leaving no room for disagreement. He put his foot down, and they headed out of Loxley Close. At his front window, Dawson watched the Mazda SUV head out of his street. His heart was still beating fast as he ran to the front door, opened it, and sprinted out onto the road. In the distance, he saw the car turn right at the end. His heartbeat slowed. The kid had given up on his sister and headed out of town with a trunk full of supplies and his boyfriend riding shotgun. Good choice, asshole. Don't worry. I'll look after your sweet, sweet sister. He headed back inside and locked the front door. Hello? The sound of the voice from the bathroom was tentative and tinged with hope, and he loved it. He placed the shotgun on the console table by the door and tiptoed to the bathroom resting his ear against it. Katie, is that you? He whispered breathlessly. The response was immediate and sudden. She pounded on the door so hard it made him jump. Jack, I'm in here. Let me out. Grinning, Dawson unlocked the door and pulled it open. Katie burst out and into his arms, only reeling back in horror when her brain registered it was her captor rather than her brother, waiting with open arms. He didn't let her go, though, pulling her into a rough embrace as she began to kick and fight. There, there, he said. Shh, your brother was here, but he's gone now. Packed the car and headed out with his friend. I guess it's just me and you against the world, kiddo. Katie struggled a bit longer, but the guy's arms were like knotted tree branches, and when he squeezed so hard she was unable to breathe, she capitulated crying softly into his chest. She refused to believe that Jack had left her. But then there had been no gunshot and no sound of a fight. Why would Dawson lie? After she had calmed, Dawson slowly eased his embrace and allowed her to pull away. Gripping her by the handcuffs, he bent and retrieved the candle and led her into the kitchen. He stopped and lit it again before directing her back down into the basement. This time he didn't lay her back down on the table 
Instead, he grabbed the manacle that had secured her right hand to the slab and clasped it on the chain of the handcuffs she was wearing. Now that we don't have to worry about being interrupted, I'd like to invite you to dinner. Are you hungry? Katie fell against the slab. All hope washed from her. I said, are you hungry? Sniffing miserably, she nodded, even though food was the furthest thing from her mind. Good, I'll get things started. Oh, and I'll have a surprise for you, too. Like an excited kid, he bounced up the basement steps again. Relieved to be alone and frightened of what was to come, Katie looked around frantically in the flickering light thrown by the lamp. She spied a screwdriver sitting on the workbench just a few feet away. Not quite believing her luck, Katie took a few steps toward the bench, stretching out her shackled arm until the chain was taut, then reaching out with her other arm. Her hopes were soon shattered. Her outstretched fingers only just managed to brush the rough wood of the bench top, at least six inches short of the tool. No, please, God, she whimpered and stretched until her wrist screamed in agony. She gained perhaps another half inch, and with every fiber of muscle, bone, and tendon burning, it was clear she wouldn't reach the screwdriver. Katie stopped trying and stumbled back to the bench. She collapsed next to it, sobbing. When he reached the kitchen, Dawson filled a saucepan of water and put it on the camp stove ready to light when he got back. He grabbed his shotgun and flashlight from the table and ran into the hallway like an excited schoolboy. A minute later, he was entering the front door of Katie's home, which had been left unlocked by her cowardly brother. He had already been in the Monahan's house that day, but knew the layout well enough from his previous visits anyway. He switched the flashlight on and took the stairs two at a time up to Katie's bedroom door. He paused a few seconds with his forehead against the door to catch his breath and allow his heartbeat to slow. What a cruel joke it would be to have a heart attack now, with her in his house and just an hour away from having his way with her. After he got his breath back, he pushed the door open and went to the chest of drawers next to her bed and pulled open the top one. It was what he was looking for. He rifled through her drawer, slightly disappointed that her taste in underwear was so plain. There was no lace to be seen. He grabbed a few pairs of what he considered to be the sexiest and bundled them into a plastic bag he found hanging on the door. Next, he went to the built-in wardrobe. He knew what he wanted in here, and with his flashlight tucked under his arm, he impatiently flicked through the garments, one by one, the plastic hangers clacking as he searched for the little black number. Finally, just as he was about to give up, he found it, ripping it off its hanger and stuffing it into the bag as he headed back into the hallway. On his way back to the stairs, he skidded to a halt in front of the bathroom door and quickly went through the drawers until he found one with items of makeup in it. He plucked a half-used red lipstick from the mess of items and backed it. He didn't know if it was Katie's or her mother's, but it would have to do. While his dear departed wife owned lipstick, the thought of his new paramour wearing the earthy tones his wife favored, or even allowing the same lipstick to touch her beautiful young lips, mildly revolted him. The night was still and dark as he rushed back across the road to his home. He entered and locked the door behind him. Nothing was amiss and he rushed to the kitchen and lit the stove to begin boiling the water for the spaghetti pasta. Katie stood up when she heard the basement door open. She dreaded what the surprise would be. Was it an instrument of torture? Something sexual? She felt a bitter taste in her mouth. She thought she might just throw up if he showed her a sex toy. What she didn't expect to see was a Target shopping bag, just like the one hanging on her door. Her captor was puffing with exertion, but was clearly pleased with himself as he placed the bag on the slab and gestured that she should open it. Katie hesitated, suddenly sure it would be Jack's head or something equally horrific in the bag. Go on, open it, snapped Dawson. It won't bite you. With trembling fingers, she reached over and pulled it open, keeping her face as far away as possible. Relief washed over her when she saw it was just clothes. He stood over her as she pulled the bag closer and reached in, pulling out her own dress. That's my favorite dress on you. I want you to wear it to dinner. And the lipstick. I put fresh underwear in there for you, too. I can get more stuff tomorrow, whatever you think you'll need. Katie felt sick. How on earth would he know about her dress? Exactly how long had he been stalking her? 
She shook her head. His smile slipped. What? He asked, genuinely puzzled at her reaction. I don't want anything to eat, she said, pushing the dress back into the bag and sliding it away from her. Like someone drawing a blind, his face went blank. He grabbed the bag and pushed it back towards Katie. Oh, we're having dinner. Not being hungry is irrelevant. You have ten minutes to get changed. Katie shook her head again, and suddenly his big hand was on her throat and squeezing it. We're having a fucking dinner date. Either you get dressed voluntarily, and we have dinner like civilized people, or I choke the life out of you right now, strip you naked, and put the fucking dress on you anyway. He squeezed harder and shook her a little. What do you say? Katie struggled to breathe as she clawed at his hand. She couldn't budge so much as a finger. Motes started to dance in her vision, and finally she weakly patted the back of his hand in submission, nodding. Dawson let go of her, and she fell against the slab, taking deep gulps of air. Good girl. I thought you'd see it my way. Now get yourself dressed. I'll be back in ten minutes. He turned on his heels and headed for the staircase. Tears welled in her eyes at the hopelessness of her situation. Her bravery didn't count for much. He knew he had her beat and didn't even bother turning around to make sure she was doing as he had told her. Ten minutes, he called from the doorway into the kitchen, before slamming the door and locking it. Katie grasped the soft material of the dress and scrunched it in her hands, her eyes staring into the distance. There really was no way out. She began to undress. Fifteen. How long should we wait? asked Annie. They had driven around the block and parked in a darkened street parallel to theirs. Not long, said Jack flatly. Danny picked up his phone. There was no reception or internet, and it was now down to a 15% charge. Funny how the further a battery charge went down, the faster it seemed to drain. An hour? No. Twenty minutes max. We should probably wait till he's tired. It would probably even be better to wait till like one or two in the morning. Are you crazy? I don't even want to wait half an hour while Katie's alone with that bastard. Danny nodded. We go in at 7 p.m., okay? I'll take the gun. Danny wasn't sure when Jack had taken the lead in their friendship, but for now, given the circumstances, he was willing to let it be. He pulled the Glock out of his pocket and gingerly handed it to Jack. Unlike Danny, whose healthy respect for guns bordered on fear, Jack handled the pistol in a familiar fashion. While his mother hadn't allowed a gun in the home, even after he joined the shooting club, she had let his father take him to the range several times to learn to fire a pistol after he was proficient with long guns. Jack had taken to pistols like a duck to water. While he enjoyed firing rifles and shotguns, there was something different, more powerful about using a pistol. It was more of an extension of your arm than a piece of equipment. By the light of Danny's phone, he quickly ejected the magazine, then slotted it back in and chambered around. Let's get some air while we work out our plan of attack. Jack said and got out of the car carrying the gun. Standing under the tailgate of the Mazda, they selected the weapons. Danny took a small tomahawk and the baseball bat. Jack, in addition to the Glock, grabbed an eight-inch ice pick they'd found at the Connors. He pulled the sheath off to reveal a sharp aluminum needle about four inches long. Mm, don't you think you need something with a bit more stopping power? Danny snorted. Jack didn't answer just palmed the handle and closed his fists so that the needle stuck out from the bottom. With a violent motion, he buried it to the hilt in a leg of ham they'd taken from the Connors. Danny's eyes widened. If the Glock misses and he's in close, it'll do just fine. Fair enough. Let's hope he doesn't get that close. Next, they discussed their plan of attack. Jack decided that the second story was their best bet for breaking in undetected. He would climb up the latticework on the side of the house and go in via a second-story window. To this end, he added a chisel to his small arsenal. He's bound to have made sure the ground floor windows are secure, and if he's got Katie in the basement, it's more than likely he'll be down there than not. I'll get in through a window while you wait on the ground. Once I'm in, we'll decide whether I'll let you in the front or back door, 
or get you to come up the lattice too. Danny didn't know you. He was beginning to get the creeps just standing in the dark in the silent street, let alone thinking about meeting a psychopath in his darkened home. When they were ready, they got back in the car and drove back to the corner of Jack Street, pulling into a driveway around the corner and four doors down. We'll go the rest of the way on foot. It was slow going in the dark. The night was overcast, the clouds dark and almost completely blotting out the moon and starlight. Neither of them had realized just how much ambient light their city generated at night until the power went out. Wish we had a flashlight, said Danny. I don't. If we accidentally splashed light on a window or he happened to be looking out, we'd be sure to get a shotgun blast for our efforts. I suppose, said Danny. He had a bad feeling about the whole exercise, but knew there was no way of talking Jack out of it. Once they were on Loxley Close, they crossed to Dawson's side of the street, sticking to the shadows of the neighboring houses until they arrived at the house next door. Danny shivered as Jack led them up the driveway and crouched behind the two trash cans next to their fence. It was only a couple of hours since they'd found the dead boy in the next-door neighbor's yard on the other side, and the horror of it was still fresh. Looks clear. Jack reported. I'll have a quick scout. You stay here. Before Danny could answer, Jack jumped the small fence that separated this yard from Dawson's and disappeared into the darkness. Danny sat back on his haunches and sighed. After three minutes, Jack hadn't returned, and he began to chew his lip. He hadn't heard a scream or a gunshot, but that didn't really ease his mind. He decided to stretch his legs and bumped his shoulder on the bigger of the two bins as he stood, it barely budged, and suddenly the face of the dead kid was floating in his mind. What if... Don't be stupid, he told himself. There's no one in the bin. The longer Jack took, the more Danny thought about the bin. In the end, he knew the only way to solve the problem was to open the damn bin and look. He took out his phone and swiped the screen. His battery was under 5% now, and the screen brightness had automatically been dimmed to preserve power. Holding it in his left hand, he grasped the lid and slowly lifted it as he brought the phone closer. That was when a hand fell on his arm. 16. Jesus, Jack, you scared the hell out of me. Sorry, I didn't want to risk calling out. Danny eased the lid closed. Thankfully, there was nothing in the bin but bags of trash. Well, a whisper would have been fine, he said, his voice shaky. What did you find out? He's in there, said Jack, his voice betraying a hint of outrage. I could see a sliver of the kitchen through a crack in the shutters on the side of the house. He's at the stove, and I could see two place settings on the table. I think it's for him and Katie. That's good, right? That means she's, yeah, it means she's alive. I still don't know where she is, though, and the rest of the ground floor is shut up tight. No way we could get in without making a noise loud enough for him to hear. We'll go with the original plan. You ready? Danny nodded. He had a knot in his stomach, but wasn't about to tell the kid whose sister was locked in a house with a psycho that he had a bad feeling. Okay, let's do it. They darted into Dawson's yard and headed down the side closest to them. I'll go up first, said Jack. You wait here. I'll break in, then come back to the window and tell you the plan. Danny nodded and watched his friend scurry up the latticework quickly and efficiently, his only difficulty coming when he climbed over the eaves of the overhanging roof that went around the edge of the second story. His legs dangled midair before he was able to pull himself over and disappeared. As Danny watched, Jack's head, a darker shadow against the overcast sky, appeared. Danny gave him a thumbs up by the light of his phone before Jack vanished again. A minute later, Danny heard a muffled splintering sound above him. It wasn't terribly loud, but he worried that it was loud enough to be heard inside. There was nothing after that, and Danny imagined Jack pulling up the sash window and disappearing inside. The crack of the window fastener coming free of the wooden frame seemed as loud as a gunshot for Jack. He knew it was exaggerated by the unnatural silence of the surrounds and his own expectation of stealth, but he pulled away from the window and lay flat on his stomach as he waited for Dawson to come running. He was a sitting duck and wondered if he would survive the fall if he had to slide off rather than face being shot from the window. He let three minutes pass by before concluding he hadn't been heard and inched his way back to the window and peeked inside. 
He had a better look inside now and could make out a large, flat shape through the curtains. A bed. Just behind the glass, he could see the window fastener hanging askew. The chisel had already lifted the window an inch, and now it was just a matter of pulling the lower sash up as quietly as he could. He held his breath and slid it up. Thankfully, it appeared to be well-maintained and slid up easily and quietly. He was pretty sure that a screech at that point would have ended his rescue mission. When he deemed it up far enough, he exhaled and placed the chisel on the window sill, then gingerly eased the leg through. The drop was further than he thought, and he almost overbalanced before his foot touched the carpeted floor and he was able to pull his other leg in. He felt his back pocket to make sure the ice pick was still in place, then pulled out the clock. He was good to go. Jack crept to the door and slowly turned the handle, taking a breath before pulling it open slowly. Again, no squeak. Thank God Larry Dawson seemed to be obsessive about the maintenance of his property. The hall he looked out upon was lit by a dim glow from the opening to the staircase that led downstairs, the candlelight he'd seen in the kitchen. Rock music he didn't recognize wafted up from the ground floor along with the smell of cooking meat. Jack's stomach growled in response. He decided to quickly investigate the upstairs, hoping the music would mask any small sounds he might make. There were only three rooms besides the one he'd come through. He found another bedroom with a single bed, a bathroom, and the final door opened on what appeared to be a study. He ducked in quietly, his heart racing at a hundred miles an hour. He was pretty sure it hadn't gone under a hundred and twenty beats a minute since he'd entered Dawson's home. It was a pretty regular study, except for the odd positioning of a telescope at the window. It was in a horizontal position facing directly across the road. Jack knew what he'd see when he looked into the scope, but looked anyway. A magnified view of his sister's darkened window filled his vision. Dirty goddamn pervert, he breathed. He didn't know he had company until he heard a floorboard creak behind him. Before he had a chance to turn or raise his gun, pain exploded in the back of his head. Everything went black. 17. Jack! Wake up! Jack! He tried to ignore the voice. His head hurt really badly, and all he wanted to do was sleep. Jack! The persistent voice wasn't going to let him. Shut up. Let me sleep. Jack! Wake up, please, before he comes back! A sliver of cold, hard fear sliced through the fog in his mind, and his eyes cracked open. He was tied to a chair at the small dining table he'd seen earlier through the crack in the window and jerked his head to the right, wincing as pain shot through his neck. Katie was sitting at the head of the table. She wore red lipstick, and her hair was pulled back from her face and tied in a bun. Her wrists were tied with red ribbons to the arms of the office chair she was sitting in, a strange accessory to the slinky black dress she wore. Thank God you're okay, she said her voice cracking with emotion. I thought he'd killed you. Jack looked around, more gingerly this time. Where is he? I don't know. You were here when he brought me up. Shit. How long ago? I've only been here a few minutes. Jack took stock of his situation. He was in a regular kitchen chair with his hands tied behind his back. His ankles were secured to the chair legs by zip ties. Can you see what my hands are tied with? he asked, twisting his body as far forward as the restraint would allow. Katie leaned over. It's a rope, you know, like a colored one. Nylon? Yeah, about a quarter of an inch thick. It's around your wrists and tied to the middle slat of the chair back. Jack pulled against the rope. There was some give. He splayed his fingers and strained downward. His gun was gone, but maybe the bastard had missed the ice pick. The handle wasn't much thicker than a pen. What are you doing? asked Katie. I had an ice pick in my pocket, said a red-faced Jack. I'm trying to see if it's still there. Finally, the tip of his outstretched index finger brushed the rounded tip of the ice pick's handle. It was protruding from his pocket at an angle, and he realized it must have come close to falling out. He relaxed and looked at Katie. Did he say anything before he went? He said he was going to make sure we didn't have any more uninvited guests. Danny's out there. Quick, 
We have to get free before he finds him. Try and move your chair out and around to me. Fortunately, while Dawson had secured Katie's wrist to the handles of the office chair, he hadn't thought it necessary to do the same with her feet. With some difficulty, she was able to scoot backwards from under the table and then push her way backwards to Jack in a wide semicircle. Good. Now turn around and I'll try to stand up so you can reach my pocket with your hand. Katie spun around as Jack leaned forward and strained to straighten his legs enough to stand up. The first attempt failed miserably and he fell backwards, the chair legs scraping loudly on the tiled floor. They both froze. I'll try again. I don't know how long I'll be able to hold, so grab it as quick as you can. Jack stood again, swinging his backside in the chair towards his sister. Veins stood out in his neck as he held himself in the air, leaning back as far as he dared. Katie's outstretched fingers reached between the wide slats of the chair back. She barely brushed his pocket before Jack collapsed backwards again, the slats wrapping the back of Katie's hand on the way down. She bit back a cry of pain. Try again, she said. I nearly reached. With a supreme effort, Jack raised himself again and Katie managed to hook her finger onto his pocket. Nearly there. Try to hold there. Bang! The unmistakable sound of a shotgun blast startled both of them into stillness. It came from the side of the house where Jack had climbed the trestle. Fuck. Hurry, Katie. 18. Danny rubbed his hands together and huddled in on himself. The clouds overhead had cleared, and while the moonlight was welcome, the night had gotten colder as they had dissipated. He was beginning to fret about Jack. It had been over five minutes, and it shouldn't have taken that long for him to come back and let Danny know the next steps of their plan. He decided to head to the front of the house and see if he could see anything through the windows of the second story. From the relative safety of a sycamore tree in the front yard, Danny looked for any sign of Jack, or anyone else for that matter. There was nothing. He gave it another two minutes before he began to seriously freak out. What if Jack had come back to the side window while he was gone? Danny sprinted from the cover of the tree and down the narrow space between the house and the neighbor's fence. He didn't see the dark figure, the unmistakable shape of a shotgun in its arms, until he was within two feet. His brain, honed by years of playing first-person shooter games, instantaneously made two judgments as the shotgun was brought to bear on him. One, there was no chance of stopping in time or trying to dodge the blast. Two, his only chance was to go in low and hard. He did just that. With a strange cry, part fear and part defiance, he launched himself low and hard. The gun went off as he hit his target in a perfectly executed hawk tackle, his shoulder striking his assailant in the midriff and driving him backwards, the back of his head cracking against the concrete path. Danny groaned in pain as he took stock of the situation. The ample body of Larry Dawson cushioned his fall, but the back of his foot was on fire. The blast had caught the heel of his ASICs while he was in mid-flight. The good news was the bastard wasn't moving. Danny scrambled off him, but had to bite down a scream at the fresh protest from his injured foot. He rested on his hands and knees for a few seconds and then reached for the shotgun. It was resting loosely in Dawson's slack hands. His hands closed over the warm barrel, and he held his breath as he pulled it delicately from the meaty hands. When it was free, he allowed himself to exhale and then used it as a crutch to climb to his feet. In severe pain but feeling empowered at having overcome the boogeyman, he hopped on his good leg and pumped the shotgun. The used cartridge fell to the ground and he aimed the weapon at Dawson. Get up! Dawson didn't move and Danny prodded the shoulder of the unconscious man with the barrel of the gun. This time the prisoner groaned. Get up, fucker! What? Danny could see Dawson's eyes glint in the moonlight. He shuffled back awkwardly. I said get up and don't try anything or I'll blow your fucking brains out. Calm down, kid, said Dawson holding his hands palm out. I'm calm enough considering you nearly blew my foot off, asshole. Sorry about that. You startled me. Yeah, right. Did Katie startle you too? Or that kid in the trash? What? What kid? And who's Katie? Just get up, yelled Danny. And keep your hands where I can see them. Okay, okay. Dawson did as he was told, keeping his hands in plain view as he got to his feet. Danny kept his distance and also kept the shotgun trained on the chest of Dawson. What now, kid? 
You're bleeding all over the place. Without lowering the shotgun, Danny glanced down at his foot. Dawson wasn't exaggerating. Blood was pouring from his shredded heel, which, strangely, hadn't hurt so much until the bastard pointed it out. Suddenly feeling woozy, he waggled the barrel at Dawson. I'm fine. Put your hands on your head and put your face against that wall. Dawson looked like he was going to protest, but seemed to change his mind just as quickly. He simply nodded and obeyed the order, looking dazed and a little confused. Danny moved in behind him with the vague idea of patting him down like he'd seen cops do in the movies. He took his hand off the forestock and reached out. That was when Dawson struck, swinging around with a speed that belied his size and slapping the barrel of the gun away. It went off, striking the lattice trestle the jack had climbed so easily. Timber and leaves exploded as Danny found himself swung around and slammed headfirst into the wall. The gun fell from his hands as he tried to protect his face. The blow stunned him, but Dawson wasn't finished yet. A strong hand found his collar and gripped him, pulling him back before propelling him forward into the wall for a second time. Danny's vision exploded in swaths of color. He felt like a rag doll in the hands of a psychopathic child as he was pulled back and rammed into the wall a third time. He didn't have the means to fight. He couldn't even brace himself as he tried to reach the hands of his attacker. After the fourth blow, it didn't seem to matter. He was exhausted, and a strange liquid warmth flowed through his body as the lure of unconsciousness called him. He succumbed completely after Dawson bashed his head into the wall a fifth time. Dawson smashed the kid's head into the wall three more times, not satisfied until it looked like a cantaloupe that had been dropped from a roof. He let him drop and then gave him several kicks for good measure, angry at the kid and himself that he'd been bested and placed in such a vulnerable position. As he stood over the body, his head throbbing painfully where it had hit the pavement. Larry was glad he decided to keep Jack alive. He would make him pay for nearly ruining his date with the long-adored Katie. For that short period of pain, doubt, and fear, while his little boyfriend had a shotgun pointed at his heart, he would exact the ultimate revenge on Jack. He would rape his sister while he watched, and then kill him. 19. Hi, kids, said Larry Dawson happily as he came back into the kitchen, his shotgun resting in the crook of his arm. Oh, you're awake, Jack. Good. You get a front row seat to watch all the fun Katie and I are going to have before I kill you. Fuck you. Now, now, you've only got yourself to blame. You really should have kept going, you know. Dawson's tone was regretful, but his eyes ran over them in a coldly efficient manner as he placed the weapon on the breakfast bar. Katie held her breath, and Jack stared back at him defiantly. She had only just rolled the chair back to its original location seconds before their captor had returned. He apparently didn't notice anything, and after a moment, turned and headed to the cooktop. Jack saw leaves and splinters caught in Dawson's sweater. They had heard the second shotgun blast and the thudding that followed. It was clear a struggle had taken place, and it didn't bode well that Dawson was now standing in the kitchen. "'Where's Danny?' asked Jack, feeling hollow. "'Who's that now?' "'You know, asshole.' Dawson stopped stirring. "'Danny is taking a rest. A long rest where he can't disturb anyone ever again.' he said without the courtesy of turning around. Oh, no. Katie gasped and began crying. You killed him? A curtain of red descended over Jack's vision. The only thing that kept him from attempting to leap out of his chair to attack Dawson was the fact that he would end up on his face and at the mercy of the shotgun if he did. Oh, lighten up. I probably did him a favor. Katie's chin fell to her chest, and she wept quietly as Dawson began dishing up the meal he'd prepared. Jack took a deep breath as he forced his rage back in its box. While Dawson was still facing away from them, he tried to catch Katie's eye. Her tied hands curled over the end of each of the chair arms. They were clenched into fists. He knew the ice pick had to be in her left hand, but she was doing a good job of hiding it. 
Unfortunately, there was no way they could try to use it to free themselves unless they were left alone, and Jack had a fair idea that the chances of that were zero. When he was done serving, Dawson brought two plates to the table and sat the first on his own setting and the other in front of Katie. Sorry, Jack, none for you, he said as he leaned over Katie and began working on the ribbon, securing her right hand. Go to hell, you pathetic pervert, Jack grated, wanting to distract Dawson as he untied Katie. Dawson paused, a flash of anger crossing his face. He stood up straight and produced a flick knife from his jeans pocket. He flicked it open and held it up for Jack to see. Katie's eyes widened. If you don't shut your trap, I'll cut your tongue out and make you eat it. How do you think Sis would like that? It's okay. He's sorry. Jack, be quiet. Dawson smiled. You've been told, Jack. But that really was your last warning. He put the knife on the table, and Katie visibly relaxed. That's when Dawson pounced. He grabbed her roughly by the hair on the back of her head and pulled down sharply, locking his open mouth over hers as she grimaced in agony. Tears of rage spilled from Jack's eyes as he watched the abusive kiss. Leave her alone, you bastard! Dawson concluded the kiss and straightened. Wow, I gotta say, that kiss will make my famous bolognese taste like sawdust by comparison. Girl, you are tastier than I ever imagined. Katie was breathing hard, the pale skin around her mouth pink from the pressure of the uninvited kiss. When she spoke, her words shocked Dawson almost as much as they shocked Jack. Plenty more where that came from. But I'm really hungry and your meat sauce smells delicious. Maybe for dessert? She said seductively. Dawson's mouth hung open. Well, aren't you full of surprises? <laughs> he said finally regaining his composure. He reached out and cupped her right breast through the slick material of her dress and squeezed, waiting for a reaction. Katie gasped and bit her lips seductively. A look of disbelief crossed Dawson's face. He leaned over and placed his lips on hers more gently this time and kissed her. Katie kissed him back. Katie, stop it, screamed the red-faced Jack. What the fuck? Katie broke away from the kiss. It's all right, Jack. We just have to accept that this is the way it is. Dawson laughed. Holy shit. You know what? Keep being a good girl, and I might even let Jackie boy see the night out. Katie smiled. I sure hope that's what you'll do, sir. Okay, let's eat. You're going to need all your energy, he said running a tongue over his upper lip. He reached down and finished untying the ribbon on her right hand. Thank you, sir, said Katie meekly as he moved to the other hand. Katie looked past him at Jack, her gaze more intense than her brother had ever seen it. Her ruse had worked. Unsuspecting, their captor had only just straightened when Katie reared up like a cobra and jammed the ice pick into the side of his neck Larry Dawson screamed and clutched his neck in surprise and pain. In his hurry to pull away, he tripped on the chair leg and fell backwards, cracking his head on the corner of the table as he fell. Quick, Katie, untie me! She tore her horrified stare from the groaning Dawson and ran to Jack, beginning work immediately on the rope securing his hands behind his back. Hurry! It's not coming loose, Jack. Stop wiggling! The knife! Get his knife! screamed Jack, nodding at the still-open knife on the table. Katie ignored him, her fingers finally making some progress. There was another groan from Dawson as he kicked out, trying to get to his hands and knees. Katie yelped as the chair she'd been sitting on spun away. The knife! Katie stopped what she was doing and rushed to the table, leaning across it, almost at full stretch to avoid going anywhere near Dawson. The heeled shoe she was wearing slipped and she lost purchase just as she was about to grab the handle. Again, she lunged and smiled as her hand closed around the handle. Her smile slipped away when Dawson's meaty hand reached from under the table and gripped her wrist. 20. Katie shrieked as Dawson, his face bleached of color, lurched to his feet, the ice pick still protruding from his neck, a ribbon of blood wending its way down the collar of his sweater. The girl struggled, but even injured, Dawson's strength was too great to overcome. 
He held her in place as he reached up with his other hand and slowly pulled out the ice pick. The spike came free, and blood immediately pooled in the puncture and began to flow more freely from the wound. Dawson raised it and looked in disbelief at the blood-coated point of the ice pick. Then his eyes fell on Katie, forgetting for the moment that Jack was even in the same room. You fucking bitch. I'll kill you for that. Dawson shook her hand until the knife spun away across the tabletop and clattered onto the floor. Katie began to sob. Please, I'm sorry. Too late for that, Missy, he said, raising the ice pick as he flattened her hand on the table. No, Jack called, his shoulders moving frantically as he tried to get his hands free of the loosened rope. Dawson's lips peeled back from his teeth in an ugly smile as he drove the spike of the ice pick through the top of Katie's hand and into the hardwood tabletop, pinning her to it. Katie shrieked, but enraged beyond care, Dawson stood up and grabbed her ankles, pulling her bodily from the table, then shoving her back over it, slamming her face down next to her pinned hand. Next, he used his knee to push her thighs open and began to unzip his jeans. Jack finally got his hands free of the ropes that had been loosened by his sister, and as Dawson pulled Katie's dress up over her backside, he hurled himself, ankles still secured to the chair, in a crazy jumping launch at the psycho, his full weight striking the big man hard in the side and carrying them both to the floor. Jack immediately began punching the face and head of their tormentor. Jack was a powerful kid. He played linebacker in his high school football team, and he also knew how to punch, courtesy of the sparring his coach made them do for fitness. The punches he landed on Dawson hurt, but the big man was doing a good job of covering up, and when Jack missed two hits, he spun like an alligator doing a death roll and trapped Jack under him. Jack flailed wildly, trying to keep his arms and wrists away from Dawson's hands, and also land punches. He knew if the big man got a grip on him, it was game over. An open-handed slap across the face was the last thing Jack expected, and it stunned him enough for Dawson to grab his left wrist and begin to reach for his right. That's when Katie reached over and gripped the bastard's hair, pulling on it sharply. Dawson swore and tried to extract her fingers from his hair with his free hand. Jack used the distraction to land a right hook to the chin. The blow incensed Dawson, and he released Jack's wrist and seized his throat, choking him one-handed. Jack knew he was in trouble right away. The strength of the man's grip was astounding, and with his vision swimming, he reached up and began trying to pry the thick fingers away. It was an impossible task, and Jack's eyes bulged as his face turned from red to purple. Through rapidly darkening vision, he saw Dawson finally rip the hand of his sister from his hair and batter away. His grip on Jack's throat loosened somewhat while he was busy, and Jack took a meager gulp of air before his windpipe closed again. With time running out, he gave up trying to get free of the impossibly strong hand and reached out behind his head, the fingers of his hand scrabbling like blind crabs as he searched for the knife that had fallen to the floor. The persistent Katie, still pinned to the table by her hand, appeared above Dawson again, this time screaming and scratching at his face with her free hand. Dawson's hand squeezed tighter, clearly eager to end Jack so he could deal with his sister. Jack's heartbeat became loud in his ear. His vision faded to black, and his fingers found the knife. With a last-ditch effort, he grabbed it and slashed blindly in a sweeping upwards arc. 21. It wasn't simply the sobbing, the dead weight on top of him, or the smell of smoke that brought Jack around. It was a combination of all three tugging him out of the black depths of unconsciousness. His eyes creaked open. The ceiling and walls basked in an orange glow, muted and washed by gray tendrils of smoke. Fire. He knew he should be alarmed but the heavy weight on top of him made it hard to breathe and didn't leave room for any other concern. He took stock of his situation. His throat hurt like hell, and he was covered in a warm and sticky substance. But he was alive. And the sobbing meant Katie was too. Katie? He croaked. His throat shrieked in protest. Jack? Oh, my God! You're alive! I thought you were... Where are you? 
The words were clear in his head, but came out as little more than a rasp, and each one its own little inferno of agony. "'Jack, you have to help me. The candle started a fire, but I can't get my hand free.' Jack swallowed molten lava. "'Wait!' He reached up, and his hand encountered the top of Dawson's head. He snatched it away quickly, but there was no movement or protest from the man. Jack started to wiggle out from under him, his fingers slipping as he tried to find purchase on the floor. He realized then why he felt wet and sticky. Copious amounts of blood coated him in the floor around him. He lifted his head, the blood in his hair cooling as he examined Dawson. It would be too difficult to slide from under him. He reached out again, hands clamping the big man's head, grimacing when his finger accidentally brushed against an eyeball. He was definitely dead then. No one alive would take a finger to the eye and not flinch. Jack shivered and got on with it, twisting Dawson's head and heaving up with his own shoulder. The body shifted slightly. Hurry, Jack! With a renewed effort, he heaved again and this time managed to tip the body far enough to slip from under it. He scrambled to his feet, slipping in the blood on the floor as he rounded the upturned table. Katie leaned against it, her good hand supporting the wrist of the one that had been pinioned. She was pale, her face tired and pained. Three feet away, the candle had ignited the ugly wallpaper that covered the longest wall in the kitchen. It had fallen too far from Katie for her to reach, and the flames were now crawling up the wall and licking the ceiling. Jack knew they had only minutes to escape. He knelt next to Katie, every muscle in his body protesting the sudden move, and grasped the handle of the ice pick. It was buried deep in the table, with barely a centimeter of the thin needle showing between the skin of Katie's hand and the handle. His sister's blood was all over the handle. The puncture wound in her hand had been torn during her struggles, and he couldn't find enough purchase on the slick handle to begin to pull. Hurry, Jack! Even in the few seconds he'd taken to kneel and work on the ice pick, the flames had ignited the ceiling and were spreading rapidly overhead. Jack curled the fingers of his left hand around the handle, and then reinforced them with his right, grasping the end of the handle and spike to find better leverage. He tugged once. The whole table moved. He put his foot and shoulder against the vertical tabletop and pulled. Still it didn't budge. Smoke was filling the room quickly, making it difficult to breathe even down at their level. I have to move it side to side, Jack wheezed. It'll hurt. A lot. Katie nodded. Jack braced himself again and pulled, simultaneously trying to move the handle back and forth. Katie screamed in agony when he slipped and bumped against her arm. Sorry. Clenching his teeth, he gripped it again, and with a supreme effort the spike began to budge, barely a fraction of a millimeter at first, but with each back-and-forth movement it became looser. They both coughed as soft ashes began to rain on them. It was only as he readied himself to give the loosened ice pick one last tug that he realized Katie had fainted and was slumped against the table, unmoving. Coughing, he gave an almighty jerk. The ice pick slipped out, surprisingly easily in the end, causing him to fall onto his backside. Cursing, he flung the pick across the room and knelt beside Katie. He knew he was too weak to pick her up and struggling to breathe. He put his hands under her arms and stood up, dragging Katie along the floor a few feet at a time. By the light of the blaze, he made his way to the doorway to the hall, pulling Katie through just as a sheet of blackened plaster fell to the floor, throwing up a shower of sparks and dust. The air was clearer in the hallway, the smoke still clinging to the ceiling, and Jack breathed more easily as he dragged his unconscious sister to the front door. He unlocked the door and pulled it open so hard it hit the plaster and bounced back into his shoulder. Ignoring the pain, he pushed it open again with his foot and pulled Katie out onto the porch, not stopping until he dragged her into the center of the front lawn, where he collapsed beside her, sucking deep lungs full of cold, clean air. Part 2. Out of the Frying Pan 22. Bumps and gentle movement woke Katie. She tried to keep her eyes closed, but when memories of Dawson, her abduction, and the subsequent horror crashed into her brain, she shot up to look at her surroundings. She immediately regretted the sudden movement. Her head pounded painfully, but it was a tickle compared to the screaming fire in her hand. You're awake, Jack grated, looking over his shoulder. Her brother looked how she felt. 
There were shadows under his bloodshot eyes, and the purple bruising on his neck was stark against his pale skin. Katie nursed her hand. It had been crudely bandaged, and a splotch of blood stained the white dressing. Jack began to slow the car. Where are we? We're on our way to the El Dorado Forest, he said, pulling to a complete standstill before getting out and coming around to her door. They were on a two-lane road bordered by thick forest. Cool air and the fresh smell of outdoors wafted into the car when he pulled the door open. Why didn't we go home? she asked as he gently took her bandaged hand and inspected it. What about Danny? Did you... I buried him before we left, next to Mom and Dad. Oh. Tears for Danny sprang to her eyes. Jack put his hand on her shoulder, and she put hers on his. They stayed like that for a minute. Then Jack went to the back and came back with a small bottle of water. Katie didn't realize how thirsty she was until she began to drink. She downed the bottle and asked if there was another. Jack nodded. He and Danny had found a full 24-pack of Deer Park half-liter bottles in one of the houses they'd raided. How do you feel? I have a really bad headache, she said. And my hand? Oh, my God. I wish I could cut it off. Yeah, it's really bad. Here, take these. He squeezed two white pills out of a foil pack of ibuprofen and handed them to her. You need to take it easy, Katie. I washed the wound, but it goes right through, and I don't know how much damage there is to nerves. We have to watch out for infection, too. She nodded and washed down the pills with a gulp of water. What's the plan? We're going to hide out in the El Dorado forest until we get a handle on what's happening. You don't think we should have stayed at home? No, he said. There's nothing there for us anymore. Plus, the Chinese will be sure to set up a base in Sacramento and start rounding people up. It's the capital of California, after all. Before we left this morning, I saw choppers in the distance, and there have been jets going overhead. She didn't argue with his logic. Are you okay? She asked, reaching up and gently touching his neck. Jack pulled away. I'm fine. My throat kills me, and I think I have bruised ribs. But I'm alive. Me too, thanks to you. I thought you'd gone. He told me... Katie broke into sobs. I'll never leave you, he said, allowing her to rest her forehead against him. We're in this together, and anyone who tries to get in the way of that will end up like that asshole Dawson. 23. Katie fell asleep not long after they began driving again, and when she awoke, the car was stationary. She looked around. The sun was going down, and they were parked in a roughly circular clearing with trees on all sides. She opened her door and got out of the car on shaky legs. The dirt road they traveled in on sliced its way back into the forest thirty yards behind the Mazda. Jack was nowhere to be seen. She called his name. There was no answer, and Katie's heart began to beat fast. She ran to the back of the car. The tailgate was up, and some of the items had been removed and placed on the ground. Hello, pretty, said a strange voice behind her. She jumped, whipping around with her hands raised in defense. There was no one there. Hello, pretty, the voice repeated. This time her eyes found the culprit. She lowered her hands and let out a long exhalation. Jesus, Katie. Get a grip, she murmured. Thirty feet away on the branch of a tree, staring right at her, was a big white bird with a bright yellow comb of feathers on its head. She recognized it as a cockatoo, and definitely not a native of the El Dorado forest. She took a step towards his tree, and he began preening his wing unconcernedly. Hello, pretty, she said. It looked at her, then went back to its preening as if it was the most pressing matter in the world. Katie smiled. You're a rude little thing, aren't you? Who are you talking to? Katie jumped again. She turned quickly to face her brother. He had emerged from the trees in front of the SUV and was carrying a tomahawk and some rope. Don't sneak up on me, Jack. Then more softly. I was talking to my new friend. 
Hello, pretty, said the cockatoo right on cue. What the hell? Jack laughed. Is that a parrot? I think it's a cockatoo, like from Australia or something. G'day, mate, said Jack, dropping his gear on the ground and joining Katie. The cockatoo, apparently even more disinterested now, began to peck at the bark of the branch it was sitting on. Katie's smile disappeared, the brief diversion giving way to the trauma of the last few days. What were you doing in the bushes? She asked Jack. I'll show you in a minute. First, we need to change your dressing. Come and sit down. He carefully unwrapped the bandaging on her hand and inspected it. It looked terrible, but he thought the overall swelling might have gone down a little. The wound on the back of her hand looked like a small volcano. The rim of the jagged circular sore was pink and puckered, but inside the opening her flesh glistened red. At least it had stopped bleeding. He turned her hand over. The wound on her palm was less ragged and more like a puncture. It had also not crusted over. Worryingly, it was weeping a translucent fluid and the skin around it was swollen. Can you wiggle your fingers? Katie pulled a pained face but managed to wiggle all of her fingers. That's good. Jack tore open one of the alcohol swabs he'd found in his mother's first aid kit. Katie flinched and tried to pull her hand back when he dabbed the back of her hand. The wound immediately began to bleed again. He persisted, holding her hand firmly. Sorry, he said. We have to clean it. I'm worried about it getting infected. It hurts so bad, said Katie, tears running down her cheeks. It'll get better, I promise. A few more days, it should be starting to heal. I can't tell for sure, but I think it went between the bones, and you can wiggle your fingers, so that means it probably didn't damage any nerves. He wrapped a fresh bandage around her hand and then stood up. We'll clean it again tomorrow, he said, then smiled. Come on, I'll show you what I was doing in the bushes. He put the first aid kit away and then led her through the trees about thirty yards before coming to another small clearing. In the center was a two-man tent and a small circular patch of ground that had been cleared and on which now stood a pyre of branches and sticks. Two camp chairs sat on either side of it. You made a camp? Geez, how long was I out? We got here three hours ago. Wow, okay. What now, then? Well, we sit tight, I guess. Wait for help. Something in his tone was off. You don't think help is coming, do you? Maybe, he shrugged. We don't know how bad things are, but I'm hopeful. Katie didn't push it, but nothing in the way he spoke gave her any reason to think he was genuinely convinced or even hopeful that help would come. Come on, then, she said, trying to sound upbeat. Let's start bringing our stuff in. No, you sit and rest. I'll do it. No, she said emphatically. I slept while you were doing all this. I'll be fine. She lasted exactly two trips to the car and back before she sat down, exhausted, her hand throbbing again. Jack gave her two more ibuprofen and a bottle of water before moving the rest of their gear. His last two trips were in the dark. After he was done, Jack lit the fire and cooked a pan of beans as Katie, now dressed comfortably in jeans and a sweater, sat quietly staring into the flames. They spoke less than a handful of words as they ate, Jack explaining they could only light the fire when it was dark. We don't want anyone to know we're here, not the Chinese or anyone else. Tomorrow I'll hide the car. Okay. So, if help doesn't come, Katie said in the dark, what are our long-term plans? We can't just camp out forever. Jack stared into the flames. He'd been thinking about that very subject. I don't know, he said honestly. I guess we play it by ear. 24. Katie awoke with a fever the next morning and didn't want to get out of her sleeping bag. Jack gave her the last two ibuprofen and a sip of water, but despite his pleading, she refused to let him change the dressing on her hand and rolled over to get more sleep. Even though he was worried, Jack didn't argue because he thought rest was perhaps the best thing for her. Two hours later, she woke up feeling a little better and this time let Jack tend to her wound. 
He unwrapped the bandages. The wound looked worse and smelled a little. There was a yellowish substance oozing from the sore on the back of her hand, and when he flipped it over, he saw a telltale line of pink traveling from the heel of her hand and halfway up the pale underside of her forearm. This was worst-case scenario. She had an infection and most likely blood poisoning. Katie saw the look on his face and asked what was wrong. This is bad. Like, really bad. I need to go and get you antibiotics and more ibuprofen. Can't you just clean it? She asked. No, it's too far gone. Well, you're not leaving me here. I'll come with you. No, it's too dangerous, Katie. Don't worry, I'll be quick. The last town was only thirty minutes back. I'll raid a pharmacy, get what we need, and come straight back. They argued about her coming while he cleaned and bandaged her hand again, but she eventually gave in, too exhausted to fight. Katie swayed as she stood up, and Jack put his hand out to steady her. When he felt her forehead, she was hot again. He gave her some more water and led her into the tent to lay down. You stay here and sleep. I'll be back by the time you wake up. Can't you take me with you? She said. I'll lay in the back. I won't be any trouble. No, Katie, we've been through this. You'll be safer here. She capitulated, and he turned to go. Back soon. Wait. Jack turned back, ready for another argument, but was surprised when Katie draped her arms around his shoulders and rested her head against his. I love you, Jack. Come back safe. Jack hugged her back. I will. Now lay down and sleep. After she was lying down, he draped the sleeping bag over her and went to the door. He looked back and saw that she had closed her eyes. He zipped up the tent and got moving. Leaving her behind was a decision he would regret for the rest of his life. 25. Katie dozed fitfully for a short time before waking up shivering. Well, it seemed like a short time. In truth, she had no way of knowing how long she'd been asleep or how long it had been since Jack had left. She pulled the sleeping bag up to her throat, but before long she was too hot. She threw off the sleeping bag, then unzipped and shrugged off her jeans, allowing the cool air to dry the fever sweat on her body. Within minutes she was shivering again. God, I can't take this. She crawled out of the tent and stumbled across to the fire, which Jack had restacked with fresh wood that morning. She pulled out the old newspaper he'd pinned under a rock and tore strips off it with trembling fingers, screwing them into balls and stuffing them haphazardly under the smaller twigs at the bottom of the pyre. She retrieved the matches from the pocket of the chair where she had seen Jack deposit them and lit the newspaper. It took more easily than she expected, and soon the twigs and leaves were ablaze, their flames licking the bigger sticks. Within three or so minutes, the fire was blazing. Katie huddled on one of the camp chairs as close to the fire as she dared. In her hot and cold, feverish misery, she was totally oblivious of the thin, gray column of smoke coiling into the blue Californian winter sky. The little town of Pollock Pines was as devoid of human life as the forest that overlooked it. Despite probably being the only soul there, Jack parked the Mazda on a small road behind the main street. No sense taking more risk than necessary. It had taken him just on thirty minutes to get there, and he was thankful that the winter, so far anyway, was milder than any he remembered. He found a drugstore in the small shopping center and broke in the back door. Amoxicillin was the only antibiotic he knew the name of, and he rifled through the shelves behind the counter until he found it, filling a small bag with all twenty packets. He knew he wouldn't need that many, but having some in reserve wouldn't hurt. Next, he swept a shelf full of generic ibuprofen into the bag. He grabbed some more items on the way out, including bandages and a bottle of vitamin C tablets. He headed back to the car via a different road and stopped as he was passing a sporting goods store. The barred windows were intact and a closed sign hung on the door. Despite this, the door stood ajar a few inches and he could see that the lock had been broken. The only weapon Jack carried now was his hunting knife. He had lost Danny's gun back in the escape from Dawson's and knew at some point in the future he would need a gun. He'd only been in the town ten minutes, so figured he had time to take a quick look to see what he could find. A few minutes wouldn't hurt. 
He pulled his knife out, stepped quietly up to the door, and peered in. It looked empty, and he couldn't hear anyone or anything moving around. He cautiously pushed the door inward an inch. From his vantage, he could see it wasn't a huge establishment and that the main part of the store was empty. Behind the counter, he could see another door. It was closed. He decided to go in. He pushed the door open slowly, anticipating the possibility of creaky hinges. He was totally unprepared for the loud chime of a bell above his head as the door triggered the old-fashioned shopkeeper's bell. Jack crouched, his heart beating painfully in his chest, and quickly closed the door, holding up his knife in case someone emerged from the door behind the counter. He split his attention between that door and the window back onto the street. He waited a full two minutes until he was satisfied he hadn't alerted anyone inside or out to his presence, then stood and crossed the room. He lifted the heavy timber flap on the counter and went through. The door wasn't locked, and he pulled it open to find a small storeroom lined with shelves of goods. At the back was a sink and another door that had John painted on it in big white letters. Don't mind if I do. Jack made quick use of the facilities before heading back out into the store. The guns were on the wall behind the counter. It wasn't a huge range, pretty much all hunting rifles, with a few different makes of shotgun. Disappointingly, there were no pistols. Jack selected a sleek black rifle called a Seiko Finlight 308. It was light and sturdy, the only one that had a scope already attached. He put it on the counter and grabbed three boxes of 308 cartridges for it. There were 20 rounds in each. He didn't bother with a shotgun, but thought he might pay another visit once Katie was better. He put the ammunition in the plastic pharmacy bag with the rest of his haul. The bag was heavy now, and the plastic of the handle began to give when he picked it up. He swore under his breath and placed it back on the counter. He didn't want to waste any more time looking for another bag, so tucked the rifle under one arm and braced the bottom of the bag with his forearm, holding the handle with the other. It was awkward, but it would do. He went back to the front door of the store and was about to pull it open when he heard the unmistakable sound of an engine approaching. Jack pulled back into the shadows and snuck a look through the window as the truck or whatever it was drew closer. It was coming quick, its occupants apparently in a hurry. A second later, a low and squat camouflaged vehicle sped by the store. He didn't get a long look at it, but long enough to know it looked like a Humvee but wasn't, and that the four men sitting in it were soldiers, but not American. Chinese characters printed in white on its side confirmed it. This was the first time he'd seen the invaders in person, and it left a bad taste in his mouth not to mention a knot of worry in his stomach. He knew he would need to take extra care on the way back to camp. It didn't bear thinking what would happen to Katie if he was killed or captured. He waited a full two minutes, and when there was no sign of any other vehicles, he made his exit, pulling the door closed with his elbow before running back to the Mazda. The sun was high in the sky as he drove out of Pollock Pines along the Lincoln Highway. This was the same way the enemy vehicle had headed, and he scanned the road ahead and behind as he drove. He noticed the smoke in the distance when he was about ten minutes from their camp, but preoccupied with watching for pursuit or threats ahead, it wasn't until he was much closer that he realized it was originating near their camp. Too near. Oh, fuck. Jack planted his foot on the gas. 26. Jack's worst fears were realized when he drove into the first clearing and saw the Chinese Hummer parked exactly where he'd parked the Mazda the day before. With a sinking feeling, he jumped out of the car and ran around to the passenger door, grabbing the rifle and a box of ammo. He ripped it open, dropping half of its contents on the ground as he stuffed his coat pockets. His hands were trembling as he popped out the magazine and began to fill it as he walked purposefully to the tree line. Even though he only passed it by two feet, he didn't notice the torn, bloody body of the white cockatoo in the long grass as he entered the forest. Jack slotted the magazine and put a round in the chamber before sliding the bolt home. He stayed low and trod carefully through the undergrowth as he neared their campsite. His worst fears were realized when he heard excited voices up ahead. They were speaking Chinese. He heard a round of raucous laughter followed by a cry of pain. It was Katie. Like molten lava, white-hot anger slowly engulfed the dread he'd been feeling. 
Jack crept forward a few more feet and slowly dropped into the long grass at the foot of a pine tree. He braced the rifle against his shoulder and looked through the scope, scanning the trunks and scrub until he had a line of sight into the clearing. He spied a male soldier. He was facing away from Jack, his body partially blocked from view by the trunk of a tree, and was looking down. To the left of this man, he spotted another soldier, this one laughing and holding his rifle on folded arms as he watched whatever was amusing the first man. Jack made sure there were no more men on that side, then scanned back to the right. He went too fast. Something caught his eye and he reversed. Between the tree, partially obscuring the first soldier and another, he zoomed in. Another soldier, this one with his pants down around his knees and his pale ass jiggling, yelled encouragement to someone in front of him. Through his legs, Jack saw another. This one was on the ground, wrestling his sister, tearing at her clothes as she screamed and weakly clawed at his face. A veil of red fell over Jack's vision. He settled further into the grass and raised his sight until the crosshairs were between the shoulders of the man with his pants down. Say good night, fucker. The report was loud and echoed through the trees. At first, he thought he'd missed. Then the bare-ass man jerked and fell to his knees, swaying for a moment before falling face first into the dirt behind Katie and her attacker. His comrades froze in surprise, giving Jack time to tug the bolt handle up and back. The spent case flipped from the port and landed beside him as he swung his gun back to the left and took aim at the furthest left of the soldiers, the one who just seconds ago had been laughing at their comrade attempting to rape Katie. This shot wasn't as good, but he hit his target in the shoulder, the force of the shot spitting the soldier 180 degrees. He fell to the ground screaming as the other one ducked completely behind the tree. Jack scanned the clearing, but he had lost sight of Katie and her attacker. He ejected the second shell as he scrambled back to his feet and began running southward in a zigzag pattern. Suddenly the forest was alive with whizzing and whining bullets as the soldiers began firing their automatic weapons blindly into the trees. Thankfully they were firing in the direction he'd shot from and not only were they wasting ammunition, the noise of their barrage was covering his movement. He crossed the path that he had beaten from the car to the tent the day before and kept moving until he was a quarter of the way around the circular clearing. The firing reduced, then rang out sporadically, the invaders clearly spooked by the unexpected attack. They yelled at each other, and even though he couldn't understand the words, it was obvious they were trying to work out if they'd hit the sniper or not. Jack approached from the south and got down onto his knees, crawling his way to the long grass at the southern edge of the clearing. By the time he stopped, he had an unrestricted view of the campsite. Katie was lying in the grass where the soldier had been attacking her. Her eyes were closed, but her chest was moving. He couldn't see any obvious wounds. Beyond Katie, her attacker was hiding behind the body of his dead buddy, using him as a shield from where Jack's shots had originated. The other soldier was still behind his tree, firing the occasional short burst of gunfire. The soldier Jack had hit in the shoulder was on the other side of the clearing, his eyes closed and moaning in agony. His gun lay a few feet away. Jack judged that the guy behind the tree was the biggest danger, and he decided to take him first. Knowing he would need to rush the clearing after the kill shot, Jack rose to his feet and carefully took aim. He held his breath and put pressure on the trigger as he waited for the man to fire into the forest again. That was when the wounded soldier on the other side of the clearing screamed a warning in Mandarin. 27. Preempted, Jack fired and hit his target in the back of the head. The man was propelled face first into the tree and then slid to the grass, lifeless. Jack sprinted into the clearing, pulling the bolt and trying to slam it home again as he ran. The rapist on the ground rolled over and fired, but his automatic weapon clicked harmlessly. He'd spent his ammo firing at a ghost. With a despairing yell, he scrambled across to Katie and put a knife to her throat. Jack skidded to a halt and aimed his rifle at the guy's face. Drop it, he yelled. No, you fucking drop it, asshole, or I kill your girlfriend. One move and she dead. Jack felt his guts turn to water. How could he get out of this without getting his sister killed? He looked at her. Her closed eyelids were a dark shade of purple and a sheen of perspiration coated her brow. 
No matter how this turned out, he was thankful she was unconscious. Sensing the tide had turned, the Chinese soldier ordered him to drop his gun again. Jack lowered the rifle. Please, I just want to help my sister. She's sick. Well, she's fucking dead if you don't drop that gun. One, two, wait, okay, okay. Jack lowered the gun all the way to the ground and left it there before rising with his hands up. Please, if you just let me take her, I'll go. You don't have to do anything. Even as the words tumbled from his mouth, Jack knew how hollow they sounded. He had no power here, and they both knew it. The soldier laughed. Sure, you don't have to worry. I'll look after her right after I kill you. He released Katie and rose to his feet, starting towards Jack with the long army-issued knife held out in front of him. Jack tensed for a fight and was as shocked as the soldier when Katie reared up and stabbed the man in the thigh with the long fork Jack had been using to stoke the fire the night before. The soldier shrieked and reflexively drove the knife into Katie's neck. No! Jack roared. The soldier grimaced and pulled the knife free in a spray of blood, then turned. Jack hit him before he could bring the knife up, and they tumbled to the ground. The enraged teenager began pounding the soldier with his fists, ignoring the flailing knife blade that bit into his shoulder and then his cheek before it slipped from the hands of his enemy. Jack punched wildly and didn't stop until long after the soldier had ceased moving, his face a bloody pulp. Jack climbed unsteadily to his feet, his raw, bloody hands by his side, and looked around. The soldier he had hit in the shoulder with his second shot was inching towards his weapon. He looked over his shoulder at Jack and yelled something panicked in his own language as he made a desperate lunge. Jack was on him in a flash, the knife the other man had used to kill Katie in his hand. Without ceremony, he grabbed the man's hair, ripped his head back, and drew the knife across his throat. A deep red curtain of blood signaled the end of the man's life. 28. Jack dropped the last shovelful of dirt on Katie's grave and patted it down with the flat of the wide blade. When he was satisfied, he stepped back and looked at the three mounds. Grass shoots had already begun to sprout in the earth of his parents' graves, and he knew by the end of the next summer all three would be hidden by long grass. He briefly wondered if he'd also be lying in a grave by then. Jack knew he had taken a risk by bringing Katie home, but he couldn't bear the thought of burying her alone in the woods. After he'd cried himself out, he had wrapped his sister's body in her sleeping bag and carried her to the parking area. He placed her gently in the back seat of the Chinese Hummer before locking it and heading back to camp. Once he'd bandaged his wounds, he collected the enemy's weapons and took them back to the Hummer, putting them in the cargo bay along with some more supplies from the camp. Jack then stripped the biggest of the dead men of his blue camouflage-patterned uniform and replaced his own clothes, keeping only his tan-colored hiking boots. The dead man's black boots were too small. His last task had been to drag the dead soldiers into the blackened circle of the extinguished fire and pile them unceremoniously into a bloody heap, covering them with branches, leaves, and other kindling. Accelerated by a half gallon of gasoline, the pyre of flesh and wood dwarfed the previous fire and sent an oily black tower of smoke into the sky. Jack ripped the radio out of the enemy vehicle before heading out. He had been traveling for thirty minutes before he passed several speeding Chinese patrols heading the way he'd come from, no doubt they were investigating the smoke or the missing unit, but none turned to investigate the single Chinese-marked vehicle headed west. Just outside Sacramento, an armored personnel carrier and two of the Chinese Hummers were parked on the side of the road just outside Rosemont. The soldiers were apparently enjoying a cigarette and poring over a map. He'd been ready to steer the vehicle into them if they raised their weapons, but all he got was a bored wave. He realized that even though it had been an afterthought, 
Putting on the helmet and sunglasses he had found on the front seat had probably saved his bacon. Standing in his backyard after burying the final member of his family, a prayer didn't seem appropriate, but he said one anyway. It was for them, not to make himself feel better. The memory of blackened and burning skin of Katie's murderers in the fire was the only salve his soul needed right now. He headed back inside a half hour after burying his old life. There was an emptiness inside him. No grief. No tears. The events of the past week had stripped away everything. Katie's death had been a tipping point. Behind the emptiness, though, was a simmering rage. It was in the background, like the flickering flame of a furnace after it has been ignited, but before the operator has opened the gas full throttle. It was fueled by anger at the invaders, but also at himself. It was his fault, after all. After promising he'd never leave her alone again, he had. If only he'd taken her with him, none of this would have happened. He wasn't sure why she'd started the fire, but guessed she'd been delirious or confused with fever or something. The fact was, she shouldn't have been there alone. What was there to live for now? As he sat in the rapidly darkening kitchen of his empty home, Jack Monahan decided he wouldn't live. But he wouldn't just lie down and slit his wrists like a coward. He would open the gas of that rage furnace and take as many of the bastards with him as he could. But first, sleep. 29. When Jack woke up in the living room, it was still dark, and he had no way of telling the actual time, but estimated it was around 5 a.m. Sleeping longer was not an option. He was wide awake. He went out to the Chinese Hummer, which he remembered now was called a Mong Shi. National Geographic Channel had come in handy for something. He parked it in the garage and put a tarpaulin over it. From the supplies he had grabbed from the camp, he pulled out a box of cornflakes and some long-life milk and headed back inside to prepare his last meal in the home he had grown up in. Perhaps his last meal ever. He started on the first bowl and found he was ravenous. He ate another two full bowls before he was finally satisfied. Before he'd finished the third bowl, he decided he would drive to the city center to see if it had been occupied and make his last stand, fulfilling his promise to take as many as he could with him. It was still dark when he left twenty minutes later. Jack didn't look back at his home, even though he knew he'd never return. He did look at the blackened ruin of Dawson's house, though. Its look now matched the soul of its former owner. The route into the city would take him past his old high school. He thought nothing of that until he was perhaps a half mile away. The school was lit up like a Christmas tree. Curious as to why there would be power at his school, Jack slowed the truck and pulled up down a side street. He grabbed one of the assault rifles he'd commandeered along with a spare clip of ammo. He'd tested the weapon before he'd torched the pyre back at the campsite and had worked out how to use it on full auto. He was grateful that he'd been given a more than rudimentary knowledge of firearms, courtesy of the gun club. It was a light weapon, but had some kick to it, and he'd struggled to keep it on target at first. Two emptied clips later, though, and he thought he had a handle on it. Jack put the strap over his shoulder and slipped the hunting knife into his belt. Despite the first tendrils of dawn only just touching the sky in the east, the helmet and sunglasses went on. He headed out to Maple Street. He stuck to the shadows in the front yards of the homes lining the road opposite the school. He stopped at one of the houses directly opposite, positioning himself on a porch behind an overgrown oleander bush. From there, he had a complete view of the school. New chain-link fencing topped with barbed wire had been placed around the large parking lot, and portable floodlights set up along the perimeter. They illuminated the grounds as bright as day. Big canvas buildings had been constructed in this fenced square barracks? Jack spotted two soldiers patrolling the perimeter with a couple more closer to the four long khaki green buildings. Jack wondered if they housed more soldiers, but decided the enclosure seemed designed to keep something in rather than out. A splash of light fell over him and he ducked back down into the shadows as a packed yellow school bus drove by his hiding spot 
before turning into the entrance of the school. Taking advantage of the remaining darkness, Jack sprinted across two more yards until he had a better view. By the time he settled, the bus parked next to another in the staff parking lot by the main building, and the passengers were being unloaded by more armed soldiers that had emerged from the school's reception building. The passengers were kids. Mostly teenagers, but he saw some that certainly couldn't have been older than ten. The soldiers were anything but gentle, and Jack bristled when he saw one boy of about fourteen clubbed with the stock of a rifle after he said something to one of the soldiers. The low flame of his anger blossomed into white hot anger when a girl who went to help the kid was pushed to the ground and kicked in the stomach several times before being dragged away. Screams of shock and distress rang through the early morning quiet, but were quickly suppressed by threats from the soldiers. Jack knew right away he had found the location of his last stand. Over the next few hours, he watched and took notes on a scrap of paper with a pencil he found in the pocket of the stolen uniform. The children from the bus were led into the main building and came out thirty minutes later, each now wearing a khaki green uniform that consisted of ill-fitting pants and a shirt that buttoned up to the neck. Both boys and girls had their hair shorn to the skin. They were led into the enclosure containing the canvas buildings and organized into two lines. The children had to stand there in the cold as the soldiers stood around talking. At what Jack estimated was about 7.30 a.m., soldiers escorted two green-clad kids from the office building down the path and into the enclosure, a boy and a girl, each pushing a trolley with a large tub on top. A whistle sounded, and suddenly more kids came rushing out of the canvas structures to line up with the newcomers. Each carried a silver bowl in one hand and a spoon in the other. The girl with the trolley picked up bowls and spoons from a box on the end of her trolley and started handing them out to the newcomers. Do not lose your bowl or spoon, or you will not eat. Understand? yelled the soldier who appeared to be overseeing the operation. Once this was done, he screamed another order, and one by one the children came forward and had a large spoonful of slop ladled into their bowls before moving off and finding a place to sit on the ground to hungrily wolf down their breakfast. Jack busily wrote, At any one time there were two guards patrolling outside the perimeter of the fence. There were four inside the square guarding the children at close quarters. He hadn't seen the other two initially as they were behind the buildings when he arrived. There were another four to eight that were stationed inside the main building of the school. He watched the whole day. After breakfast, the kids were separated into four groups and made to stand for an hour before Jack finally saw a movement at the main entrance. A woman, small in stature but wearing what could almost be considered a dress uniform, walked down and met two of the male soldiers who followed her through the gates. She was clearly in charge. The armed soldiers deferred to her, and the children all bowed their heads. Jack wondered if it was out of fear or respect. He soon had his answer. The woman shouted a few words, and the children started running on the spot. She yelled again, and suddenly the children were on the cold asphalt doing push-ups. This went on for a while, each call triggering a different exercise until finally, after another grueling set of push-ups, a skinny boy of about ten with bright red hair was unable to get back to his feet. He was from the original group. Jack's jaw tightened as he saw the woman walk down the road to where the kid lay on his stomach. The children around him drew back from their comrade. Jack suddenly wished he'd brought his scoped rifle. As it was... He was helpless to do anything but watch as the short-haired woman stopped over the poor kid. Very deliberately, she pulled a pair of black leather gloves from her jacket pocket and slipped them on before holding out her hand. A soldier rushed over and handed her something. Jack saw it was a short riding crop or something similar. She slapped it on her gloved palm. Get up, the Chinese woman yelled in unaccented English. The kid moaned that he couldn't. I'll count to three. If you don't get up, you will be sorry. Jack willed him to do it, and the kid tried, but his wobbly arms collapsed before he made it to his knees. Pick him up, said the woman, clearly putting on a show for the new arrivals. 
Two soldiers ran in and picked up the poor kid and pulled him roughly to his feet to face the woman. His head lolled on his neck as he tried to focus on her. Turn him around and lift up his shirt. Jack made himself watch the beating. It was short but vicious, and the kid passed out before it was over. This seemed to annoy the woman, and she whipped him viciously with five more strokes while he was slumped, unconscious, in the arms of her guards. After it was done, the kid was carried out of the enclosure into the main building. Within minutes, the disturbance was forgotten. The woman made the children run on the spot for another five minutes before blowing her whistle. Better, she called, loud enough for Jack to hear. Now you will go out and earn your keep for new China. Make two rows. Their unseen watcher was curious about this new development. Exactly how were they to earn their keep? He had his answer in a few minutes. The children were loaded onto two buses, carrying shovels and picks doled out to them by guards. Then with three guards and a driver in each bus, headed out of the school and turned right, headed into the Sacramento CBD. Jack waited a few minutes. The female commandant watched the buses go, then, seemingly satisfied, headed back inside with two soldiers. Jack got the feeling this was a new operation and also suspected it would grow, especially given that even with the new busload of kids, they only had enough prisoners to fill one of the four barracks. Careful not to be seen by the two perimeter guards, he snuck down the side of the house he'd been watching from and made his way over the back fence and then, yard by yard, until he reached the truck. He judged it was worth the risk to try and follow the buses to find out exactly what they were up to with these kids. 30. Jack passed a vehicle identical to his not long after he set out, but that was the only contact he had with the enemy as he followed N Street into the downtown district. He'd always thought the naming of Sacramento streets after letters of the alphabet was dumb, and had wondered aloud in class once how unimaginative the city planners must have been. It was one of the few times his English teacher, Mr. Brock, had agreed with him. Dumb street names aside, it appeared the invaders did indeed have a presence in Sacramento, but at this stage, it wasn't large enough for him to consider it occupied territory. He felt more relaxed, but was wondering how far the buses were going, and what he would do if he lost them when he rounded a bend only to find one of them parked smack bang in the middle of his lane. His heart rate spiked as the eyes of the armed guards fell on him. They didn't react, though. The vehicle and the uniform were familiar to them, and the helmet and sunglasses hid his Caucasian features. He forced himself to remain calm and slowed down as he moved to the other lane. He looked around in what he hoped wasn't too obvious a manner. Some of the children were in a park opposite a tall apartment building, digging with the tools they had been provided with, and both they and the guards watching over them wore surgical masks as they worked. To his right, two boys came out of the apartment building and dumped a body into a large wheelbarrow before one of them lifted the handles and began to wheel it across the road to the park. Jack passed and looked to his rearview mirror. Another kid with an empty barrow came from the parkside and crossed in the same spot. Jack's mouth shrunk into a grim line, and he drove for two blocks before turning right and circling back the way he had come on a parallel street. He didn't know where the other bus was, but he didn't need to. It was obvious that the children had been organized into work gangs, work gangs to clear the corpses of their own people. He felt sick, sick and angry. He headed back via a less used route and parked in the street behind the row of houses that faced the school. He ate some peanuts and crackers and washed them down with a warm can of Coke before climbing into the back seat of the vehicle. It was only midday or so, but he hadn't slept well the night before and thought a few hours of shut-eye might help him clear his head and formulate a plan. He awoke hours later as the sun was sinking low in the afternoon sky. He hadn't meant to sleep that long, but knew he wouldn't have unless he needed it. He ate again, this time a can of cold, gelatinous chicken soup. It was horrible, but there was no way he could risk a fire to heat it up. He worked at the problem of the encampment as he ate. 
He obviously couldn't just assault them head on. He might manage to kill one or two before he was shot, but that wouldn't help the kids that were imprisoned. No, he had two options. Try and infiltrate at night with a handful of weapons he could pass on to the kids to help him in the fight, or wait until the buses went out the next day, leaving a handful of guards in the office building. He could attack them, and if he survived, then try and surprise the guards on the buses when they came back. He knew there wasn't a chance he would come out of either scenario alive. But then that was part of the plan, wasn't it? Jack grabbed his Seiko Finlight when he was finished eating and made his way furtively to the front porch he had surveilled from that morning. He had barely settled in when the two buses returned. He unclipped his scope and used it to observe the children being herded from the buses. They looked exhausted as they were led back into the enclosure and made to line up. Movement caught Jack's eye, and he looked back towards the front of the office building. Like clockwork, the same two kids who had dished up the slops this morning wheeled out their trolleys, escorted by two soldiers. The cold chicken soup he'd eaten from the can sat heavily in his stomach as he watched the kids attack the steaming bowls with vigor, wolfing down what appeared to be some sort of rice stew. At least you're eating better than me tonight. There was no time to sit and digest their meals afterwards, though. Before the last kid had finished their meal, they were ordered to their feet and herded back into the barracks. Within a few minutes, the only children left in the compound were the two who had done the serving. They busied themselves collecting the bowls and mugs and scooping leftovers back into the tubs under the watchful eyes of the guards. Jack waited until they were done, and the compound was empty, except for the four regular guards. He really felt for the kids in the camp. Their life consisted of sleep, nightmarish work, and some exercise in the morning. No amount of hot soup compensated for that. He decided conclusively that he would make his move after the buses left. It was his best chance to make a difference. He replaced the scope and went back to the car under the cover of darkness. After eating a chocolate bar, he crawled into his sleeping bag on the back seat of the Chinese Hummer and set about formulating a step-by-step -step plan for the next day. Surprisingly, given his long nap in the afternoon, he fell asleep soon after. The routine the next morning was identical, except for the fact that no new buses arrived. The kids in the barracks were roused before dawn and brought out into the compound where they had their breakfast. This time, they only stood for thirty minutes after breakfast before the commandant came out and led them in exercises. There was no cruel singling out of a child this time. Through his scope, Jack tried to find the kid with the red hair who had been beaten yesterday. He was nowhere to be seen. The children finished their routine with five minutes of on-the-spot running before the woman gave them the same crappy pep talk. Jack's adrenaline began to flow as the kids were loaded onto the buses. Not long now. The same as yesterday, within ten minutes of the buses leaving, only the two perimeter guards remained. Their victory was so complete, the Chinese army didn't seem concerned about attack at all. All the manpower in this encampment seemed to be focused on keeping the children in, rather than defending from attack. He had timed the perimeter guards the day before. In roughly six minutes, they would be out of each other's sight for around twelve minutes as one circled behind the school to the road parallel to this one. Jack headed down the side of the house and through the backyards the same way he had yesterday. He got into the truck and drove it south along back roads and then crossed over the main road, well clear of the school, before turning left onto the residential street that bordered the rear of the school. He parked the Mongxi in a small cross street and got out carrying only his black-bladed knife and a fully loaded automatic over his shoulder. He ran as fast as he could towards the school, and in the distance, he saw the first guard disappear around the far corner of the school and knew he had at least five minutes to get in place and await the arrival of the second soldier. He slotted in behind a thick bush that backed onto the fence at the rear of the school. This part of the fence was behind a row of classrooms, so he was in little danger of being spotted from that side. Squatting low and peering through the thinner branches on the underside of the bush, he saw the soldier turn onto the sidewalk fifty yards away and begin heading his way. As stealthily as he could, he pulled the strap of the automatic over his shoulder, placed it on the grass, and pulled out his knife. He rose to a crouch, 
ready to spring his deadly trap as the soldier went by. It was then he heard the subdued singing. It could only be the soldier. His face turned a shade paler. The voice was beautiful, melodic, and female. 31. A girl. How had he missed that? More importantly, with her only a few feet away, how was he going to deal with it? Frantically, he formulated a new plan, then counted down as her footsteps approached. Maybe the song came to a natural end, or she sensed something amiss. Either way, as she passed the bush, she stopped singing. Jack made his move. He burst out of the bushes and grabbed the slightly built soldier, clamping his hand over her mouth and putting the knife against her throat. Don't move, or I'll cut your throat. She froze, limp against his body, and for a second or two he thought he was in control. The sharp elbow to his ribs disabused him of that idea, and the soldier immediately tried to twist out of his grip and bring her weapon up. He struggled to keep a grip on her. Even though she was small, she was wiry and strong. Stop struggling, he said, and pressed the knife harder to her throat. He received another elbow to the ribs, and then she bit his hand. Fuck, he grunted, just managing to keep his hand over her mouth before shifting his knife arm and locking it around her throat. He squeezed and dragged her to the ground. Her struggles continued. It was like trying to hold an armful of snakes, and when his hand slipped from her mouth, she yelled something in her native tongue before he managed to clamp it back in place. That's when he felt the sharp sting in his side. Then another. Her arm jerked and he realized what was happening. She was stabbing him. Jack rolled over onto her, using his greater weight to crush her knife hand under her body. He pulled the arm locked around her throat backwards. She got her hand free again and tried to get the knife free. Please, just fucking stop! Jack jerked his arm to try and cut off her air, but the angle of her neck was awkward, and a horrible muffled crack silenced her abruptly. Oh, shit, no! Jack rolled off the petite woman and climbed to his knees, panting, and patted her cheek. Sorry, he moaned. I didn't mean to. Shit, why did you have to fight so hard? I had a knife at your throat. A sightless stare into the sky was the only answer Jack got. Still kneeling, he shook his head, then closed her eyes with the heel of his hand before standing up. He had only a few minutes to make his move. He dragged her body behind the bush before pausing to check his wounds. She hadn't been able to get a good swing at him, and the cuts were only shallow. They were bleeding, but the material of the uniform was soaking it up. There was no blood anywhere on the ground that he could see. Jack took one final look at the girl he'd killed and shook his head before turning and sprinting along the road towards the rear entrance of the school. It was completely out of sight of the main building, and the only danger of being spotted was from the other soldier patrolling the perimeter. He figured he had at least another eight minutes before that guard turned onto this road, though. At the rear entrance, Jack weighed up whether to climb or try and squeeze between the chain-link gates that were secured by a chain and padlock. The gates were slightly bent out of shape, and it looked like a vehicle had backed into them. He tested by pushing them inward and found the gap was around nine inches. He decided to squeeze through, climbing would only aggravate the cuts inflicted by the dead soldier. He slipped his knife and the automatic through the gap, then commenced his contortionist act. It took him a good four minutes and a few more nicks and cuts before he got through. At one point, he even thought he was stuck and would be at the mercy of the soldier, who was sure to be turning onto the road any minute. He made it through with a final supreme effort and then checked he hadn't left any blood behind on the pavement. He spotted two small streaks, which he quickly covered with a handful of dirt before sprinting for the school gymnasium. 32. Jack paused behind the gym, then furtively made his way past the rear of the A and B classroom blocks. Apart from the administration building and the compound that had been constructed on the parking lot, the invaders did not seem to be interested in the rest of the school, and he came across no evidence of them until he was in view of the big red brick admin building. Peering from the shadows, he spotted a bored-looking guard posted at the front entrance. That was okay. He didn't intend knocking politely on the front door. By his estimation, there would be only two or three more soldiers and the camp commandant inside the building. If he could get in quietly, he was hopeful he could take them by surprise and get at least one before they killed him. 
The soldier guarding the front was facing the compound, so there was no risk of him being seen as he ran quickly across the space separating Block A from the administration block. The windows on the rear side of the building were head high, so he crouched and ran along the wall until he found what he was looking for, a small window at ground level. He knew it belonged to the small storeroom where the shooter's club stored their Browning BT-99s and other equipment. Jack squatted at the window and looked through the grimy glass. It was dark inside, but he could make out enough to see that it hadn't been disturbed by the new owners. As luck would have it, the basement was at the bottom of a flight of steps. At the top of the steps was a solid door that led into a storage room at the end of the long main corridor. The other end of the corridor opened into the main reception. He didn't know exactly where the enemy had based themselves, but he figured it would be near the large staff room and offices in the center of the building on the other side of the reception. He judged he could afford to make some noise by breaking the glass of the small window. He wrapped his hand with the sleeve of the uniform and smashed the glass with the heel of his hand. The sound of the glass falling inside was muted, as he expected, and he immediately began clearing the jagged shards away from the frame with the handle of his knife. When he was satisfied that he wouldn't cut his skin to ribbons climbing through, he threw the automatic weapon down into the room and got down on his hands and knees. He backed up, feet first to the window, and put his feet through before lowering himself. It was a bit of a drop, but he managed to land without breaking his ankle or any other disastrous complication. Jack took stock of his progress. He knew he was on a suicide mission. Counting the perimeter guard, the one stationed out front, and the minimum of three inside, there were at least five highly trained soldiers he would have to go through. Only the element of surprise and a lot of luck would see him survive the next ten minutes. He knew he had the element of surprise, but whether he could count on luck, only time would tell. Jack Monahan, former student, picked up the Chinese assault rifle and switched it to full auto before heading for the door. 33. Jack climbed the steps as silently as possible. There was no light from the crack underneath it, which meant its door was also closed. He opened the adjoining door and went through. The only light in the shelf-lined room came from under the door that opened onto the corridor. That light probably meant the door at the other end of the corridor was also open. If it was, anyone looking into the corridor from the reception area would see him when he pulled this door open. He raised the gun, holding it one-handed like a pistol, and slowly pulled the door open. The door into the reception was open, but only a crack of a few inches. With his heart beating fast, he emerged from the storeroom and padded the length of the corridor, praying that none of the rooms on either side were occupied. He paused in the shadow behind the open door and listened. He heard nothing but the hum of low but distant conversation. He got down on his hands and knees, the shallow wounds inflicted by the female soldiers stinging in protest, and peered underneath the door into the reception area. There was a cool breeze on his face, but he could see no booted feet in the vicinity. Jack stood up and put his hand on the door handle before easing it open. Luck was on his side. The door was as silent as death as he opened it enough to see around. The reception was empty. The front doors were open, which explained the cold breeze he'd felt on his face. He didn't spend too much time pondering why they had left the doors open, only that he had a full view of the back of the soldier on the front steps. The soldier was bobbing his head up and down, and it took a moment for Jack to realize that he had headphones in his ears. Resigned to dying in a bloody firefight, Jack understood immediately that he would never have a better opportunity to pick off one of them quickly and silently. He pulled out his hunting knife and opened the door wide enough to go through. The hinges made a faint creak, but not enough for the soldier to hear over whatever he was playing in his ears. Opposite Jack's door were two more, both closed. The one on the right was the door to the principal's office, the one on the left a staff room. There was a good chance that the Commandant and the other soldiers were in one or both rooms. All the more reason to be nice and quiet. With his automatic weapon slung over his shoulder and his knife held out in front of him, Jack began to quietly cross the polished timber floorboards towards the open entrance. One of the boards creaked. He held his breath and stopped in his tracks. Neither of the doors flew open, 
and the head-bopping soldier did not flinch. On he went. He allowed himself to breathe again when he stepped off the interior flooring onto the concrete porch. The soldier was close enough for him to hear Taylor Swift singing her vengeful Look What You Made Me Do through his headphones. How appropriate. A vision of the soldier back at camp stabbing Katie in the neck ran through his mind. With his mouth grim, Jack stepped up to the soldier and gripped his head, pulling it back, exposing his throat to the wicked black blade. The soldier's hand scrabbled first at Jack's hand and then his throat as he tried to stem the tide of blood that spurted into the cold air. Jack held him until the pulsing fountain subsided, then let him drop. The body slipped down two steps before coming to a rest, the soldier's pale, surprised face reflected in a scarlet mirror of his own blood. The memory of his sister's death still stoking his furnace of anger, and now imbued with bloodlust, Jack wiped his bloody blade on the soldier's uniform before pulling the strap of his automatic weapon over his shoulder and heading back inside. He stopped at the first door, the staff room. Jack kicked the door just under the handle with his boot. He was already squeezing the trigger as it flew open. The three men inside had no chance. They were sitting around a table in the warmth of the closed room, one with his back to the door and the other two to the side. They'd been playing cards, and a haze of tobacco smoke hung over them like a poison cloud. He mowed them down, one after the other, stepping into the room to ensure he got them at close range before they had a chance to reach for their weapons. When the job was done, he stopped shooting and replaced the ammo clip while he inspected the bloody, ragged bodies. He had only just slammed it home and turned to head back out when a sudden cracking sound from the wall to the principal's office sent him diving to the floor. With the acrid smell of cordite and spilled blood mingling to assault his nose, he quickly realized that whoever was in the principal's office was shooting blindly through the wall. As if to emphasize the point, a bullet punched through the wall and whizzed by his ear. Jack crawled for the doorway, and when he reached the threshold, he stood up beside the doorframe and ducked his head around the corner. The door to the principal's office was still closed. He took a second to think about his next move. If he burst through the office door, the shooter would turn him into Swiss cheese. He had to play it smart. Deciding a course of action, he flipped the fire mode selector switch from full auto to three-shot burst and turned to face the common wall. He fired twice, sending two volleys into the wall. The return fire was heavy. Dusts flew as splinters of timber and plaster flew in all directions. Jack darted out into the reception and stopped, poised outside the door to the principal's office. When the gunman stopped firing, Jack burst through the door, hoping against hope that he caught the shooter mid-reload. 34. The sight that greeted him was unexpected, to say the least. The shooter was a naked soldier wearing only boots, and behind him crouched the naked camp commandant. The terrified soldier swung around, still mid-reload, as the woman screamed angrily in Mandarin. Jack fired and the man's chest exploded. He flew backwards over the desk, knocking over the office chair and landing heavily behind it. He didn't get back up. The woman fell to her knees and immediately put her hands up as Jack swung his gun back to her. Don't shoot! Please! Don't shoot! I'm unarmed! Jack, despite himself, blushed. He'd never been in the presence of a naked woman, and with her cowering and vulnerable, the bloodlust that had powered him just moments before faded. Now he felt like nothing more than a bully. Jack thought furiously. This wasn't a part of his plan, but now that he was faced with a defenseless woman, he couldn't just shoot her in cold blood. He pointed the muzzle of his gun at the pile of clothes on the floor next to the desk. Put some clothes on. The woman clasped her hands together. Thank you, sir. Please don't shoot me. I won't shoot you, he said roughly. Just put something on. Nodding, she stood up and padded to the clothes on the floor. Jack partially turned away to give her some semblance of privacy. He hadn't contemplated taking a prisoner and wondered what the hell he would do with her. He couldn't shoot an unarmed woman. He was still pondering the problem when he heard a yell from the front entrance of the building followed quickly by pounding footsteps. The last perimeter guard. He glanced at the woman. She had her underpants and bra back on and was just pulling on one leg of her pants. In a split second, Jack judged it safe to turn and face the intruder. He swung back around to the door just as the soldier skidded into the doorway. 
The enemy soldier jerked like a puppet on the strings of a crazed marionette as the bullets thudded into him. The soldier fired, too, his bullets splintering the doorframe and thudding harmlessly into the ceiling before he fell to the floor, unmoving. Jack felt a cold ring of steel pushed against the back of his neck before he had a chance to turn away. Drop your weapon, you little asshole. Jack's hands were trembling, not with fear, but with the adrenaline in his system. It felt like his body had been on high alert for hours, and the pent-up fight-or-flight response suddenly manifested itself in a strange way. He giggled. Somehow, the idea of this woman, who barely came up to his shoulder, calling him little, seemed like the funniest thing in the world. The woman nudged the gun harder against the vertebrae in his neck. I said drop it! Her steely voice had a confused tone to it. Jack laughed harder and almost fell as he bent over and placed his weapon on the floor. The mirth really got a hold of him now, and he couldn't stop. He put his hands over his belly as peals of uncontrollable laughter racked his body. What are you laughing at? screamed the woman. Jack took a long breath as she pulled the weapon away and grabbed his shoulder, swinging him around to face her with surprising strength. Looking down at her angry face set Jack off again, and he pointed at her, guffawing. The woman, her pants now on but still shirtless, turned beet red and pointed her pistol at his face. Jack held up one hand, the other still holding his aching belly. She yelled at him again, so worked up that she slipped into her own language. <laughs> I'm, I'm sorry. Jack got out. It's just that, just that you called me little. <laughs> his laughter slowly subsided as the reality of his situation sank in. This wasn't supposed to be how it worked out. He was supposed to be dead or victorious, no in-between. Still pointing the pistol at him, she sneered in disgust. Her whole office had been wiped out by a chuckling moron. Put your hands on your head and turn around, she said in a cold voice. Now, outside. We'll see how you like being naked and on your knees. Your dead body will be a nice reminder about behaving to the prisoners. Jack knew he should end it now. She had the upper hand. All he had to do was turn around and try to grab her gun. He'd fail, and she'd end it the way he knew it would end all along, with a bullet to the head. If there was some chance, though, some small chance, she poked the gun into the small of his back. Move! Jack allowed himself to be herded out of the office. He stepped over the body of the recently deceased perimeter guard and headed for the door. Easy, big boy. Jack slowed careful not to get too far ahead. He needed her nice and close. His heartbeat sped up as he approached the large entrance. He couldn't let her take him outside. He slowed his pace and was rewarded with a sharp rap of the gun barrel to his neck. Good. As they passed the threshold of the door opening, he would make his move. Three paces. Two paces. One pace. Jack took a deep breath and stopped in the large doorframe. When the inevitable poke from the gun came, he pushed backwards off his feet as hard as he could, flinging the back of his head like a wrecking ball at his unseen captor. The crack of the gunshot ruptured his left eardrum. That wasn't the worst of it. 35. Jennifer and Robert Cousins, who happened to really be cousins by birth, listened to the firefight from their cell. The room had been an office in its past life and had been converted into a sparse cell with two cots, a bucket for a toilet, and bars on the only window. The door to the room was one of those that Jack had passed in the corridor barely five minutes before. It had been their home for two weeks, and the only times they'd been allowed outside its four walls was to prepare meals and deliver them to the kids in the barracks. It was tough, but whenever Jen was feeling blue, Robert told her again that they had it better than the kids in the road gangs. They had looked at each other with concern when the first shots rang out. Robert had peered through the grimy window but could see nothing from the rear-facing glass. It didn't matter. The shots sounded like they were coming from the lobby anyway. What do you think is happening? asked Jen, her eyes big. Is it the army? I mean, our army? Robert sat down on his cot his face drawn. I don't think so. I mean, it 
Can't be. I have no idea who else it might be, though. Sixteen-year-old Robert had gleaned enough from their captors to know that help from the U.S. government was not coming. It was gone. Of that there was no doubt. What then? Rebels? Infighting between the Chinese? Another burst of gunfire, this time closer. Quick, grab your mattress and drag it over here, said Robert, standing up and flipping his bed onto its side. He helped drag Jennifer's into place beside it, and they knelt behind the perceived safety of the two mattresses. Keep your head down. If we hear anyone at the door, duck down as low as you can. He knew the inadequate barrier wouldn't stop bullets, but it was all they had. There was more gunfire, and not long after they heard an angry voice they knew only too well. Senior Field Officer Chu, the commandant of the camp. Jennifer gripped her cousin's hand. That angry voice and the lack of any more shooting seemed to indicate the commandant had been victorious. That wasn't necessarily a good thing. A couple of minutes later, a single shot rang out, causing them to jump. It was the last. Silence ensued. An hour after the last shot, Robert got up and went to the door. He placed his ear against it and strained to hear anything he could. There was nothing. Outside the door it was deathly silent, and he couldn't hear anything further afield. Normally there would be something. Doors slamming, conversation, sometimes even music. Can you hear anything? He looked back to see his cousin's freckled face looking out from the upturned beds expectantly. No. I think I should yell out. They would normally have come and got us by now to start cooking the evening meal anyway, right? The look on her face said she didn't quite agree with his suggested course of action, but nodded anyway. Robert banged on the door. Hello? Is anybody going to let us out? Bang, bang, bang. Hello? After five minutes of intermittent banging and shouting, he put his ear to the door one last time. The door handle rattled unexpectedly, and he jumped away with his hand over his heart. The rattle was followed by a thud. The door shook in its frame. Robert retreated to the barrier with his cousin. Who is it? He called out, embarrassed at the shrillness in his voice. The handle rattled in answer, and Jennifer's hand gripped his forearm hard enough to leave white indentations in his skin. That rattle was followed by another thud, except this one sounded more like someone falling on the floor than someone trying to break in. Robert crept back to the door and got down on his hands and knees to peer through the gap under the door. It was too small to make out much, but he could see enough to make out a dark shape on the floor. Someone's lying on the floor said Robert, turning to his cousin. We need to break out. I think someone attacked the Chinese. This might be our only chance to escape. Jennifer looked excited and petrified at the same time, but came out from behind the makeshift barricade. How? Robert inspected the door. It opened into the room, so they wouldn't be able to bash their way out. The stops on the door jam would make it a difficult job. The doorknob itself had a simple key lock, and it appeared to be quite flimsy, but five inches above it was a newly added deadbolt. That would also be hard, but bashing it to oblivion would be their best bet. They had already rummaged through the room for anything they could use to escape in the early days of their captivity, so when Robert's eyes fell on the upturned cot and realized the outer frame was made of L-shaped lengths of steel, his eyes lit up. Luckily, the four spans of steel were bolted and not welded. It took some doing, but he managed to loosen one of the nuts at the foot of the bed enough to twist the frame until the bolt snapped. From there, it was an easy task to do the same with the other corner. He took the short length of metal to the door and began to hammer at the deadbolt. Sparks flew, but not much else happened until he misdirected a hit and punched the end of the shaft through the facade of the door. It was then he realized that it was one of those cheap hollow core doors that his grandfather, a master carpenter, used to hate. For Robert, it was happy days. He began to knock the end of the metal through the shell of the door until he'd created enough of a mess around the deadbolt that he was able to get the shaft behind it and lever it free of the strike plate with a decent jerk. The doorknob only lasted two strong blows before it clattered to the floor. He gripped the door by the two ragged holes and with two sharp tugs pulled it open, almost falling on his ass when it came free. Robert regained his balance and Jennifer joined him. On the floor in front of them was a teenager wearing a blood-soaked Chinese army uniform, 
with a bleeding wound on his neck and blood dribbling from his ear. On the floor near his outstretched fingers was a pistol. Part 3. School's Out 36. Jen, turn one of the cots over, said Robert, kneeling beside the injured, possibly dead kid. First things first. He reached for the weapon, half expecting the teenager's hand to close over it at any second. It didn't. The barrel of the gun was still warm. Robert tucked it gingerly into the waistband of his jeans, then checked for a pulse. It was strong and regular. Next, he leaned over to inspect the wound on the side of the stranger's neck. On closer examination, he realized it had been made by a bullet. The deep furrow was about an inch long and looked like it had missed anything vital. It was still bleeding, but not badly. Pass me that towel, Jen. Normally, Jen would have scolded him for not saying please, but in the circumstances, she barely noticed. She handed him the one threadbare towel their captors had allowed them, and he bunched it up before pressing it to the open wound. Let's put him on the cot. He's so heavy, said Jennifer, struggling to hold up the stranger's legs. When they finally placed him on it, she covered him with a blanket and looked at Robert. What now? I guess we see if we can find a first aid kit. His pulse is strong, so maybe he's just passed out from shock or something. What about the guards? To be honest, if they let him get this far without coming for him, I don't think there are any left. You stay here. I'll go and look. No way. We're sticking together. Robert opened his mouth to argue, but closed it just as quickly when he saw the determination on her face. He nodded. Come on, then. Robert took the pistol out. Jen's eyes widened, but she didn't say anything. Robert had no experience with guns, not even to check if it was still loaded, but certainly knew how to pull a trigger. He just hoped it didn't have a safety or whatever they called those things you had to click to shoot. If they ran across someone hostile, he would just have to squeeze the trigger and hope for the best. In the corridor, Robert was careful to keep Jen behind him. They slowly crept along the wall. In the distance, where the hallway opened into the foyer of the main building, Robert spied the broken body of a Chinese soldier. He didn't try to protect his cousin from the gory sight. They had both seen enough death and violence recently to have become hardened to it. The foyer was a mess. Bullet holes, splintered wood, blood. That was nothing compared to the carnage they could see through the doors to the two rooms their captors had used as their own. At the door to the reception, Robert looked around. He wasn't concerned with the ordinary soldiers he saw lying in pools of their own blood. What he was interested in was the body of Senior Field Officer Chu. It was lying in the entrance to the building. He decided to check if she was really dead. The camp leader had been a cruel mistress. The now healed whip marks on his back from their first night proved that. With his heart beating fast and Jennifer gripping his arm just a little tighter, they approached. The cruel woman was on her back, with her eyes closed. She wore pants and boots, but only a bra besides. Her eyes were swollen, and there was a bloody gash across the bridge of her nose. It was bent at a nasty angle. Is she alive? whispered Jen. He didn't answer. There were no obvious wounds, but the woman's chest wasn't moving. Robert knew to be sure he had to check her pulse. He knelt beside her and cautiously reached out. His fingers touched her skin, and her eyes snapped open. Robert scrambled back in fright as Jen shrieked in terror. Chu rolled over and got to her knees. With her hair disheveled and blood coating her nose, mouth, and chin, she looked for all the world like a character from a bad horror movie. Robert suddenly remembered he held a pistol and pointed it at her chest with a trembling hand as she struggled to her feet, pulling a hidden knife from her boot as she did. Don't move! She paid no heed to the gun, simply held up the knife and took another step. Where is he? Tell me and I won't gut you like a fish. Robert and Jen took a step back. Stop and drop the knife or I'll shoot, Robert threatened. Chu sped up a gob of blood on the floor and took another step forward. Go on then. Another step. Shoot her, Robert. Robert pulled the trigger. Nothing. No click. No shot. Just a hard nothing. The woman laughed and raised her knife as she ran at him. 37. Get down, roared a voice from behind them. 
Robert, already in the process of moving to push Jen out of the way, tackled her to the floor just before the air above them was stitched by hot metal. The burst of shooting was short, and when it was done, Robert looked back at the camp leader. She was on her back, staring at the ceiling with glassy eyes as wisps of smoke coiled up from the wounds in her stomach and chest. Jen poked him in the shoulder, drawing his attention away from their dead captor and tormentor. Robert climbed to his feet and helped Jen up without taking their eyes off the now conscious kid who had just saved them. He was watching them warily as he swayed, holding the automatic weapon he'd picked up from the dead soldier in front of Chu's office. Thanks, said Robert, opening the dialogue. The other guy nodded. Sorry, I should have finished her before, but I heard you calling for help. He bent his knees to put the weapon on the floor and promptly fell to his backside. Jen rushed over to him before Robert could stop her. Where's the towel? You need to be lying down. The stranger waved vaguely down the hall. Robert, go get it, please, and water. Slightly put out at being ordered around by his younger cousin, Robert nevertheless did as he was asked. My name's Jen, she was saying when he returned. What's yours? Huh? said Jack pointing at his bleeding ear. Sorry, I think my eardrum is busted. Jen leaned around to speak in his good ear. I said, my name's Jen. What's yours? Oh, it's Jack. Robert returned and handed Jen the towel. Her patient winced when she put the towel against his neck. Robert poured water from the pitcher he'd carried from their cell into a plastic cup and offered it to Jack. He took it and guzzled it down. Thanks. It's Robert. Thanks, Robert. Jack pointed at the discarded pistol on the floor between them and the body of senior field officer Chu and smiled. You know, those work better if you flick the safety. Robert grinned sheepishly. Yeah, I'm not really good with guns. They talked while Jennifer held the towel against Jack's neck. He told them how he had come to be there, leaving out some of the more painful parts of his story. What about you two? We're cousins. Jen lives with me and my... lived with me and my mom. He looked like he might cry, but then held it together. Jack noticed a tear in Jennifer's eye. She died the day after Christmas. We lived in Greenhaven. Jack had heard of Greenhaven. The suburb wasn't much of a drive from his own. By the time they'd talked about the invasion and the things they'd experienced, Jack's wound had stopped bleeding. I think it started the clot. We should bandage you up, said Jen. Jack nodded, then tensed. Wait, what time is it? Maybe 11 a.m., answered Robert. Why? Jack relaxed, then looked at him with fierce eyes. Because we have to set a trap. What? Jack climbed to his feet, keeping the towel over his neck. A trap for the rest of the camp soldiers when they come back. Robert raised his eyebrow. He hadn't really thought ahead, but taking on the guards was not at all on his radar. In fact, now that they were talking about plans, he thought the best course of action would be to take Jen and get away clean. No, I don't think that's a good idea. I think we should escape now. What? Jack's face was incredulous. Well, I, you know, it's just that we should run now while we have the chance. We can't, Robert, said Jen. It wouldn't be fair to the other kids. Who knows what would happen to them after all this? Jen, we've talked about this, about Texas. Yeah, but that was before Jack came in and went all Terminator. Jack smiled, not displeased at the reference. What about Texas? he asked. Not yet, said Jen. We'll tell you while I'm patching you up. Robert dragged the dead naked soldier behind the desk before Jen went in and located a first aid kit in the commandant's office. She had Jack sit on the desk while she stood and tended to his wound. So, what about Texas? asked Jack, wincing as the girl dabbed alcohol swabs on his neck. We heard the commandant talking on her phone, said Robert, not sure why she was speaking in English or who she was speaking to. But I heard something about rebels in Texas, north of Houston. We had an idea that if we escaped, we would head there. Dude, you know that's like 2,000 miles, right? I'm not an idiot, he said. I worked out it would take us like 
two months. Yep, through deserts and shit. There's no way. Robert looked at the floor, his face dark. What about a plane or a helicopter? said Jen as she stuck a large adhesive patch over Jack's bullet grace. As they continued their discussion, she also tended to the shallow stab wounds he'd suffered in the struggle with the female perimeter guard, sterilizing and then taping them. Robert guffawed. <laughs> you going to fly it then, Jen? His cousin reddened, but Jack looked thoughtful. You know what? That's not a bad idea. Oh, right, said Robert, standing up and throwing his arms in the air. I suppose you have a pilot's license now? Jack laughed. No, but I remember near the zoo, there's an airport that a company used to run joy flights to Sacramento from. We took my grandparents there. We'd need a pilot, though. Probably have to kidnap one. Once this mess is found, said Jen, won't they be on high alert? Good point. He thought on it a bit longer. We'd be better to steal one of the vehicles and travel as far by road as we could before trying. Why not forgo the whole kidnapping helicopter thing and go the whole way in a vehicle, then? Asked Robert, reasonably. I don't think we'd make it all the way, said Jack. He wasn't sure why he'd been so easily convinced to go to Texas. But Robert was right. Kidnapping a pilot and stealing a helicopter seemed ridiculous when he heard it put that way. I guess we could start out that way and see what happens. Robert nodded, happy that Jack had finally given one of his ideas some merit. We'll need to dress in Chinese uniforms if we're going to make it further than a block. See if you can find some clean ones while I gather up some weapons. So we'll leave as soon as we're ready? Asked Robert. No, after I show you how to use an automatic and we ambush the guards. Here's what we'll do. 38. As the buses turned into the school parking lot, Lieutenant Zhu Wang, his assault rifle hanging over his shoulder, headed to the front of the bus, gripping seat backs for balance as he went. Oblivious to the children in his charge, he was dying for a cigarette and hoped to get a few puffs in before Iron Pants Chu came out. The first through the door, he yelled at the children to stay put before jumping out. Chan and Lu followed him off, and the driver stayed in his seat with the engine running. The other bus pulled up behind, and the two soldiers on that bus joined their three comrades. Wang offered his girlfriend and fellow lieutenant, the very lovely Eva Howe, a cigarette. She looked nervously at the front door of the office building. Come on, Wang insisted. Iron Pass has been taking her own sweet time lately, probably in there poking Vincent again. The men laughed. Eva Howe just shook her head. I'll just have a puff of yours. Wang handed over his camel and watched rapt as her pretty lips closed over it. The look in her eyes was anything but innocent as she took a deep drag and touched her tongue on the butt before handing it back. Wang felt his manhood twitch in response. God, he loved this girl. Where the fuck are the home gods? said Chen, his chubby face annoyed. I need a piss. His attention diverted from Eva, Wang looked back at the building. It was unusual for the guards to take this long to come out and take charge of the brats. Maybe old Iron Pants is having a fuck party. This drew snickers from his comrades. Come on, Chen, we'll put a rocket up the asses. Wang handed Eva his smoke and raised his eyebrow cockily before heading for the closed door. Smiling, she shook her head and took a final drag before dropping it to the ground and stamping it out. She had barely looked back up when gunfire shattered the quiet afternoon. Eva saw a tall man firing from behind a dumpster in front of the first bus. Zhu Wang and Chen didn't stand a chance. They jerked crazily as the bullets tore into their backs. Eva screamed in horror and took a shocked step towards the broken body of her beloved as the soldiers around her began pulling their guns and firing. The shooter disappeared back behind the dumpster. Gunfire erupted from a window above her and mowed down the soldier beside her. Eva ducked, glancing up and recognizing the kitchen boy immediately. What the... More gunfire sounded near the buses, but Eva was preoccupied with the kitchen boy who had just aimed the muzzle of his gun at her. She turned and ran, unslinging her gun as she raced for the door of the second bus. They needed to get out of the school grounds until she knew what they were facing. She flinched as a burst of fire from the front of the first bus took down the last of her comrades. She ran on, waiting for bullets to rip into her. Twenty feet. 
fifteen feet, ten feet. The bus door closed. No! The bus began to reverse, but a short burst of gunfire peppered the windshield with bullet holes. The driver slumped over his steering wheel, and the bus's backward motion began to slow. Eva skidded to a halt and looked frantically for cover. Drop your weapon, yelled someone in English. She was distracted by movement from the building's entrance. The door was pulled open, and the kitchen boy, Robert, stepped out, aiming his gun at her again. Done running, she turned her assault rifle toward him, her finger poised over the trigger. Two things happened to stop her. The rolling bus banged into a low brick wall to her right, and a voice, now very close behind her, shouted, Drop it! 39. Eva put one hand in the air as she bent over and put her weapon on the pavement with the other. She saw the female kitchen hand bob up in the window her kitchen maid had fired from, then disappear just as quickly. The man behind her stepped around her, his weapon trained on her. Except he wasn't a man. He was a boy. The same boy who had shot her love in the back. There was blood all over him, and he had a bandage on his neck. Clearly he'd been through a fight. He kicked her weapon away and then patted her down. Over his shoulder, she saw kids pouring out of the first bus and realized that driver had also been incapacitated. The cook arrived, and the other boy ordered him to watch over her. Everybody out, Jack yelled. The doors of the second bus hissed open, and excited kids piled out. Jack herded them close to the other bus, almost overwhelmed by their questions. Jen emerged from the admin building and ran over to join him. Everyone quiet. I'll answer all your questions, I promise. For now, go back to your barracks and rest. We'll bring you food and water soon. There was some argument at this, but a tall boy took charge and, along with Jen, led them back to the barracks without further drama. Inside, ordered Jack when he returned. They led her inside and tied her wrists behind her back with a zip tie before sitting her down on a chair in the foyer. She avoided looking at her dead commander. Are you sure it was a good idea not to kill her? Robert asked. Yes, if we're going to make it to Texas, it will be valuable to have a hostage, especially one who can speak Mandarin. I don't know. Texas, you stupid kids won't make it to the next suburb, spat the prisoner. Oh, good, you speak English, said Jack. You may be right, maybe we won't, but we haven't got anything to lose. Well, I'm not helping you. Robert looked at him with an I told you so face. Well, if you don't want to end up like her, he said, pointing to the dead commandant, you will. This time Eva did look. While she had no great fondness for senior field officer Chu or what they were doing to the American children, the sight of Chu's dead and staring eyes brought tears to her eyes. Not for Chu, though. I promise you, Chu, I will kill this boy for what he did to you. Aware only of the sadness on her face, Jack's expression softened. Look, I won't kill you, and if you come with us quietly, we'll let you go when it's safe to do so. She closed her eyes as if she didn't want to hear his voice. Jack shrugged and secured it to the chair by tying a rope around her waist and then under the seat. If she tried to get up, she wouldn't make it far. Okay, we need to get these kids fed, he said to Robert and Jen. I want to be on our way by nightfall. Jack had taken a handful of ibuprofens to ease the pain in his ear and neck and rested while Robert and Jennifer dished up what would be their last such meal to the captive children. He thought back, sometimes with disbelief, over the events of the day. While he hadn't come out unscathed, his solitary assault on the undermanned compound had worked out far better than he could have dreamed. Then, after his crash course on handling and firing the assault rifle, Robert had ably assisted him and finished the job. He knew he wouldn't have been able to do it alone. Now, including his earlier kills in the day, fourteen of the enemy were dead and one was a prisoner. There were no wounded or dead amongst the kids. Given that he'd half expected Robert might accidentally shoot himself, it was a miracle. The plan now was to take the prisoner with Robert and Jen when he left. He didn't really know how that would pan out. Robert still seemed to view him with some resentment, even though Jen had accepted him, 
and taking a prisoner would present its own issues. He started to second-guess himself. Maybe it would be better to just leave and go back to his original plan of hiding out in the El Dorado forest. Of course, that would mean shooting the prisoner, as there would be no need to take her. Almost as if she sensed his doubts, Jen came over with a steaming bowl of noodles. Thanks. Jack hadn't realized how hungry he was until he smelled the delicious food and began to woof it down despite its heat. Wow, this is good. I've been eating cold soup out of a tin. She crinkled her nose as she sat down next to him. You deserve a treat for saving our asses. He waved away the compliment. You guys did your fair share. Robert did, but only because you trained him how to fire those guns. He noticed she was holding her hand awkwardly. What's wrong? She showed him her wrist, which had a livid red mark on it. Burnt myself on the cooker. Jack winced. You should bathe it in cold water. I did, don't worry. I put some ointment I found in the first aid kit on it, too. Good thinking, said Jack, attacking his noodles again. You're still taking us with you, right? He paused, perhaps a little too long. Please, we won't be any trouble. And don't you think we have more chance if we stick together? Jack didn't think that at all. He was pretty sure he could sneak back to the El Dorado forest and live alone and quite comfortably for a long time. Still, he had vowed he wouldn't do that. Maybe his best chance of taking further revenge on the invaders was to head to Texas and join with a larger force. The thought of being with other people for a while also appealed to him. The singular quest for revenge didn't seem quite so urgent with others to worry about. Sure, I'm not going anywhere without you guys. Besides, Robert needs more shooting practice. The pretty thirteen-year-old laughed and stood up. Well, great. I'll just help Robert finish up. Then we can get loaded up. Jack watched her go, suddenly feeling a weight of responsibility that he hadn't felt since his sister had died. Was that a good thing? Time would tell. Forty. They loaded up the Chinese Humvee with an assault rifle each, along with one spare and enough ammo to start a war. Jack also took the pistol and, of course, still had his knife. They let the other children take the rest of the guns and ammo that Jack had stacked in the school entrance. While they worked, a couple of the older kids, two girls and a guy his age and one boy a year younger, had taken charge of the remaining children and started working on their own exit strategy. Jack told them about the El Dorado Forest and pointed it out on a map they found hanging in the Commandant's office. They all agreed it seemed like a good place to get lost. While Robert and Jen were inside picking up last-minute supplies, the four older teens piled all the kids onto the bus with the undamaged windshield. He had shot the first driver through the side window, and it had been easy enough to kick the remains of the glass out so the damage would only be evident on close inspection. Jack looked in at the kids when they'd finished loading. Some were on the floor and squashed three to a seat. It would be an uncomfortable ride for them, but nothing worse than the hardship they'd been through since the invasion. Who wants these? he asked, holding out the keys to the vehicle he'd driven from the forest. The oldest girl, she was tall with an interesting rather than pretty face, put her hand out and he dropped them into her palm, and he gave them directions where to find it. If you travel with the Chinese vehicle in front, you'll raise less suspicion. With a bit of luck, you might even make it without getting stopped. What will you do if you are stopped? Pray and shoot, said the girl with a crooked smile. Not necessarily in that order. Jack smiled, thinking if he'd met her in another setting, they might have become fast friends. Okay, good luck. You too. A few minutes and a lot of bunny hops later, the bus, driven by the oldest boy, made a wide circle and jerked its way out of the school. He saw the girl with the interesting face at the driver's shoulder yelling instructions. Despite the circumstances and the fact that those kids faced an uncertain future, he couldn't help but smile. Within the hour, as the last of the sun was fading from the sky, they loaded the prisoner into the back seat of one of the three army vehicles in the lot. It was identical to the one he'd been driving, but with a full tank of fuel. Robert, now wearing a Chinese uniform as well, slipped in beside her and Jack handed him the pistol, making a point to show him and the prisoner that the safety was off. Keep that on her. If she moves, 
Shoot her in the head. Robert nodded. Jack didn't think she'd be any trouble. Not yet, at least. In fact, the woman looked thoroughly depressed, which he supposed in the circumstances was understandable. Jen climbed into the front passenger seat and put on her seatbelt. She also wore a uniform that was about three sizes too big for her. All set? He asked them. There was an enthusiastic yes from each of the cousins and a sullen face from their prisoner. Jack started the engine and headed out of the school. 41. They had passed by the airport soon after leaving the school and found it was alive with light and movement. It became evident that the Chinese had set up base and were operating out of there. On the road, they saw several vehicles like theirs, plus larger troop carriers. They drew no attention to themselves, but Jack was on edge until they passed by Elk Grove on the 99 20 minutes later. Given that nearly every movie he'd seen about a post-apocalyptic event always had choked highways showing people trying to escape the city, he was surprised they didn't pass more abandoned cars than they did on the arterial road. You wouldn't think anything was wrong if you just woke up today and went for a ride, said Robert. Yeah, I guess the sickness can find people to their homes pretty quick. Jack knew this for a fact and felt a pang of sadness as his thoughts went to his own parents' quick submission to the disease. It did, said Jen in a soft voice. Grandma got sick Christmas night and was dead by morning. Jack glanced at her and saw her eyes shiny with tears. He reached over and squeezed her hand. I'm going to switch on the headlights, he said, hoping to distract her. Do you think that's a good idea? said Robert over Jack's shoulder. I do. I figure any army vehicle with lights on driving boldly down the highway will raise less suspicion than one with the lights off. Fair call. We'll drive until we get to Fresno. Then we'll find a side street to sleep for the night. It will be about two hours, I think. No traffic. I need to pee, said the prisoner ten minutes later. Jack rolled his eyes. No, not yet. Please, I'm serious. I will wet myself if I don't go. Twenty minutes. If you can't hold on until then, then too bad. Jack supposed he could have pulled over to let her go when she asked, but it seemed too much like he would be letting her call the shots if he gave in to the demand so easily. True to his word, though, he pulled over when they passed Stockton on a flat piece of road between towns. He wasn't too bothered she would run. It was pretty much cleared land in every direction. They would easily catch her. Jack, Robert, and Jen all got out, too. Jack opened the door for the prisoner. Don't try anything, okay? There's a bush over there. She nodded and swung her legs out of the car and stood up, stretching the kinks out of her back before looking up at him. Well, hurry up. She turned her back to him, bent over, and waggled her fingers. Are you going to pull my pants down for me? Oh, Jack mumbled, his face reddening. He was rescued when Jen stepped forward. I'll help you, she said, taking the woman's upper arm. Be careful, said Robert. Call out if she tries anything. Jen waved, then marched the woman away from the vehicle and disappeared behind the bushes. Jack heard them speaking in the dead silence. Well, actually, he heard a lot of Jen's voice and some quieter answers he couldn't quite make out from the soldier. When they returned, Jen was smiling. All done. This is Eva, by the way. Now we don't have to call her Hey You all the way to Texas. Jack laughed despite himself. The younger girl really had some sass. Nice work. You two watch Eva while I go, then you can go, Robert. Five minutes later, they were on their way. The occupants of the vehicle were quiet most of the way to Fresno. Jen tried some small talk with Eva after their apparent breakthrough, but the Chinese woman didn't seem quite so forthcoming with Jack and Robert in the car. Jack took a turn off the 99 into Fresno, and they drove for a few blocks, turning down roads and cross streets until they came to a stadium. The sign announced it to be Chukchansi Park, and Fresno Fire Department was right across the street. Unlike Sacramento, Fresno appeared to be completely abandoned. They had seen no one on the drive into town, and there was zero sign of the occupying forces. Even so, Jack thought it was better not to take chances by parking on the street, and when Jen pointed out the open gates in the fire department's parking lot, he drove straight in. He turned into the second row and rolled along until he found a space between two FFD-marked SUVs. 
it was plenty dark when he turned off the headlights. Jack and Robert broke into the fire station building and took turns going to the station house bathroom. Jan again took charge of Eva, nodding patiently at Robert's repeated warning to be careful. While the girls were in the bathroom, Jack and Robert broke into the vending machines. The candy machine gave up its contents more easily than the drink machine, but within ten minutes they had a pile of candy and warm soda on a table in the station house dining room. Eva turned her nose up at everything but a Pepsi, which Jen held to her mouth so she could drink. But the rest of them weren't so fussy and hungrily ate chocolate, peanuts, and chips. Oh, my God, we'll be so high on sugar we won't be able to sleep, said Jen, sitting back in her chair and holding her stomach. I don't think that'll be a problem, said Jack, yawning. But yeah, we better try and have a more nutritious breakfast. Robert belched, belatedly putting a hand over his mouth. Eva looked away stonily into the distance. The other three looked at each other and cracked up in mirth when Jen pulled a face at the soldier's prudishness. Should we sleep in here? asked Jen. No, I don't think so. Jack didn't really have a good reason for this, other than the vehicle felt safer somehow, not to mention they'd be primed for a quick getaway should anything happen. Jen insisted they tidy up, and after that they headed back out to the Hummer. Jack cut Eva's zip ties. She whispered a thank you as she rubbed the feeling back into them. He felt a little guilty at having pulled it so tight. It must have been hellishly uncomfortable to ride with them behind her back like that. Sorry, I'll tie them in front for tonight. But any trouble, and it'll be behind your back again. She nodded. He put a new tie on her wrists in front this time and a little looser, then settled her back into her seat. This time he climbed in back next to her while Robert took the driver's seat. They locked the doors and settled into sleep. Jack wasn't worried about going to sleep with Eva next to him. He had the gun in his hands and was a light sleeper. He was confident if she made a move it would wake him. The thought had barely formed itself before he fell asleep. He wasn't sure how long it was before he awoke, but it was still dark and extremely cold in the car. He was busting to take a leak. He glanced at Eva. She was out of it her head resting against the door, and both Robert and Jen were snoring the same soft snore in front. He smiled. Must be a family snore. As he sat there contemplating whether it was safe to leave them alone with Eva, a realization dawned on him. For the first time since Katie's death, he didn't feel alone, and his death wish had faded from the forefront of his mind. He really liked Jen. She was quirky and fearless and now even her slightly neurotic and overprotective older cousin, Robert, was growing on him. The only dark cloud on his horizon was Eva and deciding what to do with her when the time came. That was something he could worry about in the days to come, though, and now he had two people to share the burden with. Unable to ignore his full bladder any longer, he opened the door and got out. He clasped his hands together and stretched his arms into the air to work the kinks out of his back. He was stunned when he felt something pressed hard against the back of his head. It was accompanied by a voice barely above a whisper that he caught in his good ear. Oh, you in trouble now, boy. 42. Jack recognized the accent was American and that it almost certainly belonged to someone his age or younger. He opened his mouth to tell his assailant not to shoot, when automatic gunfire shattered the silence of the night. Robert! His barrage was answered by the firework-like cracks of handguns being fired from the other side of the parking lot. Jack instinctively dropped, the gun of his assailant firing where his head had been a split second before. Before he hit the ground, he swiveled and swung his still-joined hands around, striking the side of his attacker's right leg just above the knee. He was rewarded with a grunt as the gun wielder collapsed. Jack was on him immediately. He grabbed the kid's gun hand before he could turn it on him again, and they wrestled for control as the gunfight that had been initiated by Robert continued. Above Jack, a side window of the FFD SUV exploded, showering glass on them. He barely noticed. The kid under him was wiry and fighting hard. Jack's superior weight and strength began to tell, and he was able to slowly twist the barrel of the heavy pistol until it was under the kid's chin. His finger closed over the trigger finger of the boy's. The kid's eyes widened, not only at his predicament. It was only then he realized the kid had probably thought he was sneaking up on a Chinese soldier. The surprise turned to defiance quickly, the look on the kid's face almost daring him to pull the trigger. There was a hiatus in the automatic gunfire. 
Stop firing, Robert! Jack yelled. Jack, we're under attack! Another volley of pistol shots whizzed overhead, and then a voice Jack didn't recognize called out. Jimmy, where you at, man? The kid under Jack twitched his head in that direction, and he knew right away it was Jimmy under him. Jimmy, call out you're okay and to stop shooting, Jack grated. Jimmy looked like he might argue, but was convinced when Jack pushed the gun a little deeper into the soft flesh under his chin. I won't hurt you. Jimmy weighed up his options and then nodded. Hector, you can stop shooting. They're American. Jimmy, is that you? Of course it's me. You sure about this, man? Why are they trying to drill us if they're American? Jimmy rolled his eyes. Because we ambushed them, you big dumbass. Quit shooting. Jack swallowed a nervous giggle he felt bubbling in response to the comical dialogue. He understood things were still balanced on a razor's edge. Let go of the gun and we'll stand up, Jack said. I'm not going to shoot you. How do I know that, man? Really? The reality that he would have been dead already if the big white boy had wanted it cut through Jimmy's adrenaline-hyped brain and he gave a short nod before relaxing his grip and allowing Jack to take it. Okay, good. Come on. Jack got up and put out his hand. Jimmy ignored it and got up under his own steam. He teetered when he put weight on the leg Jack had struck and this time allowed the bigger boy to steady him when Jack put out his forearm. Jack tucked the pistol into the back of his uniform pants. Okay, tell your guys to come out, but with their guns down. Hector, Donnie, all of you come out. Don't shoot or I'll kick your asses, called Jimmy, propping himself against the Chinese vehicle. The front door to the Hummer opened, and a blonde girl in a comically oversized Chinese Army uniform got out. Hey, Jimmy, she said as if she'd known him for years, then looked up at Jack. Um, we have a problem. Eva's gone. 43. As if he couldn't quite believe it, Jack leaned over and looked through the open door. The seat was empty. An unscathed Robert looked over his shoulder at him from the front seat. She was there a few minutes ago, I swear. Jack stood up and slapped the roof of the Bangshi in frustration. He didn't have too much time to think about it as Jimmy's gang converged on them. You'd better get out, Jack said to Robert, and leave the gun on the seat. Hi, I'm Jen, the girl said to each and every one of Jimmy's gang as they emerged from the dark. Jack shook his head at her perpetual friendliness. I can't believe no one got hit, Robert said when they had assembled, and it was evident no one had been shot. That's what happens when a bunch of kids have a shootout in the dark, Jen said sagely. This time Jack also detected an element of contempt to her tone. Did anyone see a Chinese girl get out of this truck? Jack asked when all the introductions had been made. None of the ambushers had. Jen? Sorry, I had my head between my knees when Robert started shooting everywhere. Who is she? Jimmy asked. A soldier we took prisoner back in Sacramento. We need to find her. Her hands were tied, but she's made a run for it during all the excitement. Jimmy's eyes lit up at the prospect of hunting for an enemy soldier. We can help. Let's find this bitch. She isn't a bitch, actually, said Jen crankily. She's pretty nice when you get to know her. I hardly think taking her to the bathroom is getting to know her, said Robert. She would cut our throats in a heartbeat. Jen opened her mouth to argue. He's right, Jen. She can't be trusted. We have to find her before she raises the alarm. Within a few minutes, they had raided the station house for flashlights and began conducting a search for the missing prisoner. They scoured the parking lot, the streets surrounding the fire station, and inside the stadium itself. An hour later, they reconvened in the parking lot. No sign of her, said Jack. Any of you? Jimmy and his crew shook their heads. Jack nodded grimly. That means she's on the run and will keep going until she can alert her people. We have to get moving. Jimmy, you and your people should probably think about finding another part of Fresno to make your home. No way, man. This is our territory. If those bitches come calling, we'll be giving them a true Sereno's welcome. There was a chorus of agreement from his homies, and they bumped fists. What if they bring tanks and helicopters? said the ever-practical Jen. Jimmy shrugged, still looking tough. We'll see what we see. It's like 2 a.m. in the morning, 
said Robert to Jen and Jack. We should probably sleep before we drive again. After all we've survived so far, I'd prefer not to die in a car crash. Jack, who was tired and frustrated at having lost the prisoner, bit back a sarcastic response. He saw the sense to the suggestion. In the car? asked Jen. No, Jimmy answered before anyone else. You come back to our place and sleep in on a mattress. We'll even feed you breakfast. It's only a block away. Jack was reluctant, but saw from the looks on Robert and Jen's faces he would have a fight on his hands if he refused the gracious offer of the kid he'd so nearly killed and been killed by just an hour before. Okay. As they walked out of the parking lot, none of them noticed the dark shape watching them from the rooftop of the firehouse. Lieutenant Eva Howe of the People's Liberation Army watched the American brats the whole time they searched for her. It had been easy to slip away when the idiot in the front seat began firing his weapon. Once she was safely away from the vehicle, she had quickly rid herself of the tie around her wrists by using the edge of the low brick wall to wear at the nylon until it snapped. Thank goodness the tall, dangerous one, the bastard who had killed her beloved, had decided to secure her hands in front. She would make him pay for his sloppiness. When they vacated the parking lot, Eva stood and slipped over the edge of the single-story rooftop, dropping to the ground silently. Part of her army training had incorporated Wing Chun, a martial art that favored skill and economy of movement over size and strength. She had taken to it like a baby to mother's milk, and its aspect of stealth would serve her well tonight. She padded silently after the Americans. This is nice, said Jen. Her appraisal of the gang's hideout was generous in Jack's opinion. They were living in an old boxing gym, and the building stank like old sweat and liniment cream. It was spacious, though. From the door on the street, they had gone up one flight of stairs and through a door that opened into the massive room. There were two boxing rings on each side of the long space. In an open area near the far wall were weights and exercise equipment. The floor space down the center between the rings was covered with sleeping bags, air mattresses, and an assortment of blankets and pillows. A girl had been waiting for them when they arrived. Her name was Selma, and after Jimmy had briefed her on what had gone down, she asked a bunch of questions. Oh, well, she's long gone now. Did you guys want something to eat or drink? We have plenty, as long as you like eating out of a can. No, thanks, said Jack. We ate before we bedded down in the truck for the night. Okay, well, you all looked beat. Did you want to pick a bed? Jack took a quick look through the windows at the street outside as the others settled in to sleep. The light of the waning moon was enough to see that the street was as empty as he supposed much of the city was. God only knew how far Eva had gotten already. They would definitely have to make a move and get out of Fresno first thing in the morning. He lay down on the air mattress next to Robert and pulled the too short blanket up to his chin. It was as comfortable a bed as he'd had since sleeping on the sofa the last night at his family home. Someone extinguished the candle that was the only source of light in the cavernous room. In only a few minutes, Jack fell into a deep, dreamless sleep. Eva had easily tracked the kids back to a dilapidated gray building a few blocks from the fire station. They were noisy and careless. Ten minutes after they entered the building, she sat down on the porch of the vacant store across the road and waited. The candlelight in the second-story window told her exactly where they were, and she waited patiently for a full hour after its light was extinguished before standing up and crossing the street. She bent over and pulled the short-bladed knife that had been secreted in her right boot the whole time before taking them off along with her army-issue shirt. She folded the shirt neatly and placed it on top of the boots just inside the opening of an alley that ran down the side of the building. With the knife between her teeth and wearing only her socks, pants, and the black tank top that had been under her shirt, she followed the alley to the rusting fire escape. To anyone looking into the alley by the pale light of the quarter moon, they would have barely seen a shadow as she climbed the staircase silently. Within a minute, she had climbed through a small window and landed softly on the worn timber floor beside a weight bench. 
Death in Socks had arrived at Joe's gym and fitness. 44. The first few died quickly. A scrawny boy first, then a girl. The boy had been lying on his stomach. She simply clamped one hand over his mouth and punched the knife between his C1 and C2 vertebrae, then pushed his face into the pillow until he stopped breathing. The girl who was sleeping a little away from the rest was messier. Again, she clamped her hand over the teenager's mouth, but this time punctured the carotid artery. The girl thrashed violently for the full minute it took her to bleed out. Eva hugged her tight the whole time, minimizing the noise of her struggle. Two down, seven to go. The next was another of the city kids who had attacked the vehicle. A boy again, this one bigger. He was sleeping on his back, his mouth and lips making a strange puffing sound instead of a snore. She hovered the point of the knife above his right eye, then violently hammered the base of the handle, driving the blade deep into his brain, killing him instantly. Three down. She crept up to the fourth shape. This figure was smaller, and she recognized the blonde hair of the girl Jen instantly. She paused over her. A full twenty seconds passed before she decided to leave her for the moment. She told herself that it was in case things went awry and she needed a bargaining chip, but things had gone smoothly so far. She knew she was lying to herself. Was she getting soft? She stepped over the girl and found the next shape was the kitchen boy, Robert. Yes, this would be sweet. She knelt soundlessly beside him. He was also on his back, and she decided to kill him in the same efficient manner as the puffing boy. Eva raised the knife and hovered the point over his left eye. She was about to hammer it home when a piercing scream rent the silence. Jen was having a dream about her grandmother. She was sitting at the table of her kitchen, and Grandma was at the oven pulling out some freshly baked peanut cookies, her favorite. There was something not quite right, though. They smell funny, Grandma, she said. Don't be silly, dear, said Grandma without turning around. But they don't. Instead of that freshly baked cookie smell she knew so well, it was an acrid metallic smell. Fine, then, Grandma huffed uncharacteristically and stalked to the kitchen sink, throwing in the tray of cookies. Jen felt relief, until the sunlight streaming in the window darkened, that is. It was like someone had drawn a blind over the sun. Jen's eyes snapped open. The metallic smell of blood was strong, and when she turned her head, she saw a shape bending over Robert. She screamed. A sleep-addled Jack scrambled out of his sheets, but was barely to his feet just as a dark shape sprang at him, knocking him back onto the floor. Metal glinted in the moonlight from the dirty windows, and he only just managed to raise his forearm and block the blade from slicing his throat. He grunted when it bit into his flesh. He reached for the knife hand of his attacker, but he grasped only air. The knife wielder eluded him and then firmly planted the short blade between his ribs. Jack gasped. He'd been stabbed. Jack closed his hand over the hand holding the knife, gripping it so it couldn't be withdrawn and used again. In the faint light, he locked eyes with his assailant. It was Eva, and her face shrieked fury. Eva was furious at herself for not killing the girl. Her sentimental mistake had seen the alarm raised. She heard the people around them shouting and scrambling for weapons. There was little time now. She stooped low over the boy Robert and looked quickly for her true target. Jack. She found him, a long shape scrambling from his sheets three feet away. She jumped clean over the stirring Robert and hit Jew's killer as hard as she could. He managed to block the first strike of her knife, but her second caught him in the chest just below his right breast. A few seconds more to finish him, and then she would gladly face her maker. Jack and Eva wrestled for control of the knife embedded in his chest as the waking children screamed and tried to work out what was happening. Jack felt blood trickling down his body as they struggled. The piercing pain in his chest was literally breathtaking, and he realized his lung had been pierced. Every time Eva tried to jerk the knife free, a new shot of agony traveled up and down his body as he felt his grip on consciousness slip. Both of their hands were slippery with his blood, and it was only a matter of seconds before she won control of the knife and finished him. An enormous bang, a 
accompanied the brief flash of a gun muzzle. Eva's head jerked violently to the right, and she was thrown off him to the floor where she lay unmoving. Jack heard a sob and looked up to find Jen, the heavy gun in her hand wobbling dangerously as she stared in horror at the woman she had just killed. Jack's world went dark. 45. Robert awoke to his cousin's high-pitched screams. He reached immediately for the automatic weapon he'd left on the floor next to his mattress and rose to his knees. Jen, what is it? Oh my God, someone's attacking Jack. Help him! Before he could even process that, another yell rang out, followed by swearing from the other kids. He heard grunting and struggling from Jack's bed. He turned his gun that way, and as his eyes adjusted to the faint light, he saw the silhouette of a woman kneeling over Jack. He raised his weapon, about to tell her to put her hands up when Jen brushed by him and reached out. The gunshot in the enclosed space made his ears ring, and in the brief flash of the muzzle he saw Eva, for that's the only person it could be, collapse onto her side. His gun-shy cousin hadn't been reaching out. She'd been aiming a pistol. The harsh beam of a flashlight illuminated the horrific scene. Jack was on his back, a knife buried in his chest. The Chinese soldier Eva was on her side, a puddle of blood and flecks of gray forming a spreading halo around her head. Jen was standing on shaking legs, a heavy gun that he assumed belonged to someone in Jimmy's crew wobbling in her hand. Jack raised his head briefly, looking at Jen, then it dropped back heavily to his pillow as he lost consciousness. Jen fell to her knees by Jack before the beam of the flashlight moved on, revealing the true extent of Eva's killing spree. Robert, help me. We need a towel for the blood. Hurry. Robert looked around frantically as cries of anguish rang out from Jimmy and the other two survivors of his gang. He didn't find a towel, but whipped up what looked like a woven blanket similar to what they use in hospitals and ran over to Jen with it. Jen was crying and looked to him for guidance. Should, should we pull it out or leave it in? She asked. Robert inspected the site of the trauma. The knife protruded from about midway down his chest and to the right, almost directly under his pectoral muscle. He really had no idea what they should do, but felt leaving it in would only lead to other problems. We'll pull it out. Here, let me. Get ready to compress the wound. Robert wiped the blood-slick handle of the knife with the blanket, then rested his left hand on Jack's chest and gripped the handle with the other. He eased it out slowly, and Jen immediately pressed the blanket against the leaking wound. Jack didn't flinch. He was out cold. Or worse. Jen must have considered this, too, and still holding the blanket against the wound, reached up and felt for his pulse. He's alive but it's beating real fast. I'll hold it on. You should see if you can help the others. Dawn was breaking outside, and Robert was able to see more clearly. It was a bloodbath. Jimmy was bent over the girl Selma, holding her head off the floor. Robert realized that even though they hadn't been introduced as girlfriend and boyfriend, Jimmy obviously had feelings for her. His heart went out to the other boy. The other two survivors, the one called Hector and another slighter boy whose name he didn't know, stood around, unsure how to react. We should cover the dead with blankets, Robert said gently, and the boys gladly followed his suggestion. He went across to Jimmy and put his hand on the kid's shoulder. Sorry for your loss, man. Jimmy nodded and wiped his nose with a bloody sleeve. It's all right. It was quick, at least... He eased Selma's head to the floor and closed her eyes before leaning across and dragging her blanket over her face. He grabbed his flashlight and stood back up before turning it off. How are your guys? He asked Robert. Jen is good, physically at least, but Jack got stabbed. Show me, said Jimmy. I've seen plenty of stab wounds. They went back to where Jen was tending to Jack, and Jimmy, all business now, knelt next to her. Let me, okay? He said, putting his hand next to Jen's and grasping the blanket. Jen nodded and pulled her hand away. He gave her the flashlight and told her to shine it on the wound when he pulled the blanket up. The blanket stuck for a second, then came free, 
causing a small amount of blood to leak from the wound. That's good. It's not bleeding too much now. It means it's clotting and that it didn't hit an artery or anything. Jimmy looked closely at the wound, then pushed a clean spot of the blanket against it. Still pressing the blanket down with one hand, he took the flashlight from Jen and looked around until he found the discarded knife. Is this it? he asked, holding it up. Robert nodded. Oh, man, your boy is lucky. I think it punctured his lung, but it's too short to have done any deeper damage where it went in. My cousin got stabbed in nearly the same place with a longer knife, and they didn't even do surgery because the lung heals itself after a while. You got to keep the wound clean, though, and we need to wrap his whole chest real tight. We got a medical kit. I'll give you alcohol and stuff to look after it. Are you sure? asked Jen. Well, I'm not a doctor, but if you know one's still alive, you're welcome to give him a try. With Jimmy's help, they dressed Jack's stab wound and then completed the more difficult task of wrapping a whole roll of bandaging around his chest. Jack didn't wake up, but moaned as they turned him from side to side to get it around and under him. Shouldn't he have woken up? Jimmy shrugged. They'd exhausted the depth of his medical know-how. Maybe he's in shock? What are you guys going to do now? You're welcome to stay till your boy's better if you want. Well, we want to help you clean up, said Jen, not really sure how to say bury your dead. But we'll probably continue and head to Texas. I'm pretty sure Jack would want to stick to the plan. Right, Robert? Robert wasn't convinced that moving Jack was the right thing to do, but he supposed that even though Eva didn't run for help, their original reason for getting on the road as quickly as possible, once the attack at the school was discovered, even Fresno wouldn't be far enough away if they began a big manhunt. Yeah, he would. They spent the next two hours transporting the dead to the baseball park in an old pickup truck Jimmy had found in week one. Except for the freshly turned earth near where the pitcher's plate would be, the grass of the ballpark was lush and green. They lengthened the existing graves so that the three recently deceased could be laid to rest near their friends. Jimmy said a prayer over them when they were done. They wheeled Eva as far into the outfield as they could and buried her without ceremony. No prayer, no words, no looks back over their shoulders. Better than she deserves, said Jimmy on the way out. They ate some breakfast mid-morning with Jimmy and his last two gang members, and then Robert went back and got the Mong Shi and drove it back. It was a struggle getting Jack down the stairs, and he woke up once on the way down, his words unintelligible. He's got a fever, said Jen, looking at Jimmy worriedly. It's cool. It could be a bit of an infection. Just keep the wound clean and give him three of these with water every four hours. He handed her two packets of ibuprofen. It'll keep his fever down till his body gets better. Well, thanks for letting us stay and helping with Jack, said Robert, awkwardly shaking Jimmy's hand. Not sure what we would have done without your advice. Jen came forward and hugged him. I'm sorry we brought her here. If we hadn't, well... Jen's voice hitched, the emotion of the morning finally catching up with her. She let out a sob. It's Kay, little lady, said Jimmy, hugging her back. It's not your fault. It's nobody's fault but hers and the rest of them for killing our country. You be safe, here. You sure you won't come with us? Nah, this is our turf. We'll be okay. Jen wasn't convinced that Jimmy believed that at all. 46. When Jack drifted into consciousness, the earth was rumbling under him. No, not the earth. The floor. He opened his eyes. His vision was fuzzy, but he could make out sunlight low in his sight and something dark overhead. A roof? Katie? A hand grasped his, and he heard sounds like someone speaking, but couldn't make out words. He drifted into the blackness again. The next time he awoke, it was because the rumbling had stopped. He felt a cool breeze on his face and tried to sit up. 
The jab of pain in his chest immediately caused him to drop his head. Don't try to sit up, said a girl. A hand took his. Katie? No, it's Jen. He drifted off again. The next time he awoke, the rumbling was back. He opened his eyes. His vision had cleared and he saw he was looking at the ceiling of a vehicle. He craned his neck to look above him and saw a blonde head over the top of the seat back. Jen, he croaked. She looked over and immediately kneeled on the seat, putting her arms over and placing a cool hand on his head. Jack, you know me? Yeah, he said, puzzled at the question. Where are we? What's going on? asked a voice from the front of the vehicle. He's awake, and he knows who I am this time, said Jen excitedly over her shoulder. Oh, good, I'll pull over soon. Jen looked back at Jack. We're in Arizona. Robert thinks we should be at the border of New Mexico in an hour. As Jack processed this, he placed his hands on his chest. His hands encountered tightly wound bandages, his fingers tracking lightly over the place he'd been stabbed. Now fully awake, he realized he was in the cargo area of the Chinese Hummer. Against the wall to his left were six five-gallon jerry cans. Hector's dad was a mechanic. He had a tank of diesel and filled those up for us. Jen answered his unasked question. I'm so glad you're not dead. Jimmy said if you were going to die, it would take less than a day. But I was still worried. I'm glad, too. I mean, I'm not sure why I am, but I'll take it. Well, Jimmy's cousin got stabbed in the lung once. He said they didn't even operate because it hadn't done any other damage, and the lung would fix itself. So they just stitched him up. Robert did that for you, too. He used to do leather work at school, and then we just prayed. Jen clapped a hand over her mouth. Sorry, I'm babbling, aren't I? Jack smiled. It's okay. Thanks for saving me. A cloud passed briefly over her sunny features. You're welcome. I know you would have done the same for me. So I take it we're still headed for Houston? Yep, and Robert's trying to keep to the back roads. He says it's a big country and it will take years before they have enough boots on the ground to prevent all movement around the place. Robert's stock kept going up in Jack's estimation. And again, he thanked his lucky stars he'd met them when he did. He was pretty sure he'd have been worm food back at the school if he hadn't. They stopped not long after he woke and ate some canned food washed down with warm soda. Jack thanked Robert for everything he'd done and praised how far he'd managed to get them so far. They briefly looked over the map and Jack nodded approvingly at the route Robert had sketched out. It traveled on the major roads but took alternative routes around any larger cities and would still probably be quicker than it would have been traveling directly with traffic back in the old days. By the time they climbed back in the Mongxi, Jack was exhausted. You should get more sleep, said Jen as Robert steered the truck headed back onto the hot asphalt of Route 40. Okay, wake me when we get to Texas, he joked. Jack closed his eyes, worse for wear and lucky to be alive, but feeling happier than he had any time since America fell. Part 4. Texas or Die Jack, Robert, and Jen made it across the border to New Mexico without incident. Jack awoke again about an hour into their trip across the 47th state. This time, when he sat up, he didn't feel woozy, and the pain in his chest had subsided to the point where it only hurt when he made a sudden move. He also found he could breathe more easily despite the constrictive bandages around his chest. Hi, Jack, said the ever-happy Jen, leaning over the front seat at him. How are you feeling? As if answering for him, his stomach grumbled loudly. They all laughed. I think that answers your question, he said. Is this New Mexico? It's much greener than I expected. Sure is, said Robert. I thought the same thing myself. I haven't seen a tumbleweed yet. Did you want me to pull over at the next truck stop or gas station we see? No, no, about you guys, but I need to pee, and I'm pretty hungry myself. Jack and Jen agreed wholeheartedly, and ten minutes later, 
Robert pulled the truck over under the awning of an abandoned gas station. Robert helped Jack out of the vehicle while Jen followed the signs and went around back to the outside bathroom at the rear. Robert noticed Jack's wince as his feet hit the pavement. Is it getting better? Yeah, slowly. I won't be running a marathon anytime soon, but yeah, it's a definite improvement from yesterday. Jack made it to the back of the truck under his own steam and sat down on the tailgate when Robert opened it. Well, we have a choice of baked beans, canned sausages, or chicken noodle soup, said Robert, opening up the bag of food they had packed. I'll go the chicken noodle soup, thanks. I'll make it, said Jen, returning. You go to the bathroom, Robert. Yes, ma'am, Robert saluted, giving Jack a wink. Chicken noodle soup is a good choice. It's condensed, so I can add a can of water and it will feed all of us. Jack smiled as he watched her get busy setting up the small propane burner and pouring the soup into a saucepan. She prattled happily about how her mom had made her make one meal a day whenever they camped. Jen spied him watching her. I sure know my way around the camp kitchen. I can see that. The soup was bubbling in the saucepan by the time Robert returned, and Jack took his leave for his turn. Upon his return, Jen was dishing up the soup and handing out saltine crackers and a warm bottle of Dr. Pepper's each to accompany the meager meal. The cousins sat on the pavement cross-legged to eat theirs and Jack on the tailgate, not yet up to sitting on the ground. Meager though the meal was, to Jack it was a treat to have something warm pass his lips, and he happily crunched crackers with each mouthful of hot soup. Even the warm Dr. Pepper tasted good, despite not being his favorite soda. So, what's our route through New Mexico? Jack asked, suppressing a belch as he leaned back with his hand on his full belly. I'll get the map, said Robert eagerly, springing up and going to the driver's door. When he got back, they all crowded around as he spread the map on the tailgate. He placed a finger on the map where they had crossed into New Mexico. So. I thought we would follow the 60 all the way to this town, Socorro, I guess you pronounce it. Then we turn south onto Highway 25, but only till we get here. Then we turn south and follow the 25 to San Antonio, New Mexico, not the Texas San Antonio. Then it's onto the 380, and we follow it all the way to the Texas border. I figure if we stop the night here at Carrizozo, which will take us about five hours, when we start out the next day, it should only take us... Robert raised an eyebrow at Jack, who was squinting into the distance. Jen and Robert both followed his gaze and saw three black specks just over the horizon. Climb into the truck, quick! All three scrambled into the rear. They only had to wait around 20 seconds before the shadows of the low-flying fighter jets passed right across the highway in front of the gas station, followed a second or two later by the sonic boom. Jack jumped out and followed their passage until they disappeared in the heat haze on the western horizon. That was close, said Robert. Lucky we parked under the shelter. Yeah, agreed Jack, returning to the map. They could have come from anywhere, but look here. His finger pointed to a town called Roswell on the 380. Is that the Roswell? Asked Robert. Yep. Huh? What's Roswell? Asked Jen. It was an Air Force base, one famous because of a UFO incident back in the day, Jack explained. Oh, said Jen. You think they may be using it? Asked Robert. Maybe. Those fighters definitely came from that direction. I think it was closed ages ago, but I'm pretty sure the landing strips and buildings were still being used. Maybe they've moved in to use for themselves. Do you think we should find another route? Well, we're in a Chinese army vehicle, so unless we actually see more on the road, I think we are safe as long as we are moving. Plus, I think it would be valuable to know if they are using it, especially if this resistance in Texas is as organized as it sounds. Good, because going around it would take much longer and we may not have enough fuel to get all the way to Houston if we don't take the direct route. We're down to the last two jerry cans. All right, we take the 380 and see what we see.
47. They drove on to Carrizozo without seeing any more air traffic. In fact, the only things they saw moving at all were livestock and a few stray dogs. Arriving just as the sun was going down, they found a roadside motel with a faded American flag hanging wanly from a flagpole next to the welcome sign. Jack felt a pang of sadness at the sight of it. The office was open, so they grabbed a set of keys and then opened the rooms, one by one, until they found one with two double beds that looked inviting enough. It was neat and tidy, and they piled in, Jen unable to help checking the lights and water as the boys rolled into the beds. One out of two isn't bad, she said as brown-tinged water rushed into the bathroom basin. She left the faucet open for a few seconds until it ran clean, then cupped her hands under it and took a drink. Water is good. I think I'll have a cold shower before bed. No offense, Robert, but you could do with one too. Me three, said Jack absently scratching under his shirt. I'm itchy as hell under this bandage. Do you think you should? I think it will be okay as long as we can find some soap and one of you helps me dress the wound afterwards. I don't think I need the bandage around my chest anymore. Okay. Well, who wants to go first? We should do it while there is a little bit of light still, and then eat. Jack went first. Both Jen and Robert helped remove the bandages and the dressing on the wound. It looks like it's healing nicely, said Robert. I think the skin is knitting together under the scab. We might be able to take out your stitches day after next. Jack was also impressed. That looks just like the real thing. Good job, Dr. Robert. Well, I'm getting in. I left a soap and a towel for you on the basin sink, said Jen. Twenty minutes later, after the most uncomfortably cold shower he'd ever had, Jack put the Chinese-issue army pants back on and went back out into the room. Better? asked Robert. Well, I'm not itchy anymore, but now I'm pretty cold. Jen unwrapped the last adhesive dressing that the group in Fresno had given them and handed it to Robert. He quickly dressed the wound again and saw now that most of the dried blood had been washed away, healthy pink skin evident in and around the sutures, with no weeping or bleeding. Robert was next in the shower, and Jen unpacked the propane cooker and began fishing through the bag of cans they had brought in. I can cook this time if you want, Jen, said Jack. No, it's okay. I like it. How does succulent canned spaghetti and meatballs sound for tonight's meal? Jack laughed. It sounds just fine. Ooh, and I have a treat. With a flourish, she pulled out a shaker jar of Kraft Parmesan cheese powder, Oh my gosh, I love that stuff. Me too. Jen had her shower when Robert came out and asked him to stir the saucepan while she was gone. Robert, where is the map? I want to have a look and see where this rebel camp might be. It's in the truck on the dashboard. After their meal, with which they consumed nearly a quarter of the full shaker of Parmesan powder, Jack spread open the map on the small table so that Texas was in the center. Okay, here is Houston. Jen, do you remember any other details in the conversation you overheard? Um, well, she said, rebels north of Houston, and she said something about them hiding in the trees. Trees? A forest, maybe? said Robert. Makes sense. Jack trailed his finger north of Houston to a large green patch that was bigger than greater Houston itself. It had a big blue lake at its northeastern corner. Sam Houston National Park. That has to be it, said Jack. Well, there would certainly be lots of trees, and it looks plenty big enough to hide in for sure, agreed Robert. Sam, blurted Jen. I heard her say something about Sam, but I thought it was the person's name. She must have said Sam Houston. Okay, awesome. We have our destination. What would you say if we were to start traveling at night? for safety. Well, after those jets today, it seems like a good idea, said Jen. So you want to wait another full day here till tomorrow night? Asked Robert. No, I think we should start tonight. If we bed down now, we could get five hours shut-eye. I'm happy to drive the first shift now that my wound is healing. We should be able to get past Roswell with an hour of daylight to spare if we leave by midnight. What do you say? 
Both agreed. But how will we wake up? Asked Jen. Well, I'm pretty sure I won't sleep through considering I've slept nearly five days solid today, said Jack. I'll wake you both as soon as I get up, and you can sleep more in the truck. Deal. They bedded down as the last of the light through the windows disappeared. Forty-eight. Jack's sleep was dreamless, and when he woke up, it was still dark outside. That was a good start. He'd been worried he'd sleep right through to daylight, regardless of his confidence. He got up and dressed as silently as possible in the dark, then splashed cold water on his face in the bathroom sink before gently waking the others. They were all dressed and began taking their gear out to the truck within 20 minutes. The New Mexico night was cool and dry, and the velvet black sky filled with stars. It's like there are more stars now, said Jen. Yeah, no moon tonight, and not as much pollution as before helps, I guess. The basic digital clock in the dashboard of the Mong Shi read 1153 in green glowing numbers. Jack briefly wondered why they didn't use Chinese characters, but decided he didn't really care enough to waste thought power on it. You going to leave the headlights on? Robert asked from the back seat. Yeah, I figure the chance of us being spotted is pretty low compared to hitting something if I try and drive in the dark. Jen yawned and snuggled under the blanket she had commandeered from the motel. Wake us up if you get tired, Jack. I will. Both Robert and Jen fell asleep quite quickly, leaving Jack alone with his thoughts. He didn't mind. In fact, he found their reliance on him to keep them safe while they slept comforting. It felt like a long time since anyone had relied on him. He quickly diverted his thoughts from his sister, knowing that way led only to pain and sadness. Hopefully this time would be different. It was a long, boring drive, the only distractions the times he had to avoid hazards in the road. Mostly it was dead animals or debris that had blown onto the virtually unused highway. But the one that stuck in his mind was the burnt-out wreckage of a car that was strewn across a hundred yards of highway. It was no ordinary wreck. The scorch marks on the road and the pattern of the debris around the main shell of the vehicle told him it had almost certainly been taken out by a missile from a helicopter or fighter. It made their decision to travel at night seem prudent. Still, he was glad his two passengers weren't awake to see it. The clock glowed 4.07 a.m. when he passed a sign declaring Roswell to be 50 miles ahead. Good. Unless there was a major catastrophe, they would pass it by with nearly an hour of darkness to spare. Not long after, Robert stirred in back. Where are we? He asked, looking at the darkened road ahead. We'll pass Roswell in about 25 minutes. If you guys think it's worth the risk... I think if we keep going, we could reach the border just after sunup. Well, there's a little town called Plains just over the border into Texas. It would be a good one to stop at if you don't think we'll be spotted in that first half hour after dawn. Okay, good. We'll run up by Jen when she wakes up, but I think it's the way to go. Corporal Peter Min was startled from sleep by the sound of a ping at his workstation. He wiped away the dribble of saliva at the corner of his mouth and looked around guiltily. Lieutenant Wong was nowhere to be seen. The fat man himself was probably taking an alcohol-assisted nap in his office. Min's fingers danced over the keyboard as he sought out the signal that had interrupted his unsanctioned nap. It was a GPS signal, one of their vehicles traveling from the west. Strange hour for someone to be on the road. He knew for a fact that there were no visits scheduled for the next few days. He had checked the manifesto at the beginning of his shift. He felt a spark of excitement. For the first time since he had destroyed the Mercedes sedan that had been driving west out of Texas three months before, he could pilot a drone into the skies above Roswell for something other than practice. Min practically jumped out of his chair and ran to the control room. Within minutes, he was seated and in the 3D headset, 
the compact flight controller of the Golden Eagle strike drone in his skillful hands. On the roof above, the large gray drone lifted into the air. This was no toy. It was a sophisticated helicopter drone the size of a motorcycle, and its twin rotors, one above the other, hummed like angry wasps as its pilot took it up a hundred yards before sending it traveling at speed over the desert floor. The two anti-tank missiles secured to its fuselage just above the landing rails were almost indiscernible. Even though they were speaking in hushed tones, Jack and Robert's conversation roused Jen from her sleep. She sat bolt upright and looked through the windshield. Where are we? She said, looking around at the low-rise buildings and storefronts. Morning, Jen. This is Roswell. We're just driving through the town. There should be a right-hand turn soon, and that road leads down to the old Air Force base. We won't be going down there, obviously. So you think there are Chinese there? I think it's really likely. Then maybe they'll be in town, too. Well, maybe. But we're driving straight through in the dark and not stopping, so we should be okay. She nodded absently as she took in the alien-themed shops and signs illuminated by their headlights as they passed. Do you guys believe in UFOs? Jen asked, unaware that at that very moment a flying object of a different kind was overhead and tracking the movement of their vehicle. I find it difficult to believe that in all the universe, we're it, said Jack. Whether aliens have come here, though, who knows? Yeah, said Robert. I'll believe it when I see it. Well, I believe, said Jen, winding down her window and poking her head out to look at the firmament above. Four miles away, Corporal Peter Min viewed the Mong Shi through the infrared camera on his deadly drone. It drove straight past the turn to the base and continued along the 380 without slowing down. He took the drone down for a closer look and switched to normal camera, but it was still too dark and the headlights too bright to make out anyone in the cabin. As he switched back to infrared, all he knew for a fact was that it was definitely a Chinese army vehicle. He just had to assume that it was an oversight by whoever had authorized the journey through New Mexico to not let them know. He began to increase altitude and was about to call the drone home when a white blob shape appeared at the side of the truck's heat signature. He quickly reversed the move, bringing the drone back down, this time to 50 yards. Someone had put their head out of the side window, and their bright heat signature showed enough detail that he could see they had long hair. A woman? Almost certainly, as no male soldier would be allowed to wear their hair long. The unknown woman was perhaps enjoying fresh air, or the stars, or perhaps looking right at his drone. He switched to normal view again but it just turned the truck into a black shadow trailing the twin beams of its headlights. Something didn't feel quite right about the whole thing, though. Min decided to continue tracking the vehicle until daylight. The sky on the horizon was just starting to turn blue with the rising of the sun as they passed a sign showing them the border was five miles away. Oh my gosh, we're nearly there, squealed Jen. Don't get too excited, said Robert noisily unfolding the map in the back seat. Texas is really big, and it will be another night's drive before we get there for sure. He traced his finger along the 380 to the small town of Plains. I think once we cross the border, it should only be another 15 or so minutes to that town. Okay, cool, said Jack, stifling a yawn. I'm about ready for a nap. Dawn had arrived and the flat expanse of the New Mexico plains was revealed as the curtain of night was lifted. The small, stretched shadow on the road behind them began to close in. Jen was the first to spot the drone as it shot ahead of them. At that point, it was still 250 yards up, and she leaned forward over the dash to peer into the sky. There's something up there. Probably a bird, said Robert absently. Um, no... I know what a bird looks like. I think it's a helicopter. Even as she spoke, the object dropped quickly to level off at 20 yards elevation and about 25 yards ahead, keeping pace with their progress. Oh, crap, that's a drone, said Jack, 
a big one. Forty nine. Min expertly slowed the drone until it was close enough to see into the cabin. He saw the shocked faces of a teenage boy behind the wheel, a younger girl with long hair next to him, and another boy over their shoulder. They were all pointing, their big, toothy mouths moving with words he couldn't hear. A shot of adrenaline coursed through his system. Protocol stated he should now pass on the intel to the lieutenant, who would then go another level up the chain of command before being given direction. The last time that happened, he had received the shoot-to-destroy directive on the Mercedes. He had a feeling this time would be different, because these kids had a People's Army vehicle, and that meant there was much more to the story. They would be captured, interrogated, and executed. But where was the fun in that for Min? No, he would plead innocence, after all, he hadn't seen Lieutenant Wong for hours. Fat bastard was asleep somewhere, and Min would have no problem pushing the blame onto him. I couldn't find Lieutenant Wong, sir. He was missing for hours. What was a lowly corporal to do? I had to make a decision. Convinced by his own cleverness, Min flicked a switch on his controller and armed the right-hand anti-tank missile. He hovered his thumb over a small red button, as his other thumb nimbly manipulated the directional joystick. What should we do? said Jen. I don't know, said Jack honestly. Maybe it's just having a look and we'll go away. As if hearing his words, the drone suddenly picked up speed and drew away from them until it was a quarter mile ahead and higher in the air. There, see? said Robert. Nothing to worry about. Jack didn't comment. Yes, it had pulled away, but now it was ahead and keeping pace, not veering off and away. He knew they were in trouble when it became motionless and did some small stabilizing maneuvers, finally bringing its nose to bear on them. Shit, hold on tight, I think it's going to fire at us. Jack was expecting machine gun fire. What he saw instead was something fall from the right side of the drone before a burst of flame sent it rocketing towards them. The missile closed the distance between them in the space of seconds, and all Jack could do was rip the wheel of the truck sharply to the right. As if in slow motion, he saw the missile loom large and roar past them with inches to spare as the truck flew off the tarmac and down a small embankment. For a split second, they were all floating off their seats before the truck hit the ground hard enough to smash them back into the seats. Jack hit the brakes, bringing them to a skidding halt in a cloud of dust. Is everyone okay? Jack asked, scanning the sky ahead. For the moment, he couldn't see the drone and glanced at Jen. The girl was holding her hand over her mouth and blood poured through her fingers, staining the Chinese army issue shirt she was wearing. Oh my God, are you, said Jack. Jen, screamed a dazed Robert, who sat up holding the top of his head as if it might come off at any second. I'm okay, she said her voice muffled by her hand. I bit my tongue. Quick, we need to get away from the truck, Jack screamed, grabbing the Chinese rifle from under his seat and shoving his door open. Run as fast as you can. Jack exited the vehicle and began running. He'd barely made it ten yards when he heard the whoosh of another rocket, and the truck behind him exploded with a mighty whoomp. A wave of hot air lifted him up. Corporal Min let out a string of expletives in Mandarin when the first missile crashed harmlessly into the asphalt of the 380. The kid had got lucky, real lucky. He wouldn't miss the second time. He turned the drone to face the vehicle where it had come to rest in the dirt and armed the second missile as he waited for the dust to clear. He pressed the trigger and saw the kids burst from the truck and run for their lives as the missile sped toward its target. Min willed it to go faster. His display flashed with the explosion, distorting the vision from the drone's onboard camera, and he leaned forward, waiting for it to come back into focus. He couldn't see any movement around the destroyed vehicle from this distance, and maneuvered the drone in for a closer look. Yes, he yelled in Mandarin, punching his fist in the air. All three were down and unmoving. He waited for a minute as he noted the coordinates. There was still no movement. 
He switched to autopilot and hit the home button. Time to find the fat man and make a report. I think it's gone, called Jack, his face still against the dirt. Both Robert and Jen had let him know they were okay after the explosion, and even though they were no doubt in shock, they had the sense to stay down when he told them to as the drone buzzed closer to inspect its handiwork. Jack was the first to his feet and ran over to where Jen was slowly picking herself up off the ground. She was a mess, the blood coating her chin and shirt front now coated in dust and dirt. He quickly patted out the wisp of smoke coming from a smoldering patch on the shoulder of her shirt. He grabbed her shoulders and looked into her eyes as Robert limped over, also looking worse for wear. Are you okay, Jen? She nodded. Yeah, I'm good. My ears are ringing, though. Robert put his arm around her shoulder. You look a damn mess, cuz. But you're tough, all right. He looked at Jack. What about you? Jack lifted his shirt away to look at his bandaged wound. Not bleeding, but stings a bit. Okay, that's good. What now? Now we walk. As fast and far as we can, because almost certainly they'll be sending someone out to pick up the bodies and see if they can work out how a bunch of kids got one of their trucks. They didn't waste any time setting out. There was nothing to pack. The only thing salvaged from the truck was the rifle Jack grabbed as he exited the vehicle. It's about four miles to the border. I say we walk till the sun is high in the sky and hope we come across somewhere to hide if they begin to search for us. A small town would be better, but I'm not sure we'll find one. Well, allow me to check, said Robert, reaching under his shirt and pulling out the folded map. You got the map? You are a legend, Robert, said Jack, clapping him on the back. They spread the map out on the road surface. There were no towns before the border, but there was a network of side roads right up to it. I think we just have to walk and see what we see as we get closer. There will be buildings and houses on the highway, but it will be better to find somewhere off the beaten track because they'll be looking in the closest ones first. They set out. Fifty. Back in Roswell, Corporal Min had found his lieutenant bent over a table in the mess hall, a telltale hip flask clutched in his pasty hand. He shook his head at the sloppiness of his superior, conveniently forgetting his own indiscretion earlier that morning. Sir, he said, gently shaking the lieutenant's shoulder. Nothing. Not even snoring. Min leaned in closer. Surely the fat bastard hadn't dropped dead. Sir. Min was rewarded with an enormous snort as Wong started out of sleep and sat bolt upright. The confusion on his face quickly turned to anger. What is it, Min? Min stood straight up and saluted. Sir, an incident on the 380. I intercepted one of our vehicles, a Mong Shi traveling east. I was able to- What time? interrupted Wong, suddenly very much awake. Approximately 5 a.m., sir. Wong's head swiveled to the wall clock, which now showed 6.53. You wake me now, fool? You are under orders. I couldn't find you, sir, said Min, looking pointedly at the flask on the table. Wong's eyes narrowed, and he pocketed the now empty hip flask. If you didn't find me, you weren't looking hard enough said Wong in a low voice. What is the situation? I intercepted the vehicle with my drone. Using infrared, I was unable to determine who was driving. But something about the situation didn't seem right. I tracked them until daylight and confirmed that it was occupied by American children, teenagers, and I fired upon them to prevent escape. Wong's brain worked for a moment before he collapsed back into his seat with his head in his hands. He recalled an alert put out during the night shift three days before regarding a massacre in Sacramento, California. He had downed over a half of his nightly tipple by that time and had set it aside without passing it on to his reconnaissance team. What he did remember, though, was that it advised that three fugitive children 
possibly in Chinese army uniform and in a sanctioned vehicle, were to be apprehended alive for questioning if detected. In his semi-drunken state, he had been quite sure that the fugitives would be apprehended, and just like the bus full of child slaves they had freed from the Sacramento camp the day before, they would also be put to death. He also knew why they were to be caught alive. Not only had they killed a high-ranking officer and her staff at the camp, they had also kidnapped and later killed Eva Howell, the daughter of General Wang Hao, commander of ground forces in the Western Occupied Territory. They are dead? Yes, sir, said Min, puffing his chest out. Oh, you bloody idiot. Sir? You killed fugitives that are wanted for questioning in the murder of General Hao's daughter. They were to be captured alive at all costs. Min's face paled. Sir, I was given no alert about this. So what? You know the protocols. You are to pass intel to me, your superior. Not even I can make the decision to fire without consulting my superiors, and you just took it upon yourself to blow them off the highway? Oh, you are in big trouble, Min. Min's eyes narrowed. I think you should very carefully consider how you word your report, Lieutenant Wong. You were drunk on duty and asleep on the job. Not just tonight. Every night. Wong moved extraordinarily fast for a big man. He grabbed Min's arm with his left hand and drew his QSC-92 pistol and pointed it at Min's face. The corporal put up his free hand immediately. Sir, I'm sorry. Please, don't. Wong studied him for a moment, a small smile curling his lips. Then he laughed. Oh, I'm not going to shoot you, Min. Calm down. I do want you to go back to the control room and sit at your desk while we consider this problem, though. Yes, sir, said Min, his voice trembling. He turned and Wong followed him, putting his gun back in its holster as his charge settled at his desk. What are we going to do? asked Min, looking up at him, his eyes again calculating. You know we'll both be in trouble, and you were in charge. Maybe the solution is to bury this. I'll tell you the solution said Wong, reaching down to whip out Min's own pistol before pushing the barrel into his temple and pulling the trigger. He looked down at the body of the corporal, now slumped over his desk, dark blood pooling on the white laminate. Never try to outfox a fox, he said to the dead soldier. He took out a handkerchief and wiped the handle before putting it in its owner's hand, wrapping the corporal's dead fingers around the gun. When he was done staging the suicide of Corporal Peter Min, he went into his office to call and inform command of the ineptness and abject failure of the lowly corporal to follow orders. By the time Jack, Robert, and Jen passed the Welcome to Texas sign an hour and a half later, their pace had slowed noticeably. The mid-morning sun was beating down on them, and Jen complained of a blister on her heel. Look, a truck stop, said Jack, pointing to a building 200 yards distant. We'll stop there for a rest and see if we can find something to drink or eat. When they reached it, Jack and Robert scoped out the building front and back. There's a pickup out back, Robert reported when he came back around to the front. No keys, and the building is locked up tight. They had to break in through the front door. It looked like it had been chained up since the outbreak and, probably given its remote location, had escaped looters. They wolfed down two cans of Pringles each, washed down with liberal amounts of bottled water. Jen was the first back on her feet and took two bottles of water into the bathroom. When she came back out, she looked more like the girl she had the day before, her face now clean and a damp patch on the chest of her army shirt where she'd done her best to wash out the bloodstain. Robert, who himself was physically unscathed from the whole incident, inspected her tongue. There was a nasty cut wringing the tip, but it had stopped bleeding. Does it hurt? he asked. Only when I'm awake, she responded dryly, before noticing Jack staring out the window. 
She went over to him. Are you okay, Jack? He put a hand absently over his wound. Yeah, it's not even stinging now. That's good. What about up here? She asked, tapping him on the temple. He looked at her and laughed. Yeah, I'm okay. Just worried. It's a little over two hours since it all happened. I don't think we can stop. If they get to the truck and find no bodies, I think they'll start a search. And if we're within 50 miles, they'll find us. So, you want to take a car? Yes. It will mean traveling in daylight, but it will still be safer than hiding. Robert came over, jiggling something on the end of his finger. I was thinking the same thing. And look what I found. Awesome, said Jack, rising stiffly. Let's bag some food and drink and get out of here. The pickup's fuel gauge showed it had three quarters of a tank, but they had a hell of a time starting the early 90s Ford. It was cleaning the battery terminals of gunk that finally got it going, and Jack let it run for a good five minutes before backing it out and following the driveway around to the front. He looked back to the west, thankful that there didn't appear to be any air traffic or signs of pursuit. He turned onto the 380, and they recommenced their journey to Houston. Fifty-one. Almost exactly one hour after Jack and the others turned back onto the 380, a Harbin Z-9 helicopter with a People's Liberation Army insignia on the side landed on the highway, 50 yards from the burnt wreckage of the stolen Mongxi. Before the rotors had stopped spinning, a tall, well-built man in uniform bent at the waist and walked purposefully to the edge of the road. Another figure emerged from the helicopter, this one also in uniform but shorter and more rotund than the tall man, who looked back at him impatiently as he ran, huffing and puffing, to catch up. Come on, keep up, said Colonel Zhang Li, assistant to General Howe. Yes, sir, groaned Wong as he followed the colonel down the embankment. The shell of the vehicle was still smoking as Li leaned in to inspect the interior. There were no signs of human remains inside. He stood up straight and walked slowly around the vehicle, looking carefully at the ground. Wong followed a pace or two behind, fanning himself in the hot New Mexico sun. Finally, the taller man came to a halt and looked into the distance, his hands clasped behind his back. They are not dead. Pardon me, Colonel. The handsome officer turned around and pinned him with his eyes. I said they are not dead. They escaped the vehicle and are now hiding or on the run again. That's not possible, sir. Look at the vehicle. Clearly they were incinerated to ash. Oh, yes? What's this, then? Wong looked at the ground, where there were multiple splashes of blood and at least two sets of footprints in the sandy soil. I'm sorry, sir. I was relying on my dead subordinate. No matter, said Lee, holding up his hand. Believe me, this is a better outcome for you. The general wants these little brats alive. Come, the search must begin at once. Jack was yawning an hour and a half into their drive and pulled over to let Robert, who had dozed for the first part of the drive, take over. Jen in the middle and clearly exhausted, only stirred when Robert gently eased her head off his shoulder. The two boys briefly discussed the route at the front of the truck. They decided to drive to Waco before stopping and reevaluating both the fuel situation and the route. But Jack was hopeful they could at least make Waco before they had to change vehicles. Jen didn't wake, and soon her head was resting on Jack's shoulder as they turned right onto the 84 and began heading southeast. Jack soon fell asleep, too. Less than an hour after inspecting the wreckage, and while waiting for satellite imagery, Colonel Lee was personally overseeing a squad of 12 men searching home by home as they swept towards the Texas border. The images were delivered to his laptop after another half hour. The series of grainy images clearly showed the children walking down the 380 
until they stopped at some sort of restaurant or truck stop for 20 minutes before driving away in a white truck. He could see the very building just 100 yards down the road. Everybody back to the trucks. The little bastards already have a couple of hours start on us, and I want them before they go to ground. We'll be going on ahead. He ran back to the chopper and handed his laptop to his assistant, Cho, as he climbed in. I want that vehicle tracked by satellite, he said. Should we notify the Texas command to intercept them, sir? She asked. No, let's keep this to ourselves. They'll be easy enough to track now, and the general would prefer this kept in-house. There was enough friction between General Howe and his equivalent in the Central Territories that the less known about his quest for personal revenge, the better. In less than a minute, the convoy of three light utility vehicles was speeding along the 380 as Lee and his personal assistant lifted off. One last thing. Order a second fully-fueled chopper to be on standby at Bergstrom. Robert, I need to pee. That simple, quiet sentence roused Jack from his sleep. Jen looked mortified. I need to as well, he said, to cover her embarrassment. Where are we? Well, you guys have been out for hours. We just passed a town called Gatesville, and I think we're about a half hour from Waco. Wow. Why didn't you wake me to relieve you? Robert shrugged. I figured you needed the sleep. You've been awake the longest out of any of us. Don't worry, there's been no trouble. I haven't seen another vehicle on the road and only one or two aircraft to the east. Okay, good work. Jack meant it, too. After being on his own all those weeks after Katie died, it was good to be able to share the burden of staying alive with someone else. If you want, maybe pull over somewhere suitable and we'll take care of business and then I'll take over driving so you can rest. That reminded him to look at the fuel gauge. The needle was down to just over the red zone. We better look for another vehicle, too. They had traveled barely half a mile when Robert pulled up in front of a car sales lot, Kenny's Quality Used Vehicles. Are you thinking what I'm thinking? Yep, let's drive in. It took little effort to break into the office. They all used the bathroom and ate some candy bars that were in a box on the counter. As the others were finishing, Jack made the mistake of opening the door that said manager in bold letters. He quickly pulled the door shut, not wanting Jen to see the slumped form of the manager, presumably Kenny, who had shot his brains all over the wall. Body in there. Don't go in. Oh, said Robert and Jen in unison. Let's try some of these keys, he said grabbing a half dozen off the board on the wall. Hopefully one has a decent amount of fuel. They took two sets each and went into the lot. Fifty miles away and closing fast, Colonel Lee heard the ping of an incoming email. It was the third since they had begun the pursuit. Cho passed him the laptop and he clicked the attachment on the latest. At last, they had stopped. The grainy image showed them parked outside a car lot and walking towards a building in the center. He looked at the accompanying map. Gatesville. Cho, we don't have time to refuel. Order that chopper into the air and have them fly to these coordinates and maintain a holding pattern a few miles out and await further instruction. They are not to engage if these children are still there. Yes, sir. They wasted ten minutes, only to discover that the cars for sale had a minimal amount of gas in their tanks. What about that one? asked Jen, pointing to a garage between the showroom and the office. The black BMW was parked to the side of the roller door, and its personal number plate read Kenny B. Good thinking. I'll try and find the keys. You guys grab the water and snacks out of the pickup. We need to move fast. Jack ran back inside and opened the manager's office door. The smell was musty rather than rotten, but he still avoided looking at the dead man as he looked around for the keys to his BMW. He checked drawers and lifted papers and folders on the big desk. Nothing. Of course, he knew without a doubt where they would be, and he'd only delayed looking there because of wishful thinking. Jack, I think there's a chopper coming. 
screamed Robert from outside. A few seconds later, Jack heard the whomp, whomp, whomp of blades cutting the air. Crap. There was no time to be shy now. He took a deep breath and slid a hand into Kenny's right-hand pants pocket. Sorry, Kenny, he said as his fingers stretched and thankfully found a cold metal key ring. He quickly grabbed it from the pocket and ran for the door. Robert and Jen were waiting at the beamer for him, and he clicked the unlock button on the fob as he ran. They were already buckling up when he dived into the car. Where's the chopper? He asked breathlessly as he pressed the start button on the dashboard. The engine roared to life without so much as a sputter, and it had just under a full tank. It didn't come any closer and then turned north. Jack hit the gas and the European car surged forward with a squeal of tires before he reined it in. Robert giggled nervously and back while Jen gripped the dashboard. Sorry, it's a bit more responsive than the pickup. He slowed as he eased out of the lot onto the 84 while Robert unfolded the map in the back seat. Follow this for about four and a half miles, then take the right-hand turn onto the 1829. I can still see the chopper, said Jen, looking back over her shoulder through the sunroof. Jack had a bad feeling about that chopper. He put his foot down harder. Just tell me when to turn, Robert. I'll be concentrating on driving. Fifty-two. Colonel Lee and his assistant boarded the second helicopter less than thirty minutes after the children had left. The chopper had tracked them until they passed a town called Temple and observed which route they took, before turning back to pick up Lee and his assistant at the car yard. It was a simple equation now to work out where the fugitives were headed. The rebel encampment in the Sam Houston National Forest was their obvious destination. He would ensure they didn't reach it. Go, straight to Temple, then follow the 190. They won't have turned off that yet. His ground team would continue by road, following directions sent by Cho as they received updates. Lee felt the hum of adrenaline in his system, a hunter about to bring down his quarry. How will we find the rebel camp when we get there? Asked Jen. I don't know, admitted Jack. I guess we'll drive in as far as we can, then dump the car and go on foot. But it will be like trying to find a needle in a haystack. They were making good time, Jack pushing the BMW to speeds well above the old speed limits. The roads were relatively clear of vehicles, which meant there was some sort of Chinese presence, but so far, aside from the chopper at the car yard, they hadn't seen any physical evidence. You'll be turning right off the 190 in one mile said Robert from the back. Okay, Jen, are we still clear? It was Jen's job to warn them as she saw the chopper that had been buzzing above them until Temple. All clear. Jack made his turn onto the 36 three minutes later. Since the chopper had followed them, as a group, they had decided to take a less direct route to Sam Houston. It turned out to be the right decision. The big black helicopter carrying Colonel Lee passed that very same turn less than four minutes later, and continued along the 190, unaware that the BMW had turned. Okay, we follow this now until a town called Caldwell, then we go left and follow the signs to Huntsville. It's right on the edge of the forest. Something is wrong, said Lee when they had followed the 190 for five minutes with no sign of the fugitives. We should have passed them by now. They must have taken a turn somewhere. Hand me that tablet and you check the last satellite images we have. His finger traced the map on screen until he found a town called Milano. That was where they had made their turn. He was sure of it. There is no satellite data available, Colonel. Never mind. Have another chopper pick up the ground team and set up a roadblock on the 30 into Huntsville. Please reiterate they are to be captured alive. Then to the co-pilot. Head south to here, he said, pointing to the screen at a spot halfway between Huntsville, the children's destination and the turn he anticipated would bring them onto the 30. Land in the middle of the road with your guns pointing west. The ground team will intercept them if they get past us. Okay, turn here, said Robert. This is the 30. It will take us all the way to Huntsville. So close now. Jack was excited, but couldn't shake the feeling of impending doom. He put his foot down as the road stretched out before them. 
The sound of the siren was so unexpected that it took a few seconds for his brain to process. With dread crawling in his intestines, he looked into the rear vision mirror. It was a police cruiser. Um, that's a police car, said Jen. Jack slowed. So ingrained was the urge to obey authority before his brain told him that this cruiser might very well contain police officers, but not the officers of his country. Whether they were cops or soldiers, the people driving that car were the enemy. He sped back up. Hold on he said through gritted teeth. The chase was on. Fifty-three. Sir, we finally have satellite images, Cho said from her seat in the helicopter, which was now landed. Lee stamped his smoke out on the asphalt and walked over to the door, taking the laptop from her. There were two vehicles, which meant they were being pursued by the local forces. He looked at the timestamp. It had been taken 16 minutes ago. Shit! Colonel Lee ran back to the chopper. Go! They're catching up, screamed Jen. Jack looked in the mirror. They were gaining when he had to slow for bends and tight turns. But the BMW put yards on them when they straightened out. Still, he struggled to find a way out of this for them. While they might stay ahead for a while, they wouldn't be able to outrun them and even now the car behind them was probably calling for backup. Robert, you have to try and shoot their tires out, said Jack, reaching under his seat and passing the assault rifle back to his friend. Robert put his hands up. But I'm a terrible shot. We don't have a choice. You can do it, Robert, said Jen. Jack glanced in the rear view, willing Robert to do the right thing. He paused a second, then, looking unhappy, grasped the rifle like it was a live snake and unclasped his seatbelt. Jack put his hand back on the wheel and turned his eyes back to the road, veering into the middle of the street to give Robert the best sight of the pursuing vehicle. The other boy turned and looked through the rear window before winding down his side window. Tell me when to take the- Now! shouted Jack. Robert put his head and arms through the window, holding the gun precariously, and tried to stabilize himself. The car behind them began to swerve evasively as he pulled the trigger. Jack, trying to watch the road ahead and also see what was happening behind, had to swerve at the last second to avoid a bucket that had blown onto the road. Jen screamed, and Robert groaned as his chest banged into the sill of the door. To his credit, he just managed to keep a grip on his weapon. That's when a bullet pinged off the roof of their own car, the passenger in the pursuing vehicle had his hand out the side window and was shooting round after round at them. Robert, try and shoot their tires out. The passenger side mirror exploded and Jen squealed. Jack heard another metallic ping as a bullet struck the trunk, then, in his mirror, saw the gunman pull his pistol in, presumably to reload. He steadied their course again. Now, Robert, he's reloading. Robert squeezed the trigger and the car behind them exploded in a massive fireball, the shockwave nearly causing Jack to drive into the gutter. He managed to straighten up and tap the brakes, slowing the BMW to a stop. He said to shoot out the tires, Robert, Jen scolded. All Robert could do was giggle. Jack opened the door and climbed out. Jack looked back at the burning wreck, which was sending thick black smoke into the sky. He heard the unmistakable whoomp, whoomp, whoomp of helicopter rotors a second before the aircraft appeared through the heat haze and oily black smoke. Even as he rushed to get back in the car, his mind screamed a question. Why had a Chinese chopper just blown up one of its own patrols? There was no time to seek an answer. Hold on. He floored the gas, and the BMW took off with a screech. Jen, keep an eye on that chopper. Take us up and follow them half a mile distant, Lee ordered the pilot, then noticed Cho looking at him with wide eyes. You have something to say, Captain Cho? For a moment, he thought she would actually have the temerity to bring up his decision to take out one of their own vehicles. No, sir. Good. Need I remind you that we are operating under General Howell's direction and are to bring the fugitives to him alive. No complications. 
I understand, sir. He nodded stiffly and turned to watch the vehicle below speeding into his trap. Miles away, on top of a water tower on a farm on the northeastern edge of the Sam Houston forest, curious eyes watched the aerial activity over Huntsville. A chopper over the city and another closing in. The girl, who looked to be around 17, picked up the walkie-talkie on the rail beside her. Rattlesnake, this is Sentinel-1. Come in, over. There was a short delay, then a burst of static. Sentinel, this is Rattlesnake, over. There is a chopper over Huntsville and another on the way. If Raptor is ever going to get used, now might be the time, over. There was another loud burst of static and an excited voice interrupted. Rattlesnake, this is Sentinel-2. A car full of kids just screamed past my hide, and there is a Chinese chopper tailing them. Roger. Sounds like they are herding them into a trap. This might be Raptor's time to shine. There was some more static, and both sentinels heard Theo Whitaker, otherwise known as Rattlesnake, yell, Jess, tell Grandpa to get his ass up in the air. It's now or never. Rattlesnake, this is Sentinel-2 again. The chopper over Huntsville just landed. Roger, we'll bring the trucks now, but I don't think they'll get there before the trap is sprung. Let me know if you spot any more copters. Two he might be able to handle, not sure about three. Oh, and keep your fingers crossed he can start the damn thing. Why aren't they shooting at us? Asked Jen. Jack was asking himself that very same question, but he failed to come up with the answer. Clearly something had changed between now and the drone attack. Don't know, Jen. We'll just keep going, and hopefully we can beat them to the forest. Five minutes later, they entered the outer limits of Huntsville. We're getting close, said Robert. We're going to come to a fork in the road after we get through the town proper, then, holy crap. In the distance, they all saw the roadblock and another landed chopper to the side of it, its rotors spinning lazily. Jen began to cry, and Jack put his hand on hers. He felt like crying himself. They had come so far, only to be foiled right before reaching their destination. Just keep going, Robert said. He sounded angry, really angry. Just crash into them and take out as many as we can. If he was on his own, Jack may have done just that. But he wasn't. He felt a responsibility to the two kids in the car with him, especially Jen. No, I can't. Look, there has to be a reason they haven't just blown us off the road. They want us alive, and where there is life, there's hope. We'll give ourselves up and find a way through this. He didn't really believe that. But the alternative, a kamikaze fireball with Jen in the front seat, was unthinkable. It was the younger girl's turn to squeeze his hand. He looked at her, and she wiped a tear off her cheek and nodded. Robert patted his shoulder, tacit approval to surrender. Jack began to decelerate. Looks like they aren't going to try and make a run for it, sir, the pilot said. Lee sighed and relaxed into the uncomfortable seat. Thank God it was over without more drama. The general would be happy. Good. Follow them to the barrier and land behind them. Keep the guns ready until they are cuffed. Yes, sir. Holy shit! It took Lee a moment to identify what caused the pilot's outburst. But by then, the silver streak coming out of the sun and low over the town was on them. Even over the noise of the chopper's rotors, he heard the unbelievable rat-a-tat-tat of machine gun fire. Lee was still trying to make sense of what he was seeing as the men at the roadblock tried to run to safety, as a silver-colored World War II fighter with the distinctive ring of yellow on its nose strafed their position, mowing them down with a line of machine gun fire that erupted in a shower of sparks as it bit into the stationary helicopter. A rotor flew off the helicopter, cutting one of his team in half as the chopper tipped onto its side, the remaining blades biting into the asphalt and breaking up before one pierced the fuselage of the chopper, igniting the aviation fuel. The chopper exploded in a massive fireball, bathing the surviving members of the ground team in flames. The pilot took evasive action 
and Colonel Lee's chopper wobbled dangerously as they veered hard to the right to avoid the ancient fighter as it began to ascend. Jack slammed on the brakes, and all three teens watched slack-jawed as a silver World War II fighter destroyed the roadblock and chopper ahead of them. The car shook as the old plane came out of its attacking dive and whooshed over them with only yards to spare. They quickly jumped out and watched it head straight up into the blue sky. The chopper that had been following them veered away safely, avoiding another burst of gunfire. What the holy fuck, breathed Robert. Did you just see what I saw? Jack didn't answer. He was too busy watching the chopper, which went into a steep climb and turned in a tight circle, attempting to keep the antique fighter in its sights. He could only just see the fighter now, a dark moat against the pale blue Texas sky. If he hadn't been so stunned by the turn of events, he may have figured it was a good time to run. I think it's coming back, said Jen simply. She was right. Jack heard a faint whine as the moat curled around and began to increase in size. Shoot that thing out of the sky, screamed Lee. His pilot, clearly panicked, turned the plane and began to climb, seeking out the silver streak. It was well out of range by that time. The pilot steadied out at 800 feet and armed his air-to-air -air missile as the silver moat in the distance banked and began heading back towards them. He flicked the cap off the trigger. It's coming! Fire, you fool! But, sir, it's too far out. I said fire! The pilot adjusted the craft so that its nose was pointing directly at the incoming fighter. Now! screamed Lee. The pilot fired, and the craft shook as the missile took flight. Lee held his breath as the missile shot towards its target. With plenty of time thanks to the distance between them, the old fighter banked to the right, and the missile sailed past harmlessly. The plane closed quickly, and flames appeared beneath the wings on either side. Lee let out a triumphant laugh before he realized the small flames were from guns. The pilot took evasive action, but not before heavy rounds thunked into the side of the Harbin Z-9, blowing in the side window. The whine of the attacking plane faded as it rushed past. Lee looked desperately through his window, trying to track the enemy fighter as Cho rested her head on his shoulder. Lee shrugged it off angrily. What do you think you're... Cho's eyes stared into nothing, the blood blooming on her uniform from two punctures to her belly and chest, answering his unfinished question. That was enough for Colonel Zhang Li. Half a yard to the right, and it would have been his guts leaking onto the seat. Get us out of here! Yes, sir, said the pilot gladly. Li stared through the window as the chopper ascended to cruising height and sped west. General Howe's disappointment would be palpable. If he survived it, Li vowed he would raise every acre of that damn forest and not leave until he had those children in shackles. Jack, Jen, and Robert danced in the street, whooping and hollering as the chopper that had been pursuing them high-tailed it westward. Then they did it all again, as the old fighter that saved them buzzed low over them and waggled its wings before heading after the escaping chopper. They watched, waiting for the kill shot that never came, as the plane again turned and headed back, this time descending as it flew towards them, gradually getting lower and lower. He's landing, said Robert. They ran to the sidewalk and watched the old plane wobble side to side as it steadied for landing. The tires touched the asphalt once, twice, three times before steadying as it sped towards them. He's coming in too fast, called Jack. He needn't have worried as whoever was piloting the old beasts knew what they were doing. The tires screeched as the plane shot past them, rapidly decelerating before coming to a complete stop, 50 yards before the burning chopper and roadblock. Jack held Jen back as she made to run across to the plane. Wait till the prop stops spinning, he called over the noise and wind thrown up by the propeller. 
The pilot slid open the canopy and was climbing out onto the wing as they ran across. Jack could tell by his stiff movements that he was older, and a million questions circled in his head as the man pulled off his goggles and helmet. The children stopped in their tracks. The man had a full head of white hair topping a weathered face. He was Asian. The man let out a roar of laughter. Don't worry, kids. I'm as American as apple pie, he called. Yee-haw! Did you see the old girl give it to them? Jen ran to the old man, her arms encircling him in a tight hug. Thank you for saving us, she sobbed into his chest. He hugged her back. Ah, uh, you're welcome, honey. Yeah, thanks, said Robert and Jack in unison. The old man realized how scared these kids had been. It's my pleasure, kids, but I couldn't have done it without Betsy, he said, nodding at the plane behind him. She's a beauty, sir. What is she? asked Robert. Isn't she just? That, my boy, is a Curtis P-36 Hawk, a museum piece, literally. She was built in 1944. Are you a pilot, sir? asked Jen. I am, young lady, or was. I was a commercial pilot in the 80s and 90s, and then I did joy flights and air shows and aircraft like this. I can tell you, though, I've never been in a dogfight before. It has guns? asked Jack. Well, you don't fly these things without learning a thing or two about mechanics. It took me three months, but I finally scavenged and stitched together enough parts to get working guns mounted. Glad you did. Want to hear the funniest part? I was out of ammo. If that chopper had stuck around, I was going to have to kamikaze it. The kids were speechless. None of them doubted he meant what he said. There was no more time for questions, as right then they were interrupted by the sound of vehicles approaching. Don't worry, kids, said the old man. They're ours. You're with the rebels from the forest? Asked Jack. I sure am, he stuck out his hand. My name is Charlie Lynn, but you can call me Grandpa. Everyone does. They had barely introduced themselves by name to him before the trucks rolled up, and a bunch of kids spilled out to crowd around and excitedly fire questions at them and Grandpa about his escapades. Jack, Robert, and Jen smiled at the attention and laughed as Grandpa was lifted and carried triumphantly around Betsy. The brief celebration was ended by a boy who introduced himself as Theo Whitaker. Jack was impressed by how quickly everyone followed his instructions, piling back into the trucks as Grandpa climbed back aboard Betsy and taxied into position for takeoff. It took an hour to get back into the camp, deep in a secluded part of the forest. Jack, Robert, and Jen were welcomed there with open arms. Jack knew instantly he had finally found a home and a new family. Now, it was time to begin healing. Hey. The End You have been listening to Lone Wolf, America Falls, Book 7, written by Scott Medbury, narrated by Adam Barr. Copyright 2023, Scott Medbury. Thanks for listening.